One podcast has crushed the horror landscape, leaving behind the silent audio waves of all of those who have came before. Introducing our hosts. This man needs no introduction, but needs seven takes to record his own. He is known for rating bad movies high and known for rating good movies high. Don't try to call him because he only phones it in. He is our host from the foreign land of Canada, Mood 616. This man is willing to die even on the smallest of hills. He argues to the point in which he disagrees with himself. A man who knows a remake when he sees one. He is the Mexican-born super producer known as the humble one and the sexy one, JP. They are known for creating superstars out of their guests. They are known for being the number one horror podcast on the Horrorphilia Network, except for when they allow others to take a turn. They are the devil's advocate of horror podcasting. They are the 22 shots of moods and horror. Yes, yes, y'all, it's going down right now. Episode Wayne Gretzky is coming at you live. I am your host, the bullshit artist, the greasy podcaster, M double O D to the Z. Yeah. First up, we have the man who loves to criticize my ratings by calling them unjust by my side. The human soft taco, double shot J, aka the humble hoagie, JP in the house. And finally, we have the only man ever to give himself third degree burns on his arm while eating soup and talking on Skype at the same time at work, the Boston Brando, a.k.a. Derek here. What's going on, homies? <laughs> a.k.a. 10 out of 10. A.k.a. 10 out of 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually, I was literally laughing writing down the third degree burns on his arm. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. I must have missed that. I, I, I don't think I knew Damn. about that. Did that actually hey, happen? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know what he was doing, but I think he was talking on Skype and he was eating soup. Anyways, Probably one thing led to another and he spilt it and burnt his arm, but he burnt it so bad that like he had it all bandaged up and it was like peeling and stuff. And I'm like, so I said to him, I'm like, what the hell? Did, how did you heat up that soup with the Hiroshima bombing or something? <laughs> like, I, had, I, had, I had Godzilla heated up with his atomic breath. No shit, dude. That's some hot ass soup if you're giving yourself third degree burns, man. Well, plus it was uh, broccoli cheddar, so it was extra. It's like tar, so it's like thicker. It's not like chicken. Meat. Oh, that shit probably just it probably just stuck to your arm like oh velcro. My God, right? that's disgusting. oh yeah. <laughs> oh, dude. I was pissed because I couldn't eat it after because I was like, oh, I, sm- I smelled like broccoli and cheddar soup. His oh. arm looked like Kane Hodder after a fire stunt gone wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't be able to eat it because I'll, I I would probably be able to smell burnt hair, and I hate that smell. Burnt hair? I don't Ugh. think anybody yeah. actually likes that smell. So I mean, oh, that, that's one of those smells, dude. That like literally just makes me gag even thinking about it. Yeah, it's, Ugh. It's yeah. Nasty. it does. Smell nasty, good. nasty. Isn't that weird that burnt hair smells like that. That's it weird. is weird. Yeah, like, yeah. It's just hair. Like hair doesn't smell really. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> so what's going on, guys? How's uh? How's it been your two weeks off? It's been Has two it been weeks two weeks? I don't even know how long it's been. I mean... Well, no, it's been... Yeah, it's been two because, of course, we had the Steelers playing the last couple of weeks. So, unfortunately, we didn't record on Sundays because it's uh, it's conflicting. Conflicting times. So Yeah, man. I don't but even I, want to get into that. I will, we'll pass on that. But, uh, yeah, so <laughs> episode uh, 98 dropped, which was our top 10 of 2016, and... Uh, it right. seems like we got a lot of positive feedback on that one. People enjoyed our list. I threw a poll up and was like, yo, 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 who has the best list? Uh, of course, Moods got all salty at me. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell, bro? What the hell? But, um, you know, uh, yeah. I wasn't it, getting salty. Oh, I, you were salt. honestly, honestly, I was breaking, I was breaking tater, Mexi tater, tater tots for sure, man. Honestly, dude, it, the, <clears throat> the thing that kind of frustrated me about the whole poll because, was the very first response to it. And right then I was like, okay, this is this is fucking stupid. I, I think if that one response or that one comment hadn't have been there, I probably wouldn't have started making such a big deal out of it. But you got to vote because the guy only knew you. Yeah, and I was but like, you got to vote was, because was Kyle just assumed that yours would be good. So. Well, see, now, <laughs> but I agree. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. See, the way I looked at it, though, I mean, honestly, it, it totally is for fun. But, I mean, if you want a controlled experiment like that, I mean – People that are voting should have seen all the films on all our lists to actually determine mm-hmm. a better list because really the votes were like so retarded. It's like, oh well, he has masks on his. He yeah, automatically but wins. But doesn't like, that di- isn't your point disproved by the fact that you won? 
No, but I, I think me winning was still bullshit, though. Why? I mean, because I'm a bullshit artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the thing. Uh, uh, it, yeah. it was never meant to be the most definitive, like, you have the best yeah. list. It was just bragging rights. It was just talking shit, like, fun stuff. Oh, totally. Like, I was, and I, I was got busting the idea balls. from J- Jason, who posted uh, the Exploding Heads Top 10 in their group, and... Mm-hmm you know, who had the best list or whatever. So I was like, Oh, that sounds that, that was a fun conversation. I was like, let's do that in ours. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, okay. So you was busting my balls, but, um, (laughs) congratulations on winning. (laughs) But, but, but I loved it though, because I I, I just kept bringing up the fact I'm like, well, of course I'm going to lose this because no one's seen any of the films on my list. And I was pertaining to the simple fact that no one watches foreign films. I was (laughs) actually just busting everyone's balls right there. That's where the joke was aimed at. Because it is kind of true sometimes that you would win the popular vote because people like you more than me because I'm a dick. (laughs) Well, you are kind of a dick, but I mean, (laughs) self-admitted dick. I mean, it is what it is. It is what it is. But but that's exactly where that that line came from. I was I, I mean, I ultimately had to explain it. I was just like, there's no way everyone's people have seen even half the films on my list. There's no way I could win. This, there's no there's no way no one vote. saw Bloodshock on my list. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, was I seen Bloodshock, but it just didn't belong on a top 10, in my opinion. But that's just me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's yeah. why I would, that's why, that's when I ranked, when I mentioned that, who I thought had the best list, of course I picked myself because I love my well, didn't, list. <laughs> didn't the guys from Exploding Heads, wasn't it like a total landslide too? Like, didn't Dave win by like, like a hundred votes or some crazy thing? I don't know. I can't remember how that one ended up, but, um, <clears throat> they, they put up another poll for their solo cast episodes and Dave mm-hmm. got destroyed. Um, which I actually, I actually on that. Dave, I... so... Yeah, I, I honestly, I, I need to sit down and check them all out, actually. Yeah, I, I'm they're... really curious to check out Christians, to be honest, just considering the topic that he chose, which was Canadian horror. I think that's pretty interesting, actually. Well, so. actually, all three of them are good. Like, I enjoyed all three of them, and I thought it was a cool experiment. Uh, they took it to a level that I didn't think they would in terms of mm-hmm. I thought it was just going to be, like, a simple sort of – you know, review a movie, review a couple movies, like attempt a yeah. solo cast and maybe a couple topics. But they yeah. actually took on a core topic. Each of them took on one core topic each and revolved the almost the entire show around that topic. And it played out really well because Dave did like sort of a rundown history of found footage. That was really interesting. Brandon did more of a list show, which was I found the most interesting because the films that he listed off, most of them I had never heard of or seen. And then Christian's mm-hmm. history of Canadian horror, can, can, Canadian horror was uh, really neat too. Even though um, they at times, if I, and I, I mentioned this to them, that my one criticism is it became what I didn't like when we was on burial grounds for a couple episodes. Oh, just like literally listing, listing things off, off. Things. Yeah, not really yeah, commenting yeah. on things, just listing, which is, you know, it's, you know, I liked when they actually talked about this stuff because sometimes they would. And I understand uh-huh. you haven't seen everything and, you know, it's way too long to, to talk about everything. I just would have liked a little more talk because Christians is only like yeah, an yeah. hour long. So it, mm-hmm. it went by fucking zoomed by, you know what I mean? But all three of them are fantastic. I enjoyed all three of them. I really did. And yeah. I highly recommend the people out there, uh, our listeners, check out the, those three solo casts. It's it's honestly an interesting idea. I wouldn't be completely um, opposed to trying it ourselves one day with their um, approval just to see how that would turn out. Um, then yeah. I could put another poll up and say who ask who had the best. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> um but besides that, you yeah. know, episode 100 dropped. I mean, uh, not episode 100, <laughs> episode 98 dropped. Uh episode 100 will be dropping soon after this one. Um yep. but uh I went and seen The Thing on the big screen, which was pretty cool mm-hmm. last week. Nice. And then I seen Split this week. Um, mm-hmm. So that was pretty neat. I'm going to go see Bye Bye Man before it's out of there, which I believe it's only lasting like this last week. So I'll, I'll probably see that tomorrow. I've heard nothing but negative reviews. So we'll yeah, me too. It goes. I'm me probably going to go see Rings and I'm going to I'm, I'm going heavy this year. I'm going to see every goddamn horror film in the theater that, that comes my way. I'm going to go see Get Out. Look super racist, which is always exciting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if you guys seen the previous to that, but. Uh, I did. Uh, th- there was like a whole argument on Facebook it's, it's a, that I see. It's like, the guy from Keenan Peel, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So. 
it's an argument on Facebook uh. where people are like, is this like a, is this supposed to be like a comedy or like a, a romantic thing? Like, I, I, is it a horror film? Like, I don't understand what the tone of this is supposed to be. So, um, it looked pretty The trailer for Rings looked terrible. Looks I saw the trailer for Rings is. when I, when I went, yeah, I saw Split and, uh, it looked really bad. It was a bad trailer. Yeah. I don't know, man. It didn't really, it didn't do anything for it. I was like, woof. Yeah. Looked at Dylan. I was like, holy man. Yeah. yeah, It it just looks like pure, just, just regurgitated, like just, yeah. Yeah. You know, mainstream (laughs) horror that, and I don't even, you know, we've had the mainstream versus not mainstream argument before, but it just looks Mm -hmm. as basic as possible. Um, and you know, (laughs) they're not even about a UV ultraviolet digital copy. So that's points against (laughs) it right there. (laughs) See, that's their main problem right there. Yeah. Is, you know, if they they had went that route, I think the trailer would have been a little bit, you know, more interesting, you know, probably would have captured people's attention a lot more, at least mine anyways. UV codes. That shit's funny as hell, man. It's still one of the best ideas we ever came up with on the show. Many ideas we've came up with and went (laughs) on to become great ideas and successful that people made a lot of money on. Not us, but you know, Whatever. Yeah, that is true. That is true. <laughs> um, so yeah, before we get into like the meat and bones of the show, like we always do, uh, I did want to uh, mention a few things, a little bit of housekeeping notes, stuff like that. Uh, so um, the top ten of horophilia most downloaded shows for December came out. Um, Exploding Heads dominated. They were the number one, two, and three spot. Uh, our top ten show was actually not released in December, so. Um, you know, that's something to look forward to January, see where we place mm-hmm. with that. Uh, if we yeah. don't place number one, I may be a little butthurt about it, a little disappointed in the, in the listeners out there because that's always a huge fucking show. And mm-hmm. you know, going up against – it didn't seem like we were going up against too many heavy hitter shows from everybody else. Um, but, you know, uh, we placed four, five, and six. So between the two sister podcasts, 22 Shots and Exploding Heads, fucking killing the Horophilia Network – um, but you know, I, I gotta give them props, man. They've been cranking out gold lately. People are, are digging it. Um, people are digging us too. Uh, but we've mm-hmm. kind of been inconsistent with our production, uh, going into 2017. I know me and moods have had conversations. We're going to, we're going to go hard. We're going to go furious. We're going to go fast. We're going to go Paul Walker up in this bitch. Um, and, <laughs> uh, does that mean that our show is just going to die? Yeah. Through the windshield. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> our show's gonna kill. That's what I'm going for. Uh, yeah, yeah, that works. But um, like the yeah, windshield, we got it's gonna kill. Yeah. Like the windshield. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, I, I love, I, I like the new format that Jason did. He actually did a video. But Jason, if you're listening, and I know you usually do, um, can we get a list version of that too? Maybe in the description, um, or even a day or two later. I know you want people to watch the video, obviously, but maybe a day or two later, just as reference material, because we wanted to actually talk about where episodes place. But I didn't have a list in front of me, um, so. If you don't mind, can we get that too? And question, Jason. Is it possible to, to – I don't know if you have this type of data, but I'm curious. What are the 10 most downloaded shows in 2016, period? Um, that's kind of it. If you have that data, I'd be interested in that. Uh, that that would be kind of cool to see. Yeah, that's that one's piquing my interest too, yeah, to be like honest. The, like the top 10 of the year shows. Yeah. Um, let, let us know if you have that. I, I'm kind of curious on that. Uh, so with that said, I did want to sort of um, plug what our contest for the last time. Um, I actually got in, in a few more things. I got some Vive Vision releases. I have uh, Sleepwalkers Blu-ray. Uh, I have um, Mothman Prophecies. Uh, and then the t- two Hammer Horror uh, Blu-rays, as the Scream of Fear and the Gorgon, which I also own copies of those. Um, those are for giveaway um, in the contest as well. I have such a huge stack of stuff, guys. Everything from uh, Phantasm on Blu-ray to The Shining on DVD to uh, an Arrow video release. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of um, cool stuff to give away. Um, ton of uh, art exploitation films. Uh, if you haven't entered this contest, please do so. You can do so by one. Uh, everybody who submitted a top 10 list will be entered in some of the drawings I decided just because 
um, that really was mm-hmm. the easiest thing to do. Uh, so we will we will let them in some of the drawings, but we will limit that. We're not going to put them in every drawing um, because yeah. there's tons of stuff here. And I want the fingers people across that really... for that Nikaseka Diamond Guys Volume Two. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we have uh, tons of um, you know voicemails. Those count uh, as one entry a piece. So if you left two voicemails, one telling us the greatest horror film of all time, and two just giving feedback, experience with the show, story, anything you want to tell us about uh, the, this milestone, that counts as an entry. And then, of course, anybody who's ever rated us on iTunes, reviewed us on iTunes, and anybody who does so now between the time we record episode 100, you will be entered too. So we'll be giving away a bunch of stuff. It probably, guys, it probably will not be done on episode 100 because it's such a big episode. It might not even be done on the show because I'll get into this in a second, but episode 101 is kind of a big show too. We might have to do it live on YouTube or something along those lines um, or episode 102 just because I don't – it might take a while to do all those drawings and I don't want it to bog down the show. Now, yeah, I was literally thinking the same thing that yeah. we might have to do like a live stream. I think doing the live stream thing would actually probably be a decent way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's pro- I, I think yeah. that that's what we'll do. And also guys, I just want to let you guys know ahead of time. Oh, I almost forgot. Um Chris Lax, the homie Critter Buster, actually um contacted uh the movie studio that did Bye Bye Man and told him about our podcast said he was kind of affiliated with us and um, got uh, a set of mugs here. Bye Bye Man mugs. Now, I'm going to keep one of these because it's really cool. Um, but I gave one to Chris as well because, fuck, you got him. But I still have three to give away. And these mugs are mine? neat. <laughs> <laughs> I, you think a mug shipping to Canada would survive realistically? I, I got I got one shipped to Canada. That one with the yeah. – uh, yeah, man. That's, okay, uh, that fine. One where we'll heat, give where Moods up one it. and then we'll yeah. give away two. <laughs> Um, it's really cool though. Uh, the the water heats up you, it, when you put hot water in. Oh, it's it changes. one of those changes. Yeah, colors. it's fucking dope, man. You know, I, I, I've always it's wanted like that one that like I just that. got. It's like that one I got there. Where yeah. You, you know, you put the hot water in, and then the black disappears, and there's like a picture underneath there, and it's like this girl trying to get out of the cup all bloody and shit. Yeah, it looks so, awesome, man. It um, works good. Too. Got it's two of those to give away, uh, regardless if the movie's good or bad. Like it's a cool little piece, you know. It's going to be super rare. You're never going to see one again, really. You're never going to have a chance to really grab one. Um, so, yeah, yeah you, you know, two of those will give away. So, so you know, that's I mean, hundreds of dollars of shit here we're giving away. And Moods never even said what he's giving away. I'm sure he got stuff to give away. Um, but, you know, just, just you know, this amount. It of sounds like you got all my stuff to, to give away. Really. <laughs> Fuck, I cannot believe how much shit you've been getting. Man. It's crazy. Dude, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, we'll obviously thank. Literally, nobody will ship to Canada anymore. I Nothing. Know. Nobody will just even – they won't even consider it anymore because oh, shipping yeah. prices. And plus, they, nobody can afford to do it. I mean, we'll get into this later too, but yeah. – yeah, um, I'm, I got the shit out of the stake here. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, we, you know, it's it's cool though to give back to you guys. I, I mean, the thing that I want to add to that is, please, please, guys, you're gonna have to give me a lot of time to get this stuff all mailed out after we do the drawing, because it's gonna cost me a ton to mail each individual prize to each person, uh, all over the freaking world, probably, um, and. You know, give me a little time. I don't. Get I'm not the most. Twenty two shots. <laughs> you know, I'm not. I'm not the best at shipping shit out. It takes a long time for me to do it. You got. I promise you that you will get your stuff if you win. I 100 percent guarantee it. But you just got to give me time. Don't don't. I know firsthand. <laughs> I know firsthand. I've been waiting on this Amityville DVD. I think for like a whole year now. Yeah, probably. I think I bought. I think you bought Black Christmas. Lots of Christmas for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the final thing that I wanted to mention is I did say that we're going to go big in 2017 and, uh, I just wanted to announce some of the shows that we're going to be doing coming up, uh, just in the first couple episodes, uh, post 100, obviously seriously, like John Holmes, big John Holmes, (laughs) John Holmes, big. big. So we have the huge John Holmes style, uh, episode 100. Well, First of all, episode 99, yeah. that's nothing to sneeze at either. We're finally getting to the Hatchet Trilogy. That's tonight. You're going to hear that tonight. 
Then we're going to move on to episode 100. Don't ask us when it's going to be done because we're going to take our time with it. So it might, it, might, it might come out a week from now. It might come out a month from now. You know, it just depends because we don't, yeah. don't want to rush it. We want to make sure we have everything, uh, you know, set up. So episode mm-hmm. 100, after episode 100, we're coming right back with episode one, 101, heavy hit. And one of our most popular episodes of all time was Masters of Horror. And people loved that episode. It got a ton of downloads throughout history. It got a ton of plays. And it's it's one it's one of the episodes that people wanted us to revisit for a while in terms of season two. Uh, the original um, Masters of Horror episode was episode 48. So it was a while ago. But we're coming back for episode 101 with Masters of Horror season two. Uh, so I can't wait to do that it, man. Should it's going to be, be a blast. So much fun. Uh, episode nice. 102... Uh, we decided to do something um, interesting for sure, something that we really hadn't even considered before. But uh, we're going to do Pet Cemetery one and two. Thought that would be a fun show. Mm-hmm. And then episode one hundred three, um, we're going to do a show on urban legends. So this is going to be uh, more of a conceptual show. It's, we're going to talk about urban legends as you know what they are, what they are in society, and and maybe give some of the you know, top yeah, the lore of the actual about. urban legends. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, just more about the topic itself. And then we will get into the three urban legends film, the urban legend trilogy, uh, which is something that we've actually been asked to do for quite a while, uh, mm-hmm. you know, here and there. Uh, episode 104, we haven't decided 100% what it's going to be yet, but some of the ideas we had was laid to rest one and two or a killer genitals show. Which could be fun. That's <laughs> one that we had planned for a while. Uh, that would be Teeth and Soul Vengeance, I believe. Or you know, we could rotate <laughs> it, figure out what we're going to do there. But uh, let yeah. us know if you'd rather have Laid to Rest or Killer Genitals. Both will be done eventually, but which one do you want for episode 104? And then episode 105 uh, will be like sort of a top 10 show. Not, unfortunately, not the top 10 of 86. That will be in the future. Uh, but it will be a hidden gem show. We're gonna be ta- We were inspired by Brandon's hidden gems episode that he did, and I personally loved it because I was like, "Wow, you know, like it's cool that he shines some light on some films that not many people talk about." Uh, and and we decided that we're gonna do that as well. Um, I asked Brandon if he was cool with that, even though you know, tons of people have done hidden gems episodes, but his being re- so recent. You know, I wanted to make yeah. sure he was cool with it. He said, absolutely. You know, that's, that's no, you know, that's awesome. He can't wait to hear it. Um, so we're going to do that. Uh, I'm already starting on my list. I'm going to try to go, re- I'm going to ch- try to go relatively hidden. Like, I, I don't want to throw in fucking Halloween three or something. You know what I mean? Like, like I want, I want some hidden gems, like underrated. Yeah, nobody wants to gems. hear about Halloween three. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's, that's the lineup for right now. Um, our next, what, one, two, three, four, five, six episodes. Uh, man, uh, th- that's doing big things, doing man. Big, big things. things. And Huge. we're only, and it's only going to get bigger. We're going to have, we have other ideas, um, potential future guests, different different things that we're kicking around. We're trying to break the mold a little bit of the show. Not that it got stale or anything, but you know we want to try some new things this year, and uh, that's why we thought about the Urban Legends show. And don't and worry, the gems. And, and don't worry, the return of the franchise show will be happening too. So there'll be some big franchise shows coming yeah, up. Yeah, we're going to do too, big so. franchises. Cuz uh, we get a lot of requests, man. People are like, honestly, people request Hellraiser all the that's time. That's probably man. our most requested show at this point. Yeah, I, I I constantly hear people do the Hellraiser one and I'm like, "Yep, it's coming. It's coming." The problem is with these friggin' franchise shows is that every time we kind of get, you know, into Ready the, to do one? <laughs> yeah, like we're kind of getting into the mode to doing one. Another one gets announced from a, another major franchise. It's like, you know, potentially we got uh, what do we got? Texas Chainsaw. We got Friday the 13th. Uh, fucking Child's Play. Like, there's all these new films that are potentially coming out this year, which we don't want to do it and then have it come out. So yeah, they because it automatically like this, makes our show dated. Like, we still need to do Phantasm Five just so there's closure on that. And also, yeah, what other film came out that ruined our thing? There was one other one, right? Leprechaun. Leprechaun. Origins. Leprechaun. Yeah, that's right. Leprechaun. So only two of our <clears throat> franchises have been. Um, I guess uh, outdated. <laughs> uh, and it, Isn't there it supposed to be two. another? 
Children of the Corn show or uh, Children of the Corn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming yeah. Out too. So, we'll, so yeah, that's a, that's another potential one that's going to be updated. Maybe so. we should just do a franchise roundup show when we get three of them. And just cover like yeah. the loose ends of like three of the franchises. <laughs> Call it the franchise roundup. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, That's what Leprechaun Origins, it. Children of the Corn, and Phantasm. Prime. Yeah, <laughs> what a weird fucking lineup that would be. Um, and but... also potential uh, potential uh, Hall of Painters there too. I mean, yeah. that is one thing that people have been laughing about lately. We have been reviewing like pretty much good films, yeah, so we've had, we've so had many no Hall of Painters fame <clears throat> entries since. You know, our last <laughs> Hall of Pain entry was when we entered three of them, which was episode 72, the ah, Howling only, franchise. Uh, yeah. So yeah. we, we got to definitely get back to the shit. And I even suggested that we do a viewer's choice, but only bad films. So you guys suggest the worst films out there. So that's another thing we're <laughs> kicking around. Ooh. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, oh, my God. Yeah. Beneath tar- the Mississippi. But you know, exactly. Someone's totally going to wreck <laughs> request beneath the mississippi which actually wouldn't be a bad thing that i would get to watch it yeah so. it's i'm curious about this on the show for its quality. i actually never seen it <laughs> yeah, nobody fucking has like the only person i've heard like because i ask that all the time like you guys fucking heard me a million times say how awful this movie is nobody was curious jason, jason Lloyd's Lloyd only, only saw 10 minutes that i i know that tried to watch it and it was probably before yeah. he even heard me say that but, yeah, so we have tons of shows planned. Uh, you yeah. guys out there gave some great suggestions on the post that I made in the Facebook group. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you know, they're, 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 there's ideas flowing. I'm coming up with new shit every day that, that I'm, I'm curious to do. Uh, we're going to get back to director spotlights. We, like Mood said, we're going to do the Hellraiser franchise probably once the new one's released. Uh, Exploding Heads actually is recording their trilogy show tonight for hellraiser one through three listen to mm-hmm. that and then come back when we do ours to hear the legit breakdown of the hellraiser franchise you know what I'm yeah saying? yeah where we cover all of them <laughs> uh, so yeah guys that is uh all it all, all for our little housekeeping notes and stuff like that Mm-hmm. You know, and it was nice too when you made that post on the face in the Facebook group. There, um, a lot of the ideas that people were throwing out is stuff that we'd actually conversated about. So yeah. it was nice to hear that people are kind of on the same page, and it's nice that we're not just going to be doing these shows and no one's going to listen to them. So that was kind of nice, and there was some pretty interestingly fresh ones too. So, um, but yeah, thank you again for throwing out those. And, yeah, I, um, of- I think I think this year is going to be a big year. I mean, we got a potential a lot of huge shows, man. It's going to be. It's going to be an interesting one. So thank you for all those ideas. Anytime I see that many comments, like it truly does motivate me to, to make this show as good as we can. Well, it's kind of interesting because you made that post. Yeah. You made that post and then people were throwing out all these ideas and I'm like, man, we just talked about this one, this (laughs) one, that one. I mean, I mean, some people would kind of take that as, ah, you know, whatever, but I take that as that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That means that they're, they're interested in the ideas that we already had too. So Mm -hmm. that's awesome. It's awesome. All right. So. Yeah. So that's it for housekeeping. That's it. Well, then that's okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, let's get into uh, into some news. You got some news? Yeah. I got some news. Actually. Nice. I got it on paper this time. I haven't did that in a while. So. Uh, <laughs> old school. Old school. Uh, so um, interesting. Um, Bloody Disgusting reported this. And we've talked about this a ton this year and last year and last year. And the year before that, since 2013, which is a long time. <laughs> uh, we have more Friday the 13th news. Uh, this came out yesterday and today. So yesterday it was announced that casting calls have went out for uh, Friday the 13th and in Georgia. And that uh, they were going to be um, set to shoot in March in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And now it's uh, saying that this is actually what they reported. Um, A casting call has made its way online, revealing something extremely interesting. Not only will the new Friday the 13th feature a young Jason Voorhees, but they're casting twins. Before we overreact, it's quite possible that they'll be shooting long and late hours, thus having an act, uh, thus having a second actor helps avoid legal issues. Yeah, because, you know, um, children under 18 are it's the uh, 
It's the full house effect. Yeah, it's the yeah, full house it's, effect. It's the Olsen the, twins, the, the Olsen other twins, boy yeah. twins that were on there. Yeah, because they, they can only work four hours a day, so that's why they have twins. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's also th- – this is their opinion here. It's also possible that this does have something to do with the film's plot. What if Jason isn't the one who died in the lake but his brother or vice versa? That would explain mm-hmm. Jason's growth into a full-grown man, but alas – I'm sure it's the former as casting seeks identical twins who must be lengthy and awkward and have a very electric and expressive face. Um, So yeah, that's kind of interesting. It would be interesting if that actually had something to do with the plot. That's a, that's a big twist in the story right there. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But most likely it's not or else I doubt it would be as out there. Being as publicized already. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's kind of, Yeah. Um, so this but film that, that would be interesting though. That, that that's actually uh, I like that whole idea though. It's kind of cool. So this film so, is slated to shoot in March, March nineteenth to May fourth, uh, two thousand seventeen, and it is uh, under the title Friday the Thirteenth Part Thirteen. Uh, so huh. you know that's uh, you know that's obviously just the working title, but uh, it's cool that they're acknowledging the fact that it is the thirteenth one. Mm-hmm. That's uh-huh. that's huge. Um, so there's a famous line, or at least I'm going to make it famous now, that Dave said <laughs> on Exploding Heads, I believe it was the year-end show, and mm-hmm. he said, that film is not coming out. This is an exact quote, but that he said something oh, along yeah, the lines of, if that film comes out in 2017, I will quit podcasting. I'm sick of hearing about it as much as a Friday fan as I am. I've, I've just been burned too many times. I, we discussed it on the show already. I'm done. I'll tell you what. If, if this movie comes out October 13, 2017, I will quit podcasting. I put it out there. Christian, we better look for a new host. Yeah, I'm putting it out there. We'll see. October 13th, we'll all be right here discussing Let's, let's look for, like, Dave G. Whoa. Yeah, you might have to eat this one, man. Yeah, I know that it's still early, but, hmm, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Well, if they're if they're shooting in March, I mean, there's definitely there's definitely potential to get it out this year. Well, there's definitely potential it, that they're casting. Yeah, like yeah. once you're casting, like the ball is rolling, right? Like, mm-hmm. like that 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 means something. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, th- this is as far as we've gotten with this. You know, the, mm-hmm. it's been scripts and directors attached and directors is not attached and direct new directors attached but we haven't got mm-hmm. casting like we haven't got casting mm-hmm. calls uh you know ca- uh casting post yet so that i mean that's that's it's i, I said that it's 100 percent gonna happen eventually because it would yeah, be dumb of mean, them to have the rights for five years and to lose them and never make the movie um, yeah that would be a huge loss so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to happen. It's just I think putting people to the name, you know, putting people to the Friday the 13th name is uh, this is the first step. I think it's going to happen. So, yeah, I mean, all right. After that, we have Robert Hall. You guys might know him from Laid to Rest. Remember mm-hmm. Laid to Rest? Might be covering yep. that coming yeah. soon. Um, he is planning on remaking the Nail Gun Massacre. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> oh Are you god! The Dale Gun Massacre. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> so, so is he gonna come up with his own twist or something like that? Like, we already know what the twist is. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> like, uh, well, uh, I can... Robert Hall was actually supposed to direct the Chopping Mall remake for a while. What's going on with that one? It's dead in the water. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time since so I've even heard any rumblings about that one. So, Nail Gun Massacre, man, they're just they're just remaking everything. Yeah, <laughs> really, Nail Gun Massacre. Wow, I say, I say I love... those are the type of films you do remake, though. Ones that yeah. that like that's not a classic, is it? I mean, it's it, I mean within the genre, I mean it's very well known. Yeah, it's but it's not yeah, like a... Friday Thirteenth, Halloween Prom Night, shit like that, right? It's, I mean, it's a it's like a third tier title. It's definitely got a cult following behind it. I mean. I really enjoy the film, to be honest. It's it's one of those so bad it's good films. Yeah, it's a cheese fest. I mean, it's pretty damn popular, though. If you look at people that are into the genre, I mean, probably everyone probably has a copy of it or like oh, yeah. a shirt and have it on DVD, Blu-ray, and VHS. Do you, Derek? <laughs> do you have a copy? Yeah, I have the 88 Films Blu-ray of it. Oh, you picked up that one? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah nice. 
Uh, so this is a quote by Hall. He said, it's going to be a fun movie for sure. Uh, he, he commented on whether they would retain the comedic camp tone of the original. However, yeah. the new screenplay is really smart and we, and we are pulling back on the camp for sure. It's an update for today's demanding audience in springing you what the fuck superb nail gun kills, of course. So nice. they'll, probably keep, they'll, they'll probably keep the core idea of the film, you know, more or less like what the killer looks like and stuff. But they'll definitely have to change up the twist or whatever they call want to call that. <laughs> so to keep a little fresh. I, I mean, I, I think that's kind of cool if they're, if they're going to, you know, I hope it doesn't take itself too serious. And then it comes off as being like too serious. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a yeah. nail gun massacre, man. Uh, if they just, you know, keep a little bit of camp in it, that'll be okay. But uh I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm all, I'm all for it. I want to see all. I want to see how gory it is because laid the rest in those films have some cool effects. Yeah. yeah well, man. he's an effects artist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That that's exactly man. So. So he knows he knows the seriousness of. Definitely effects. has potential. Well, yeah. I mean, the laid the rest films are pretty. They're pretty serious. I mean, you know, if they if they have retained that tone with the gore, this has potential, man. I think it's got. Fucking love the look of the killer in the first one, man. It's awesome. Yeah, it oh, yeah. It could be cool. So, um, I mean, right there, it's already a plus, right? The film good... killers are always my favorite. The yeah, film man. is supposed <laughs> to start principal photography in Texas late summer of 2017. Sweet. Sweet. Uh, also, um, the last bit of news here that I have, I didn't want to go full out because we've been gone for two weeks and, you know, some of the stuff has already been said. But I, I wanted to point this out because I'm actually really excited about this. Um, Wishmaster is getting released. Not just the first one, not just the second one, not just the third one, but all four, the quadrilogy, uh, by the Vestron video label, which is ran by Lionsgate, uh, home entertainment. It's coming out March 28th and it's the Wishmaster collection, uh, four films on Blu-ray. I believe it is three discs. Uh, disc one is, uh, has an audio commentary, uh, with director and screenwriter an audio commentary with the director and stars isolated score selections audio interviews uh with uh composer harry manfredini out of the bottle interviews with the director the magic words an interview with the screenwriter there's jin and alexandra interviews with divoff andrew divoff what's his name divoff divoff i think it is Divoff. yeah i think that yeah Divino, yeah. And Tammy Lauren, uh, Captured Visions, an interview with the director of photography, wish list, interviews with actors Kane Hodder and Ted Raimi, teaser trailers, radio spots, vintage making of featurette, behind the scenes footage compilation, storyboard, still gallery. Uh, and that's just for the disc one, right? Uh, this too has an audio commentary with director Jack Shoulder, which is on the second film. Uh, and disc three has. Uh, an audio commentary with the director of part three, uh, as well as the director of uh, part four, which is the same guy. Uh, so that has three commentaries between uh, Wishmaster three and four, and uh, hmm. it has a Wishmaster uh, featurette too, um, which is uh, sort of, um, I guess, going to be a little featurette on on the three uh, four films. Uh, so I was actually quite surprised with the amount of special features for this franchise because it's not a popular franchise it's, no no it's, no you know it's known but it's nowhere near up there with like the the main franchises that we talk about uh, uh -huh. i wouldn't even say it's up there with like stuff like critters um it's it's a little lower than that. i love i personally love the first two Wishmasters. i grew up watching them i it actually used to scare me when i was a kid Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, uh, it was like the first expendables of horror, you know, with all the cool little the cameos, cameos and, stuff. And, and shit like yeah. that. Um, it's, it has been so long since I've seen the films. Yeah. It, it's been it's, uh, way too long. It's, it's a cool little series. I haven't seen the, I've only seen, I've seen the sequels, but I, it's been so long that I don't even remember. Yeah. I, I barely even remember them. Um, but that's going to be the ninth release from Vestron. Uh, Man, I don't know, dude. I, I love that they're putting the uh, effort on these these films that aren't as popular. The, these films that aren't as, yeah. um, 
notable, I guess. Like it, it's cool. I've often mm-hmm. I've said this before, but I often find the history and the making of movies that aren't really good more interesting than the ones that are really good. They're just yeah. more interesting stories. Um, what do you guys think? Are you guys looking forward to that release? Are you gonna buy it? Are you gonna yeah, I, I'm, I'm I'm grabbing it because I actually, like you said, I'm a fan of the first two films, and it's been a while since I saw three and four, which I don't remember liking if I remember correctly because they're really bad. They, they recast <laughs> it and stuff. I think that was yeah. a fatal flaw. What about you, Mads? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I mean, I think Vestron's doing a really good job. Actually, I'm not really looking forward to the price. I'm probably gonna have to pay for this fucking thing. Uh, but you no, know, it's an it's an interesting release. It kind of it kind of surprised me a little bit. I'm like, really, the whole franchise, Wishmaster. Well, well, well <laughs> but well, they could have did it worse, and they could have released them all singly. <laughs> At least they they knew they know that uh, part three and four would never sell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to put them in a you got to put them in a package deal to sell those bitches. Yeah, but at the same time, I bet you if they just released part 1 and 2, it would sell as much as releasing all four. Probably. That's true. So, I mean, yeah. I think that it's, you know, credit that they put in the extra two films when it probably didn't mm-hmm. upsells that much. You know, I am curious to see how many people actually buy this thing cuz I know well, we already know the, the two franchi- people that's not. Yeah, the franchise <laughs> is a little bit hit and miss with people. I've, you know, just from after it got released, people were saying, oh, I don't even like those films. I like them. And, you know, it was kind of mixed. The voices were kind of mixed on that. So yeah. I'm curious because, I mean, because it is a little more expensive too, even though you are getting the four films, but it's still a price, right? It's actually, You're still paying price. It's, it's actually so. not as expensive as I thought. I got it for 37 pre ordered, which, you know, if you break that down by film, what are you paying? Less than less than 10 bucks a film yeah 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 That's it's fair. still a good deal yeah yeah um it is in a slim pack you know a regular standard keep case dvd um yeah. so whether you like that or not i don't know but i think for con- consistency and continuity's sake like on the shelf because these are numbered i think it does look better to not have a big fat one yeah I know you like yeah, the I mean, fat ones, though. Most. I do. I do. I, I I know, but it's getting to the point now where I'm really, you know, we're something like the Wishmaster franchise. I don't really mind that it is in a slim case. I mean, for something like, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, I always complain about that box set because it's just, it's it such doesn't a grand have franchise, you know, it, that's the thing. It's, it's yeah. such a popular and good, and it's my favorite franchise too. So I always it's wanted of, something a little bit more, a little more, you know, out it's there. It's one of the big three franchises. Yeah. You know, give it, give it, uh, you know, the respect it deserves, you know, not just like this little thin case and shit like that, but you know, something like the Wishmaster, that's totally fine. It's yeah. totally fine. So. Yeah. So, I mean, what, uh, what, I, I pretty much said that, you know, we probably will rec- uh, cover these films once that set's released. Um, mm-hmm. because that's actually a, a series that has been suggested before. Um, yeah. Yep. And you know, before that announcement, which is cool. Um, I look at this as like, okay, if they're willing to do these Wishmaster films, like they might be – that like it's cool because I know what they have in their library on like some of the other series that they could do and that's cool to me, right? Like that's uh, – like, mm-hmm. there's so many – there's so many titles out there and I like that they're taking their time with them too. They're not – they haven't released more than two a month so far. Uh, this month yeah. has two. Next month has one. Uh, the month after that has one so far, which is the wish. Well, December set. they didn't even they didn't even release any, did they? No, they I didn't release they any. Yeah. December, so. they do. They're doing it slowly, which is good because you get you got a chance if you didn't pick up the other ones. Oh, they're not flooding the market like Scream Factory did there for a while with their six, seven, eight releases a month. It was like, yeah. holy fuck. But we got to remember, Scream Factory only released two at a time for a while. <laughs> So. Yeah, it, it, there was a few months there at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine Vestron doing what Scream Factory did and trying to flood the market, especially yeah. the way sales are right now, too. Yeah. Plus, so, they don't have, like, but, com- contemporary titles like IFCs and stuff, too. Listen, yeah. I know that some people don't might not be interested in Wishmaster, but if you've never seen it, maybe give it a pre-order, maybe give it a try. Um, because, honestly, dude, like, this... This company owns so many fucking gems and so many horror films that aren't even released on DVD. Like, these things have to sell a little bit in order for us to get that shit. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like, this Vestron label has potential to make a lot of people's days. 
you know, but the thing is we have to put in the work and, you know, purchase these things, which is, yeah. like, you know, and, part and of the if, battle, you know? And if you're I mean, not... if nobody buys these releases, I mean, let's face it, we're never going to see any of those titles, those potential titles, those hidden gems that we've been all waiting for and stuff, you know, so. And if you're not yeah, like, interested in Wishmaster, grab fucking parents, dude, or grab the gate. The gate's the mm-hmm. shit. Grab the Lair gate. with the white worm, man. Lair the white worm's awesome. The Gate is awesome. I lo- the Gate is probably my favorite film on the list so far. Out of the yeah, movie. The Gate's a good one. Yeah, I uh, still need Waxwork good. one and two, but after that, I, I have say, everything. In- oddly enough, mine is probably I don't know, probably Return of Living Dead Part Three. Oh shit, I forgot about that one. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man! Fucking. <laughs> I have. Of course, I got a story yet. to tell about this release. So <laughs> I pre-ordered. I pre-ordered. Uh, Return of Living Dead 3, uh, when it first, you know, was available on Amazon.ca for pre-order. So I pre-ordered it, and of course, when it came out, it wasn't, they didn't have it in stock. And usually, I would cancel my order and just go somewhere else, like I usually do. But this particular time, I couldn't really find a copy that was, you know, going to be worth it for myself. You know, imported from the States, conversion, blah, blah, blah. You guys all know the deal. It -hmm. actually would end up costing me more to get it. So I said, fuck it. I'm going to sit on the pre-order, wait for it to come back in stock, and then, you know, it says shipping in one to two months, and uh, whatever. (laughs) It is what it is. I don't need it right now. It's fine. Uh, So it actually showed up a couple days ago, and uh, it it arrived without a (laughs) slipcover. And we all know like, it just looks so stupid. I kind of put it up on the shelf with the other ones. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Did I just turn into this person where now I'm going to complain that this thing didn't come with a slipcover? Generally, I wouldn't. But these things are numbered and they kind of look very, very uniform. And my OCD was just, it was beating the shit out of me. I was like, what am I going to fucking do? I was like so mad. So I made a post, kind of a sarcastic post in the Facebook group. And I made some ridiculous answers like, what should I do? And uh, ultimately... The one that got chose was actually sent back to Amazon and pressed my luck or, you know, chance my luck that they'll send me one with a with a slip cover. And lo and behold, I actually did it yesterday. I sent it back. This is the first time I own like 8000 movies. I've never sent a movie back ever because it was lacking a slip cover because generally I really don't give a shit that much. But for this, these are numbered. Like I said, the uniform, my OCD would not be able to handle this. So I actually sent it back. So so fingers crossed right now. Everyone pray for me. Let, let's do like a little little bit of a prayer here that I actually get this one with a slip cover. So yeah, if it, not, it actually, I got the, the eBay's of the world. I know. So if it comes back without a slip cover, then I'm just going to say, fuck it. You know, I mean, there's what can I do, man? I mean, I'm not going to keep you know doing this back and forth with Amazon, sending shit back and stuff. So, um, and, you know, if it comes back without one, I guess I'll just uh, just kind of keep my head up, man. And look for one because I know people sell these things because they're greedy motherfuckers Sometimes and they sell for these like four dollars. I've I've seen them as cheap as three or four dollars shipped mm-hmm. on eBay. So I actually I actually did look up on eBay like right away. I was like, ah, fuck, I'll look on eBay to see if there's actually one on there. There wasn't. There was just a couple. Co- there was only like two copies on eBay even for sale for Return of Leaving Dead Part Three. I was very surprised by that. And uh, there were like thirty five dollars, you know, kind of thing. Right? I'm like, oh. Jesus Christ. So, I know. I was yeah. like, holy shit. But no slip covers. So I was like, well, you know, and then that's when I made that kind of joking, um, you know, post and stuff. But uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if it comes back with one. I'm going to be like, How, why the fuck didn't I get one in the first place? You <laughs> like, know, that's man, ridiculous. honestly, dude, they they're not kidding when they say they don't print a bunch of these because um, even the press copies are so hard to get. Like um, me and Jason both tried to get them and. They they're like, listen, guys, we get so many requests and barely any press copies. Like, yeah, you know, it's 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 hard to get those. I know I know a lot of people who haven't got them who get everything. P- people who mm-hmm. get like you know, goddamn super studio shit. You know, like hell, like sometimes sometimes pe- there's people out there who are getting everything and not getting these things. Um, but. Yeah, so uh, I just want to support it while they're still cool, you know, because eventually they'll not be cool like Scream Factory. <laughs> so let's support them while they're cool and young. So maybe they don't, then maybe they don't <laughs> fall into the traps that Scream Factory has with fucked up discs and different shit like that. But uh, that's, oh, that, that, good. that's another fucking thing. Jesus Christ, man! Like, so I get, so I contacted Scream Factory, you know, after the whole fucking special with yeah with black christmas right and then i find out that uh child's play has problems and stuff like that and apparently so does the thing and so does dead ringers and but i, I hadn't 
picked up Dead Ringers. But anyways, I contacted him. I, I asked him if I get re- the replacement disc for Black Christmas and Child's Play. Lo and behold, I received the replacement disc for Child's Play. And I'm like, where's Black Christmas? I originally contacted them about Black Christmas and then asked them after for Child's Play and I got Child's Play. So I emailed them and I said, did you guys send these in separate packages? And he's like, yeah, I think so. If you don't get it by Friday, then just contact us again and uh, we'll we'll send out another copy. Well, I didn't I, I didn't get it. I never did get the Black Christmas. So I still have to email them. But I'm like, Jesus Christ. And I'm like, then I, of course, after I had contacted them, I find out about the thing. And I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. This is ridiculous. I'm afraid. I'm a little bit scared, honestly, to buy Screen Factory releases now because of this problem. Just knowing that these discs have, you know, potential defects and stuff in them is annoying to me. Yeah, and it's, I it's I just really don't annoying it. for people. I don't like just back and forth emailing and, and waiting for these little little packages. They send them in like – they're so thin and small. They don't send them in like an oversized pack. They get lost in the mail essentially is what these things do. And I'm like, why don't they send them in bigger packages? The guy literally told me this. He goes, they get lost all the time. I'm like, why the fuck you send them in bigger bubble wrap packs or something like that? But this is annoying, dude. Like six, seven releases at one time with defects. It's like, wow, man. Yeah, that's not buying. I, I'm afraid to buy these things, man. I'm afraid. And and someone asked me the other day, which I'm pretty sure we've all been asked this question. Like, when when is when do you start buying Black Christmas in a store? Like, are you going to get the defective one, or even or yeah. the these? Or like, what's going on with that? Because like, so there's a copy of Dead Ringers at HMV. I think it was Dead Ringers. Uh, yeah, or something like that. But I was like, I don't want to buy this because. It might be, you know, it's probably the defective disc, and I'm going to have to contact him and then do this waiting game thing again. I'm like, this is ridiculous, man. So I'm just like, fuck this. I'm going to go pre-order the Vestron titles and and the new Vinegar Syndrome ones, and and uh, fuck you, Screen Factory. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys are annoying I, me. I, I have a story really quick. Um, one one of the FYEs around here is closing down. And for those of you who don't know what FYE is, it's it's essentially a, a, a music slash video store. Um, it's called mm-hmm. it stands for For Your Entertainment. They've been around for a long time, and I, I used to actually buy a lot of stuff at FYE um, because uh, the way I always described it is everything is marked up, and then there's a couple things that aren't. So you just have to find yeah. the couple things that aren't. And mm-hmm. um, I haven't been there in a while, and they completely changed the layout of it. It used to be on, like, DVD shelves, like the ones we have in our rooms and stuff, and you just go yeah. down and look at them. Now they're in these fucking stupid, like, how CDs are stacked, where they're, like, in the, oh. oh, my God, they're, it's a nightmare <laughs> to look through those things. And um, so that's why I stopped going in the first place, because I, I was actually mad. I was like, I was like, why did they change the way that they shelve these things? It makes no sense. It doesn't even fix that much it doesn't even like change the space really um but this one is going out of business um so i was actually looking for some masters of horror you know because we're doing season two and i I don't own all of them and i was like okay i'll check some like local stores before i start ordering online and stuff and i did find a couple but uh it's going out of business so everything's you know marked down and it's uh, there's signs everywhere, big red and yellow signs that that are like, uh, you know, everything must go and like going out of business sale and like, um, you know, f- uh, for 40, it started out 30% off. And then like the next week it was like, uh, 40% off. And then it was like 40 to 90% off. And I was like, Oh sweet. And you know, this was the last week it was open. So I was like, uh, it was the third day before it closed. I went in and I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to check out some stuff. And like everything that I looked at, I was like, I would take up the counter. I was like, how much percent off is this? And he'd be like 40%. And I'd be like, okay, so 40% off of super expensive is the price you get it everywhere else. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe like 10 cents more than the price you get it everywhere else. So like everything that I'm finding, it's like, uh, like I'm like, (laughs) Like I take a Scream Factory up there that's like forty fucking dollars. I'm like, how much is this? And they're like, I was like, is this one of the sixty percent off ones <laughs> or seventy percent off? It's like, of course not. <laughs> it's it's like it comes out to like twenty two dollars. I'm like, oh, exactly what you would pay for it on Amazon. <laughs> and um, you know, and then so I figure, okay, well, the last day they obviously got to get rid of everything. So, you know, let's. I assume everything will be ninety percent off. 
And I call them the day before. I'm like, how much is uh, the percent off today? And then they're like, oh, it's uh, 40 to 90 percent. And I was like, <laughs> okay, what about tomorrow, the last day? And she, they're like, oh, that's our final markup. Or markdown, whatever you want to say, and I'm like, what the? I'm like, are you kidding me? Like you're, like you're selling everything at regular price. No wonder you fucking went out of business. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like no even doubt. going out of business, you guys can't cut a deal. <laughs> Ridiculous. Man. My my FYE yeah, that... closed like years ago. It's I still have three. That was the fourth one. Um, but anyway, I did end up getting four Masters of Horror. I already own four, so uh, I only need like. four. Five more, I think. Yes, that's good. I, that's it for news <laughs> and story time, bro. All right. Yeah, so- 2017 turned a great year so far for releases, but the deaths are still happening. <laughs> oh yeah, man, totally, man. Rest in peace to John Hurt. That's brutal, man. William Peter Bat Blatty. You know what? Yeah, um, I actually thought John Hurt was older. He was 77. I, for some reason, I thought he was way older, man. It's crazy. Yeah, the, the, you know about the deaths. Um, Dave recently said that, uh, I think he mentioned it on our 2015 year end show too, but, um, Dave from exploding head said like, guys, these aren't going away. And, you know, I, I had thought that subconsciously as well, and maybe even consciously, but just never vocalized yeah. it. Like, like, yeah, this, I don't, I might've vocalized it. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's like, these legends are old as hell, dude. Like it's not going to stop. It's probably only going to yeah. get worse. Um, it's so enough, we just gotta man. get used to it. Unfortunately, yeah. it's sad, but it was something that actually we completely forgot to do on the year end show. Was you know kind of give our respects to some of the people that passed away in 2016. Completely spaced on that, yeah. but then again, that segment would have been really long <laughs> because there was a lot oh. of deaths. Like 2016 was crazy, but uh, yeah, I know yeah, I mean, that's keep happening, but it's just been like 9,000 of them happening in like one week. Well, that, that's what people seem to forget that, yeah, like a lot of these people that we grew up watching and stuff, we're getting older. That means they're getting older, too. And that's part of life, man. Die. Uh, yeah. So I, I honestly, I just wish people would stop judging a year based on deaths. It's like it's just part of life, man. It's, uh, you know, like all the posts are like, oh, man, 2016 sucks. So many people died. It's like, but people die every year. So every year sucked. Yeah. I mean, that's it's like, what, stop, stop judging an entire year on based on deaths it's just it sucks when people die but we also move on mm-hmm. like where we are now we're in 2017 so it, it is what it is but i don't know it kind of annoys me but john hurt rest in peace i always remember john hurt as uh john merritt uh, john merritt from uh elephant man the Elf- played yeah. the elephant. and he was the very first chest buster and alien well he was in a lot of movies man john hurt was i think he had something like he must have been in at least 200 movies, I would say. Yeah. It's crazy. He, he was even in that vampire movie you reviewed on the What We Watch, uh, Only the Dead Young Die or whatever. The oh, Jim Jarm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. QQ. Yeah. All right. So moving along into uh, Mood Swings and the DVD and Blu ray releases for. Well, usually what I do is I. Because we release the show after, you know, the actual release date. It's uh, so, but for this week, I'm at, since there's more releases on the 31st, I'm going to go through the ones that are on January 31st and I'll do the, the couple that are on February 7th just because why not? Why not, right? Yeah. Right? It, it doesn't have to be a perfect format here, right? So, anyways, uh, first up here from Vinegar Syndrome, we have a double feature of Blood Mania and Point of Terror. Nice, coming. nice. I don't know, it's so that's such a great double feature, man. Vinegar Syndrome always I'm, doing good stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to see what Blood Mania looks like on Blu-ray because isn't it, it? Is it a public domain film, Derek? Do you know? I'm not that sure. That one seems to pop up on a lot of public I'm, domain. Yeah, she, it was on a few Mill Creek ones. Yeah, it's it's always all over the place. I'm kind of wondering. I think Point of Terror. Oh, maybe that one's not, but I don't know. But, I'm excited. Uh, I'm, Double features are usually my favorite releases from any company because they're just fun like, to see what films they pair with each other. Yeah, I always used to be, you know, kind of on the fence about double features. And then, you know, I, it was never my – I was like, oh, I want this one as a solo release, solo release. And then Screen Factory st- kind of changed my mind a little bit on those. 
Yeah. I mean, still my favorite release by Screen Factory is the the Video Dead Terror Vision. Terror Vision. Even though as much as I, I think still to this day, I truly believe that those should have been collector's editions themselves because they, they – and they did say it right though. They said that they weren't sure if they were going to sell properly. That's why they wanted a double feature. Uh, it, it turns out that they probably would have sold really well as collector's editions, but those things mm-hmm. have more features than most collector's editions. But I, yeah. that little feature was kind of the one that was the turning point for myself. And I really like when Screen Factory puts – I like the presentation of their double features, how it has the uh, you know the Screen Factory logo and – just how I just like the presentation of them and All right. the job, Me but too. I wish they. My biggest gripe with Screen Factory and their double features is simply the fact that they they didn't really continue um, pairing up films that made sense. Yeah. You know they used to, you know they used to have like the Video Dead and, and Terror Vision is perfect. I mean that's a theme. There's a theme there. Yeah. Uh, they didn't really continue with the themes, and that was my biggest gripe. But you know some of them are themed out. But you know that would the been creature cool feature they, they, ones are cool. Yeah, the, the creature that's a great example. And you know, but some of them are just outrageous. It's like why are these together? <laughs> uh, what, what which one you like the Dungeon Masters Eliminators? That's that's perfect. Yeah. Well, well, I could tell you why they paired those together. Oh, uh, because they're Empire films? Yeah. Probably. I mean, I guess there, there's probably some hidden theme in there or whatever. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I th- I, I'm pretty I, – off the top of my head, I'm not 100% sure which one. But I know there's one that's just like the weirdest double feature. Mm-hmm. But anyways, yeah. Blood Mania, Point of Terror, looking forward to that one. I got my pre-order in for that. And I also have a pre-order in for this. You know, I, I never did grab the Scorpion Blu-ray when it came out. I don't know Me why. Neither. Considering I grab pretty much everything that Scorpion releases, just never grab this one because I had the D- – that's why. Because I had the DVD and I was like, eh, do I need another copy of this? But now I think it's the time because it's Vinegar Syndrome and they kill it with their, their transfers. And we got Don't Answer the Phone. <laughs> Fucking sleazy-ass <laughs> video now. Even, even the cover is sleazy. What about, I know, man. What about Boo? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, w- I was going to say that one after, but yeah, so don't answer the phone from Vinegar Syndrome, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we could throw this one out there. We got Tyler Perry's Boo. Ugh. Yeah, that was supposed to be, a, like, like I honestly, because I sent that press, I got a press release for that, like, a while back, and I was like, Jesus. Did you? <laughs> yeah, and I posted it in the group. It. I po- no, I didn't want that. I posted it in a group, and, like, some people were like, this should be episode 100, for, I, I kid you guys not for a brief moment I really did consider pulling a South Park and actually doing that I was going to talk to Muds about it and and then making episode 100 actually episode 101 um, you know you remember how South Park did that right where it was like the Cartman's mom's a dirty slut and it was like <laughs> the end of season one. That was the cliffhanger yeah, yeah. episode. And then everybody waited for season two. And then it was a fucking Terrence and Phillips special. That's right. <laughs> oh yeah. I remember that shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. I really did consider it. I, I, I and then I was like, ah, Dude, you should have brought you should have brought it out to you. I would have been like, man, we should really consider this like for real. Yeah, and even call <laughs> it you know the top ten one hundred <laughs> thing for like the first week and then change the title. <laughs> uh, did Tyler we drop the ball? I don't know. <laughs> Tyler Perry's boo, man. I bet you that one's gonna be a hot seller. <laughs> probably fucking will be. People released. love those things, dude. It's like a fucking Halloween movie, you know, getting released in in January. It's so weird. <laughs> But yeah. and Tyler Perry, that guy pumps out films, man. Crazy, crazy paces, man. <laughs> I actually like his, some of his dr- dr- dramatic films. Like, I have seen a few of them. Not me. I they're don't actually like not that dude at all. <laughs> well, he doesn't star in them. He only directs them. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up here, man, we got uh, one from Vestron. Good old Vestron. We were just talking about, and we got the Liar of the White Worm. Looking yeah. forward to this. Um, I've never seen it. I reviewed this actually when I did my '88 series, I believe. It's I a watched, good film, man. I watched this back Are during my Stoner days. Are both of those films days. from '88? Parents '88 uh, as well. It could be, yeah. What well, was it on your '88 series? <laughs> I can't remember if I reviewed Parents or not. Well, I mean, the thing is, there was a lot of films that didn't make it on because it was all random, right? Yeah. Right, like even in my '80, yeah, like I mean, there was a couple of films, uh, it's but remember. Yeah, that's what parents uh. say. Okay. So Lair of the White Worm, uh, definitely a film if you've never seen before, check out. It's very, very cool. Very, very cool film. And, of course, from Vestron also, we have Parents uh, with Randy Quaid. Fuck, man. His performance in this movie is outstanding. I love Parents. It's it's 
yeah. it's, it's not like a great, great film, but it's got so much heart to it. it there's something about that. I love watching Parents. It's, Randy Quaid's performance is excellent. So yeah, Randy Quaid's good. In there. Yeah. Um, uh, from Scream Factory, we got Poltergeist Two Collector's Edition uh, and Poltergeist Three, of course. Um, <laughs> dude, these cover arts are so identical that I have to actually like read which one and which ones which one. You know, like I have to read Poltergeist yeah, I, two and three. I don't know like, shit about the movies, but I actually like those. Yeah, the cover, the new Justin Osborne man. Yeah, I, yeah, they're pretty good. I, I love that purple scheme, like that. Yeah. The purple scheme's cool, man. He's like um, the, one of the best illustrators for them. Yeah. Right? Um, well, he does every company now too. So yeah, yeah, he's been definitely busy, man. Uh, Poltergeist two, not a bad film. I, I think there's a little bit too too much story too much mythology with with the native american stuff in that one for myself i actually prefer poltergeist 3 i know people are probably screaming blasphemy uh, but that's just my personal taste i i like the setting of poltergeist 3 a lot more than than part 2 uh part 2 just gets a little like i said it's just too there's too much in there uh kind of takes away from the film for me but poltergeist 3 is just straight up like ghost shit in a in a high riser in chicago yeah, awesome. gary gary sherman film yeah it's just, it's fun, man. It's really really fun. So, uh, this one right here, I'm really curious about. From One Seven Movies, uh, we have Wax Mask finally yes. gets a re-release. I've been waiting for this to get re-released for years. I didn't, never thought in a million years that One Seven Movies, aka My Communications, aka would no release in Blu-rays. Is that yeah, an this older is their... movie or a new movie? Wax it's Mask. Night. It's from the '90s, I think. Oh. Yeah, it is from the it is from the '90s. It, it, you know, it that, actually that has actually a very sense. it actually has a very interesting history. That movie, though, it's yeah. produced by Dario Argento, and it was actually supposed to be directed by Lucio Fulci. It was going to be the first time that uh, they were going to work together because they didn't have like the greatest history together, yeah, personally. And then Fulci died, and the film's actually dedicated to him. And uh, the makeup effects artist Sergio Stavali took over. The yeah. directing job. Yeah, that's sad. That's sad that he didn't get to do that movie, but um, it's cool, man. You know, again, I'm I'm really curious to see how their transfer is going to be on is this because, as we know, or a Blu-ray. That's a Blu-ray. It's a Blu-ray. Uh, because a lot of the one seven, you know, slash my communication transfers aren't really the greatest, you know, DVD transfers and stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, who knows, man? Maybe they stepped up their game and this one's going to be an amazing release. So, I think Jeremy has a copy of it right now. To be he honest, does. but um, so I told him I said, you know, if you watch it, you know, like it, send it my way, man. It's expensive here. <laughs> uh, next up here, we got. I like to talk about these mystery science theater three thousand releases, so volume four. Um, this one's actually really strange. I don't really man, know. I wish I had the money to collect these while they're coming out again. <laughs> Me too. They're going to be out it's of print cool. right after you know, they go out of print so fast. I know these ones like they never last long. But this one right here has got space mutiny. Uh, overdrawn at Memory Bank. <laughs> <laughs> overdrawn at the Spank Bank. Uh, girl in gold boots in Hamlet. So I don't even. I don't think I've even Hamlet. seen it. So I, I know it's weird, man. <laughs> I don't know what that's all about. But uh, I don't know. It looks interesting. Uh, then from Synapse, and this was a little bit controversial. I think when it got announced or whatever, that it was only coming out on DVD, and that is the Coffin Joe trilogy. Um. I mean, Elise is getting. Is there only three re- Coffin Joe films? For some reason, I thought there's four. No, there's only three. Okay. There is yeah. the, the trilogy, yeah. yeah. So that's coming out. Um, and Bottoming and Evil, they the third one in the trilogy, uh, had a Blu ray release from Synapse years ago. So that's that actually uh-huh. is available on Blu ray. So they're just not doing the first two. Did they say um, why? They said they couldn't find any elements, like original elements that were good enough to do the transfer over. They just felt like, you know, Synapse is pretty, pretty damn picky with their shit. So. They felt like they couldn't find enough good material, source material to to do a good enough transfer, so they just said, "Fuck it." Yeah, but I was wondering what the fuck was taking so long with that box set or whatever. But I mean, yeah. what what's the price point on that set? Uh, this one right here, I believe, is going for well, twenty twenty two ninety nine. Not bad. Pretty that's, damn. That's pretty good for three films yeah. and three yeah. good movies too. Yeah, it is and just already DVD, on, but. And, and if you already own the Blu-ray release, they they released the first two films separately too, so that's yep. good. I yeah, might that's right. I might actually buy. I haven't seen any of those. That's actually I like, like how they. We, we should do a Coffin Joe show. I really do. actually like the fact that they did that. That they released the first two films on DVD. 
uh, separate from the trilogy because of the reason of uh, them having the third one out on Blu-ray already. So yeah. that was that was good on Snaps of doing that. So mm-hmm. and you know at the same time, you know we didn't have to wait like a year for them to come come out on solo copies. You know it's like fuck. You know, certain companies like to do that shit. Yeah, but I mean, uh, at so this that's... point, if you're going to buy both of those, you might as well just buy the box set since it's cheaper to buy the box set than those two singles. Yeah, exactly. So those are the films that are coming out on the 31st. We'll get into the ones that are coming out February 7th. Uh, we got Anti-Birth <clears throat> uh, from IFC and Scream Factory. Uh, did you guys get a chance to see Anti-Birth last year? Nope. I did. What would you think of it? I dug it. It had some cool premises and cool uh, imagery. I, I want to revisit it though. I kind of started like in the f- days of like between films, so I kind of don't remember some shit that happened in it. But it was a cool little film. Yeah, I thought it was really good, man. It, it's funny because I know Derek and, or not Derek, Brandon and Dave. I, I, I know they saw it and they said they hated it, and yeah. it ultimately made my top thirty. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> so <laughs> it is what it is, man. Um, if you test their opinions more than mine, then you know don't buy it. But I do which... recommend it. Just really quickly, was there anything that you guys saw post show from 2016 that would have affected your list at all? Uh, I think I might have. I can't remember. I think there was one film. Um, I'm not even 100 percent sure. I'm not, I'm not sure. Are we talking the top 10 list or like a full blown top 30 type thing? Not like the top 10. Uh, not the top 10, no. No, I saw a couple films after that I ended up putting in my top 30 that bumped a couple others out. Mm. But uh, but that was about it, really. I think right. they're really good. So yeah, uh, Then we got from uh, Kino on the Redemption line, we got Dr. Orloff's Monster. Yeah, Jess, Jess Franco. Franco. So this will just be an upgrade for me. I already have the DVD. But since I collect this Redemption line, I have to pick it up. Um, I like these Orloff films, man, the Dr. Orloff films. I've always been a big fan of them, to be honest. I mean, to be, you know, these early Jess Franco films are so different than his, like, early 70s and, you know, 80s sleaze and shit like that. These ones are actually, like, legitimately well-produced and good films. You know, he hadn't become, like, a sleazy director yet, so I don't know. Yeah. No, so if all if, if what you know from Jess Franco is his sleazy shit, the, this is completely different, so... Give it a shot. Uh, for any of the fans out there of Penny Dreadful, the complete series is coming to Blu-ray. What did that series have, like, three two seasons? seasons? Three, three seasons? Yeah. Three seasons, and they got canceled, right? Well, no, it actually ended. Like, they ended Oh, it, it. ended in three yeah, seasons? It was, yeah, it yeah, was It was, it was always going to be a three-season show. Yeah, I hear that's it's amazing, so. That's pretty cool. It is good. Huh. I'm going to have to give that one a shot, man. Three seasons seems like it's, you know, doable. Mm-hmm. Doable. I mean... That's- I, I recently started up watching uh, Scream season two. Got four episodes in, and I was like, I, I literally wanted to hang myself. It was, it wasn't very good. It was really bad. It's like so fast paced and like, but like not really a lot is really happening. And I don't know, man. It's just, it was bugging me. I think the coolest thing is the one character. He's got the podcast. He's got the horror podcast called the Morgue. Oh, it's so original. But uh, the Morgue, <laughs> the Morgue. But you know, I think that's kind of cool, man podcasters yeah. they can be relatively cool people yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, penny, but penny dreadful has timothy dalton <laughs> timothy dalton nice man nice i love his bond films yeah. those 80s films are wicked um <clears throat> yeah i don't really know much about this one it's coming out from sony and it's called abattoir i think that's how you pronounce oh, that's it a, that's a darren lynn bosman film oh uh, that's the one that everybody that there was an article that went around um last week or the week before that said uh dan lim bowsman's avatar is the best horror film of 2016 that you didn't see or something along those lines but i get okay. it, it okay. i think it's officially 2017 <clears throat> released for us list wise hmm. i know brian from abc's really enjoyed it he did a post on it him and jamie really enjoyed that one that's cool. Cool. Well, I have to check it out. Actually, Jessica Loundis is in it, so and she's super hot. So I see that uh, it's definitely worth checking out for that. <laughs> uh, nine thirty nine. What's with the price? Nine thirty nine. I like that. Um, yeah. Nine thirty nine. It's cool. That's a good price. price. Yeah, it is good. It's not bad. <laughs> uh, from Cinedime, we've got Candyland. Dying has never been so sweet. I gotta say, I like that cover. 
It's not going to Candy is spelled cool. Candy is spelled C A N D I. I like that. You think Candy Land the other way is copyrighted? Like the board It game? might it might be. Probably. You know, that's a good point and why they spelled it differently. <laughs> Unless they're just fancy, but honestly, the cover is super catchy. Super catchy. I like it. Yeah. I dig it. I check out Candy Land for sure. Why not? Uh here's one that I'll probably never ever Lay my eyes on We got a ghostly, ladies and gentlemen, in the right corner. Paranormal (laughs) abduction. Oh my god. Abduction. And it's got fucking Edward Furlong in it. (laughs) Oh no. The dude is doing anything. Is he just taking jobs? That's my dude. Who is what is Edward Furlong into Nicholas Cage? he's He's gonna pay for his stuff somehow. Yeah, that's crazy, man. He's turned into Nick Cage. Doing these really paranormal abductions. Man, that just sounds bad. That does Next, not sound inviting. No, Nick Cage still does like all right movies though for like sometimes. Yeah, it's he does when, one good movie for every ten every ten bad ones he does, he does like one hey, good hey, one. When when Nicolas Cage stars in a wild eye film, that's when we have to really worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could you imagine <laughs> on the raw line too it's like some shot on video film he's like well I, the script the script you know it sounded good i read it <laughs> yeah. you guys I'm leave sure nick cage alone read his scripts, man. He, i'm pretty uh, sure no i'm a big fan of nick script. cage it's just, he just crazy like, he judges yeah, nick cage is fun he takes a film just based on the title he's like yeah that one sounds pretty good i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it <laughs> It's like, Jesus Christ, dude. No, I, no, I like Nick Cage in a lot of films, man. Leaving Las Vegas. I love that film. I think it's one of his best yeah. films. And uh, Vampire's Kiss, I don't give a fuck what anyone says. That is the funniest movie ever made in the history of cinema. His performance is the most retarded and over-the-top thing I've ever seen. It's just so funny to watch. And the dialogue is outrageous. Uh, JP, did you ever watch it? No. I don't you know. never did? Oh, you should watch it, dude. It's... I don't know, man. You might even get a kick out of it. It's so ridiculously over. I know it, it, the conception on it seems to be either love it or yeah, fucking hate it. I can see why people hate it because it's a little bit tedious. It's it's so over the top. But yeah. anyways, next up we got recovery. <sighs> man, I, I don't. Ooh. know. I don't know. It won't even let me click on it. So can't even be that good. I can't even. It, get it a sounds like me after the ten top ten show. Like uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this one right here wow another one that uh, probably will never see my eyes will never look at again we have the priest's exorcism oh, oh man, this god cover. and the cover's so bad too like yeah I'm looking at it now it looks people. shitty <laughs> it looks so bad uh, suspenseful and a few jump in your seat moments oh so it's got it's just full of jump scares and shit that sounds real cool man I'm probably gonna get that one and I'm not really 100% sure what's up with this. Must be getting re-released. Maybe it went out of print or something, because I already own this. Uh, the Twilight Zone Complete 80 series. It's a right uh, Which is... Yeah, it's fun. And the yeah. 80 series is fun. <laughs> oh, they're re-releasing it? It's a right it? switch. Different company. It's a right... Like the, yeah, the, it's the same thing. It's CBS. They... they like, oh, you know how you've seen Tales from the Dark Side, Friday the 13th, yeah, yeah. the series? It's all the same company. It's CBS. Oh, may, oh maybe this will be, a, like, a better package in it, because those ones were pretty packaged, because I know you said that your old 80s series was shitty packaging. Yeah, yeah, dude, it was really bad. It was, like, kind of stacked and shit. So what I did is I went out. There was 13 discs, so I went out and bought uh, two six-disc six DVD holders, and I put my discs in there, and they actually fit into the package perfect. So I'm probably, like, one of the only people that ever thought it to do that. <laughs> but it actually it works out great. It's, like, a solid pack now and awesome. So cool. uh, the other one I just put into a sleeve and put it in there. But I showed Tara for Tom that. I said to him because he had that tattoo. He was complaining about the package. And he's like, damn, this is, like, the worst packaging ever. I'm like, yeah, I know. And I told him what I did, and I think he did it. I think he went out and did the same thing. So Yeah, so, so I might pick up this set if it's, like, those ones. It's fun, man. You know, they, they actually remake a couple episodes from the original series in there and stuff. Yeah. And it's fun. I, There's a lot of, like, early 80s faces you'll recognize. A lot of famous people in this I, one. Too. I know the, bo- the, the box, the, the actual, you know, the, the movie The Box was based off one of those episodes. Yeah, that's right. That is right. But button, button, yeah. Yep. That is true story, true story. And that is going to conclude the DVD and Blu-ray releases for January 31st and February 7th. So if you guys are interested in any of those, go out and buy two Second copies round. of each of restaurants. We get more cool titles in the future. You know what I'm saying? Get some unholy up in there. 
Yeah. yeah Stay I away from like those ghostly and exorcism yeah. films. Ugh. <laughs> God. Makes me gag. It's gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So moving along here. And um, we actually don't have any voicemails and questions this week, do we? I think uh, everyone that's been calling to the show has been leaving voicemails for episode 100. Yeah. Uh, we, ha- we have one uh, email here that uh, was sent about 12 days ago. 12 days ago. Yeah. All right. All right. This is from uh, Jim from Toronto. Uh, he says, hey, guys, I had a suggestion about the top 10 shows and rankings. You don't list the rankings of each movie in the show notes of all those episodes for obvious reasons. But it might be a good idea in the ratings section to maybe place a bracket with the rankings after each person's rating just to be able to look uh, up that particular movie on those episodes. As an example, on the top 10 of 2002, Irreversible was ranked, but you look, you'd look you have to scroll through the whole episode to define discussion on it. Maybe on the ratings page, have JP number 5, 8 out of 10. That way, in the show notes, you already have list. Uh, you have list number fives, and it would save a lot of time. That's kind of confusing to read it out loud. I know what he means, though. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I actually talked to Jim, and he he realized this after he sent the email. But um, those do there. exist. There is a list <laughs> of these films. Now, to be fair, the the 1996 and the 2016 were not up at the time, um, but. Now, if you go to the website, 22shotsofmoodsandhorror.com, on the top bar, you have sections, home, which is the home page, episodes, which is a list of our episodes, ratings, which a lot of people don't know this exists. I spent a lot of time on this. Ratings Mm -hmm. is an alphabetical order. You can click on any letter. For example, I Mm -hmm. click on Z, and it takes me to every film that we talked about on the podcast with the letter Z that we've reviewed. So you got Zaza Zombies, Zodiac, Zombie, Zombie 3, Zombie 5, Zombie Fight Club, Zombie Town, and Zombie The Beginning. And it has what our rating was and what episode it was on. So if you're ever curious if we reviewed something, go to the website, click ratings, click on Mm -hmm. the letter, and it's all in alphabetical order. Now, I usually am behind all the time, so like maybe the last episode or two won't be on there, but they get up there eventually. Um... Now, the li- the other thing is you have the Hall of Fame and the Hall of Pain, which are two awesome categories. Uh, oh, you have yeah. other podcasts that we've done, such as um, the short-lived uh, X-Files podcast and the Burial Grounds and Double Shot of Horror are also up on the website. Um, and you have a Top 10 tab. And if you click the Top 10 tab, you'll be brought to a page that has the Top 10 of 1968, 1996, 2002, 2013, 2014, 2015, and now 2016. Yeah. And if you click on any of those, for example, 1996, it takes you to a page that has a visual breakdown of the film and the host that had it in the order in which they were reviewed. So just for example, my list, I have a poster of The Craft at number 10 with the number 10 next to it, The Craft, JP, 7 out of 10. Under that is Bad Moon at number 9, Tremors at number 8, the Stenhall syndrome at number seven, Ebola syndrome at number six, and the list goes on and on. And each mm-hmm. host has that there. It's a visual breakdown. It's a quick reference. If you're curious, look at the rating section or the uh, top 10 mm-hmm. section. And those are listed. Um, it is. I think that it's a good thing. And if you guys are curious ever what our ra- what our lists were, mm-hmm. you can click on that and you'll see ours and our guest host list. And if you click on mm-hmm. 1968, for example, you might Jeremy. laugh <laughs> because Jeremy's the top. Jeremy his top five enough. list. Yeah, Jeremy. <laughs> I actually looked at it. And the the other day. Jeremy did not have enough films to do an entire top ten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that still cracks me up, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a great little note that you put in there. I laughed. Oh, yeah. So, um. That to answer that email, even though I already answered him in person in, in email, uh, I just figured it would be a good uh, idea to plug that because we haven't talked about it in quite a while. But those are out there for anybody who's listening. Uh, in the final little part of this email, he says one last English 101 nitpick, just to make sh- make the show sound more professional. When you talk about more than one thing, it's R. 
So instead of saying there is a lot of great scenes, it should be there are a lot of great scenes. It's a small thing, but when you hear it a hundred times at a four-hour show, well, you get the picture. Just want to get you guys to sound. Just want you guys to sound the best you can. Uh, how you say something is just as important as what you're saying. Um, so I did actually email Jim back, and look, I am dreadful at grammar and talking correctly. Uh, I've improved on it dramatically since I've started this, but at the end of the day, I still have. Um, things ingrained in my brain from uh you know i'm a product of my environment at the end of the day so if people talk like this from where i'm from that's where it comes from you know i do try to tone it down and notice it but it you know it happens so i, I told him all that but, but then this was funny he said this is a reply he said uh first he said i actually looked around the site after i sent the email and found the section on the site sorry i didn't know should have checked there before so yeah um but then he said uh the english thing was just a heads up not enough uh to ever make me stop listening lol it's just more to bug moods because he said a bunch of times that on the pod that he was an english major major and he does it way more than you (laughs) yeah but but that but that comes down to the whole thing where people talk way different than they write Right when I'm writing, I would never write something like that. It's completely yeah, different, yeah. And, it, and it is a true story. It is a true story. People talk completely different than the way they write, English major or not. It is a true fact. It definitely is because I talk in slang all the time too. I would never write like that. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it, it's two different worlds. It's two different it's, worlds. It's so. slang habits. You know, the, we know yeah. that it's not proper English. Like, uh, the, the, like some things. Yeah, I make mis- legitimate mistakes with, but you know, it at the end of the day, like. Like, we all speak in slang native to where we're from or, or yeah. family, shit like that. We, as long as you know what it actually is, I don't think it's a huge deal. I get it. If, you, if you're, like, really into grammar and English and stuff, it might irritate you. Like, if you're Jeremy, you're going to be annoyed because he's a grammar Nazi. Um, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think got, that – I don't I think he was, like, this. serious, serious about it yeah. anyway. He I honestly don't put a lot of – man. I, I, the, the way I talk – I mean, it's it, like I said, it's completely different, man. If I'm sitting down writing a paper or something, yeah, there's you have to focus on grammar. So when I'm talking, I don't really care, to be honest, man. I, I don't really give a shit. I mean, I, got, I don't have I to sound snarky. I don't like to correct people when they're wrong unless it's like something ridiculously funny. Um, but like that, it, yeah, it, it is. Well, what I, it is, I correct man. Derek all the time because it's funny. Well, I got one, yeah. one word to say about all this dynamics. <laughs> dynamics. <laughs> uh, so yeah um, but that, that was yeah. the only email we yeah. got for this uh show guys so um thanks for the email jim uh everybody check out our top 10 list in visual breakdown form yeah yeah it's really easy to navigate on the website right so kind of a bitch on mobile though well everything is it, how does it look on, I, I don't ever go on mobile i find it, that there's a it's, lot of it's websites. all our faces first and then it's all the posters uh, yeah, it does still have our initials on it or whatever, so that's that yeah, does help yeah. a little bit. But yeah, it's yeah. a little hard to to break that down on mobile. But I I usually just go to like the the other like option to go to web anyway. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, cool. All right, so um, I guess we have a bit of a knowledge segment this week. We just kind of wanted to uh, to talk about just the state of like um, you know physical media. And more specifically, uh, the Asian V is closing down in Canada, which is kind of a big deal. Um, I mean, Canada already has, uh, well, really doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of staple places to grab physical media anymore. And with the closure of HMV, which is kind of like the last standing man, you know, kind of thing. I mean, mm-hmm. all of our Virgin Records and uh, Sight and Sound, like, all those type of places are all gone. They're all history. Uh, we kind of relied on HMV what, as, you know, that one place, you know, to go and find physical media and stuff. And uh, they just announced that they are closing all, I think there's 120, 223 stores in Canada uh, as a whole. I mean, they've been trying to sell HMV for the last couple of years, but no one's uh, obviously taking um, based on the price. Apparently, it's pretty expensive, too. But um, this is sad. It, it's bad for, you know, for collectors. It's bad for just in general. It really sucks, man, because, you know, a place where me and Dylan live, we live in a in a town where everything is pretty much gone. Like there's 
you know, places to buy physical media is very scarce. I mean, it's pretty bad when you when you can only mention things like Walmart and, you know, various, uh, you know, say like a London Drugs or, you know, pawn shops and secondhand stores. That's it. That's targets. Uh, we had a target. It closed down because it sucked. <laughs> Everything was so overpriced. And, and that's, you know, actually going back to your story earlier about FYE selling all their shit off at like full price. That's exactly what Target did. You know, like right down to the last day, everything was kind of marked up and it's like 50% off or 80% off. But it was like the normal price. It's ridiculous. But yeah, our targets, you know, just based on the dollar and things like that, it, it, they had to sell everything such a high price. And Walmarts were still underpricing so they just knocked them right out so uh, that's gone um yeah it's pretty much walmart uh which is so sad because i hate going into walmarts i really do it's just a pain in the ass uh really don't even have that much but um this is a sad one man you know i got a lot of a lot of emails and a lot of people commenting and stuff about this happening in canada and it's like wow Really, all we have now is just Amazon. We can't rely on Amazon, as we know. <laughs> I mean, I know so many people have dropped their their Prime accounts just because Amazon never has anything. You pre-order some, it doesn't ship, kind of thing. It's getting harder and harder to you know to basically buy and find physical media now. Um, you know, with this whole HMV thing happening, this week has been kind of interesting too because I've talked to a few people from various companies, uh, like Chris from Midnight Releasing. I was talking to him the other day. And I said, hey, man, you know, you got anything you want to want to send me for review, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, you know what, man, we actually are not sending out DVDs anymore because we just can't afford to do it. DVDs are going out and everything's online. And it kind of got me thinking. I, I kept hearing from, you know, other places that they're probably going to be switching over to just all online screeners and things. Obviously a cost uh, a thing. Um, it's it's kind of scary when companies like Arrow Video are starting to put, you know, things just digital only, you know, online and things. That's a little yeah, bit scary. Had, uh, we... The Donnie Darko release had exclusive digital iTunes bonus features. Yeah. yeah. And that's scary because if they're starting to do it, and as far as we know, Arrow does pretty well for Isn't themselves. Isn't that kind of like self-cannibalizing? I know. And that that's kind of what I was getting at too. I'm like, so if they're doing so well, why are they going this route? I don't know. I don't know what their whole mind frame is behind this move that they're doing, but it is scary because I think that someone like Arrow, if they're turning to doing this, it's kind of setting a precedence for a lot of companies to go, hey, you know, we can save a shitload of money by not printing up these things. We can just do everything online. And I mean, from a business vantage point, it actually does make a lot of sense for the collectors. It sucks dick. It sucks mm-hmm. dick. I mean, we're not getting I mean, like I said, in five years, I can see companies like Sony and stuff just stop producing Blu-rays and stuff because what's the point? They, they don't even sell as much as they used to. And, and obviously, sales have been declining for years. I mean, it's been you – know, that's not a hidden fact. Uh, so that this, you know, this bar is being set by these companies now, I think a lot of – I think a lot of these companies are going to start following, following foot. So – I don't know. It's really, really scary to me, man. Uh, you know, Arse. for us physical collectors, I think it's just – it sucks, man. Even Artsploitation, yeah, they're new film, man. And that's another company. They're – it's exclusively, uh, you know – VOD. A, yeah, VOD. And I don't like that. I don't like that, man, because I – you know, I always said to myself, you know, within my within my YouTube channel that if I was going to do reviews of films, I wanted to have a physical copy because I wanted to show people that it's available, you know, that I want to show them the artwork. And, you know, you know I want to sh- – them to have something to look at i don't really care when people just review digital screeners and they're just talking in front of a camera like i actually like to look at that and stuff that's just my personal yeah, preference but, uh, but it kind of shows people that you can get with... this yeah so I, i'm not really a big fan of it so yeah it's usually when my doing it on the on, yeah, the, like on the podcast film. is it is what it is i mean this is they can't see us anyways i mean if we're reviewing digital com or copies and shit like that it's not a big deal to me at all but uh on the flip side, it is. And this is scary, man. I think this is the route that a lot of pl- uh, play- places are going. I think by the end of the year, I think it'll be kind of written in stone. And we'll find out more if these certain companies follow suit, man. I don't know. It's well, it's really it's really depressing, man. I was in HMV yesterday, and I was talking to the manager. and Because I'm in there all the time. We're bullshit. Mm-hmm. He's like, dude, he goes, I don't even know what to do. Like, I, He's like, I don't really like to you know, shop online a whole lot. Or, I mean, import stuff from the States because our dollar is so shitty. So we're very limited now if you live in Canada because a lot of people aren't importing because of the dollar. And the and just, you know, the, the shipping prices alone are outrageous. They're outrageous now. It's like you can't get anything shipped up here for less than like $10, you know. Um, so 
it's terrible for the collectors. He's like, man, I don't even know what I'm going to do. It's like, I'm losing my discount. I'm like, yeah, man, (laughs) that sucks. It's like, where do I go? Where do I go? And he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is crazy. Cause you could bring in a lot of stuff, right? Like, I mean, H and V just cause you know, they didn't, you know, physically have it on their stuff. You could order a shitload. They had a lot of distributors, right? So that was kind of the nice thing about that, but it's always nice to, it's like going home in a sense. I always feel comfortable in at home when i'm in hmv or, or in a physical store and kind of sorting through the the media i love that feeling amazon mm-hmm. it's just clicking away it's not really the most exciting thing in the world it's, you're it's at your like house a, it's like a music digger you know i mean after all the music stores and everything closed down when i lived in vancouver all the vinyl stores, everything all gone all gone it got to the point where I, I started to have to buy a lot of my stuff online and it just kind of took the fun out of it it really did take the fun out of it i mean you know, for music and stuff, but this is just taking it one step further for myself. It's really depressing, to be honest. What are you guys' thoughts? It's good, Derek. It's it's sad, really, because I was looking because I collect art exploitation, and it's sad to see like that they're going like the VOD route and stuff. And it's just like I don't mind like like Moods was saying about like doing online screeners. I do a few of them for like. Uh, a lot of indie companies out there because the films haven't been released yet, which is understandable because they didn't like mass produce like the actual DVD copies, which is understandable. But to see like this being like the actual like full length release of this film is just going to be on like a streaming service, and a lot of like other stores are closed, and then a lot of like the DVD sides of like certain stores that I go to are getting smaller and smaller and they're pushing other like products and stuff in online and we saw like the decline of like certain stores over the years like fye like i was talking about earlier tower uh i know this isn't really movie related but uh borders bookstore is a perfect example they didn't fund to the like the digital age like barnes and nobles didn't they just went all out of business also there were a big bookstore at the time and then they just closed down because they didn't adapt to like the changes that were happening with like the digital form of online reading and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just insane. Like all these stores are closing down and physical media sides of it is getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. It's like, it's becoming extinct literally like dinosaurs, man. Scary. Yeah. So, um, you know, me, uh, I, I guess there's two sort of topics at hand and it's, you know, brick and mortar stores, obviously, which are, um, definitely on their way out when it comes to, to any, any type of anything that's not mass produced, like, you know, like Walmart chains and stuff like that. Like FYEs yeah. are done. Like there, I have a couple, one thing that I do think will continue to have a market is the like retro stores. Like I have a, um, store around here called Cash and Culture, and they actually just opened up a fifth store. And it started; it used to be. I, I remember the store when it was only like one or two, and they've opened up a fifth store now. And, and it's, it's essentially retro games, which are, are hot right now. Mm-hmm. Um, like you can go there buy Sega games, Nintendo games, N sixty four games, old comics, uh, old action figures. Um, but they also have a DVD and Blu ray section. Um, that are traded in, like people bring them in and, you know, they're second. Yeah. yeah. Um, now the, the biggest problem with those stores is they're all marked at Amazon price. You look at it and it's, you know, $7 there. It's $7 on Amazon. Fortunately, <laughs> the cool thing is though, it, they usually have a deal where if you buy three, you get $2 off each one. So then you're paying $2 under Amazon. Um, you know, not a huge savings, but I, I've, I found some cool stuff there before. I actually, that's where I found all those masters of horror <laughs> because FYE <laughs> had failed me. Um, and I paid, you know, a little under Amazon price for them, but whatever. Uh, you know, it, so, so those places I think will continue to thrive. And I think they, they will continue to always have some level of physical media too, right? You're always going to have some level of, collecting ability because there will always be collectors even if people aren't buying the stuff um in masses it's not really a lucrative business opportunity anymore like if you guys remember back in like 2003 like dvds were 
selling like fucking gold, dude. Like they were just the companies would make a film and, and it would just do gangbusters on the, on video. Um, now that's not really the case. And it's more about Redbox rentals and, and Netflix streaming and Amazon Prime and getting the, and Shutter getting the exclusive and stuff like that, streaming wise. And it, it is, it is very interesting, the landscape right now, because it is going through the, this is the change. This is the most change we've ever seen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you had huge hit films like Hush last year, don't have a video release yet. It will have one, not yet though. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and you have now uh, these different streaming outlets like Shutter, which is all horror based. That got uh, the Ring versus Grudge movie. Like that's an exclusive to Shutter. <clears throat> does not have a video release yet. Uh, does not have <clears throat> a way to see it besides Shutter. Um, so yeah. it's definitely the landscape's changing. There will always be. Um, I mean, look, vinyl is still being sold, right? Like there's always that mm-hmm. collector mentality. Um, that will as long as there's a people there who are our fans which there will always be horror fans there will be people putting out editions now they might end up being 40 dollar editions like um you know i I could see them being more collectible at a certain point where you don't see as much stuff on blu-ray and dvd but they'll be more collectible like like kind of how grindhouse did with their pieces release and and the glow and falchi beyond set stuff like that i could see them being more of like a um, like a hard boxes and, and shit like that. They, they come with like extras and that being, um, more the, the main release that we see eventually. I think that's so like, you know, half decade down the road before we really see that take fullest effect. Um, because you know, the very fact that this Vestron label just came about proves that there's still some life in the DVD market, right? Like they wouldn't just, mm-hmm. they wouldn't just start a whole fucking new label if they didn't think they couldn't make money there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, doing the transfers and the features and stuff like that. So so there's still a market. Um, it is getting smaller. And I am noticing more and more. Hell, myself, I am streaming more now than I ever did. I had a Netflix account for three years. And I watched like four movies a year on it. Um, you know, <laughs> and then I canceled it. And then I got it back. And now I watch I watch <clears throat> Netflix weekly. Um well, yeah. one for that, the podcast, you know, the Netflix and chill, which I didn't get a chance to shout out, shout out to Netflix and chill. Uh, it's a <laughs> podcast. Shameless yeah. promotion. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I do think physical media will be around for a while. It's definitely changing. The landscape of things are changing. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't, if there's, if the screener <clears throat> game completely shrinks for physical, um, it's already yeah. starting to, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I I'm getting less and less from companies that I got physical releases for, like um, all the RLJ entertainment, the um, image uh-huh. entertainment, all that stuff, all digital, all of that's digital. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was getting, I was getting stuff. From that I have, I have an inbox of digital screeners right now. It's just ridiculous, man. Yeah. I, I must have twenty five in there. I'm just like, I, what am I going to do with all these? This is I mean, crazy. I don't feel as but, much pressure to watch those, you know, because it's no. it's not like they're costing anything for them to give me one. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I'll watch, if I'm interested, I'll watch one. Especially once the two thousand or, or the end of the year show comes about, like anything that comes in, I'm watching. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that as physical media collectors it's a sad thing to think that it'll go away. It'll never go away completely. I'll always collect, no. but no, I, I truly I have believe that it's not going to go away. I've I truly believe that it's, tremendously. Yep, of course, of course. Um, mm. I truly believe it's not going to fully go away either. It's just the point I was trying to make is that it's sad that we like, you know, can't go out in the real world and, and kind of dig through physical media anymore. It's, it's pretty much extinct. Oh, in that well, we've sense. seen it with the video stores too, right? I yeah. Mean, that happened. But that's, that's, that's was even the start worse. That was even more painful. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that was the start of it, and now it's, like, the bigger change. But, like, you know when HMVs are going down that there's a major, major decline? Like, there's no market for it, you know, yeah. like, out in the mainstream and stuff. Our little niche companies and stuff, yeah, they're. I bet you they're going to be around because they don't have a lot of overhead. Mm-hmm. These huge corporations have so much overhead and stuff. I mean, they're, they're massive corporations. I mean, you look, know, like Go massive Hastings, and stuff. Dude. I think we'll be Go fine. Hastings just shut down last year. Yeah. That was a huge thing. Saying. 
Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I'm saying. These chains are the the overhead. They just they can't they can't do it. Smaller companies like Mask or Video and things like that. I think they do fine. You know, th- there's not a lot of overhead there. They pump out. They make their money. You know, yeah, they, they little release companies. certain amount of films each exactly. year. Too. It's it's not a big it's not a big production, right? So, I think we'll see those for you know years to come and stuff. But it's just sad that you know. I won't be able to, you know, go down to my local HMV and just kind of dig through shit. You know, I use it to kill time a lot of time, a lot of times too, right? Yeah. You know, I'll be yeah. picking up Harper and pills, got away from my prescription or some shit, and I'll go to HMV and I always fucking buy some because <laughs> I'm horrible like that, right? Yeah, I mean, like but old I, school I, I just best like the atmosphere. I love the atmosphere. I like going into these places. I like digging through stuff. I just like I like talking to random people and shit. I'm like I'm weird like that. Like I, t- I totally somebody be looking at something like, yo man, it's pretty good. And then I'll just spark up. Car. My wife hates that because I'll just talk to random people. Like I don't give a shit, man. I, I, uh, remember, I remember when Best Buy you... actually had like actual horror movies and stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh my my Best Buy is. I don't even consider it a spot to even find media because it's so bad. It, it really is so bad. They get like six things in, and it's pathetic. I never go in there. It's it's absolutely horrible. So yeah, the, the, the target setups like changing too. You know, I notice. Yeah, the, the, they don't really get anything new to, on sale or anything. It's just the same movies over and over again. Yeah, but like what you're saying, JP, about like the uh, the specialty shops and stuff. Like my buddy's got a pretty thriving business. <laughs> Deals in mostly like stereo equipment and you know video games and DVDs and Blu-rays and vinyl and shit like that. But he does pretty good. He does pretty good. So, but you know, with these bigger corporations like HMV going out and stuff, I mean, is there going to be a lot of turnover in there now? Because I think a lot of people buy their stuff there. You know, maybe not necessarily so much online. They. You know, they go on the real world and they actually purchase things and then, you know, when they get bored of it, they, you know, they sell it to him kind of thing. So I, I'm hoping it doesn't affect his business as much. I mean, it probably won't because a lot of it is, you know, older stuff and things like that. But I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see. It just, it's very depressing, man. It's super, like, depressing. Like, like Keel, he actually, he lives in Toronto and he, well, just outside of Toronto, he went into Toronto just to go to HMV after, you know, he heard that it was shutting down. He said he went and bought a few things and, he said he was depressed the whole time. And <laughs> I was like, you know, it's like you're losing a friend. It's kind of weird like that. But, you know, those are my thoughts. Those are my thoughts. You guys got anything else? Nah. Think we're nah, that's all I talked to. What I talk about is what they got. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's sad. It's sad. Well, after that depressing shit. I know. Let's it, it get really... into the morbid fact. Yeah, yeah, the morbid fact. Sounded uh, like Randy of... Savage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Slim Jim. <laughs> yeah, it's hate time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually just had, I, you know, I was like, well, I might as well do this when I have a room orcs sitting on my poker table here. So I was like, wait, might wait, as well wait, do this hold one. on. Didn't we cancel what? this segment? No, I said, I said, I'll bring it back when I bring it back. When we get the respect. Okay. Did we get the respect we... yet? Did we get the respect? I think we might have actually. I got contact. Believe it or not, strangest thing. So I actually, for a, for a minor moment, I honestly felt a little bad about all the shit talking, more jokingly about Rue Morg, you know, in the last month or two. Uh, but I got contacted by Rue Morg, and they asked me if I wanted to, um, you know, kind of do magazine reviews and, you know, kind of help promote Rue Morg and stuff. And I said, you know, it's kind of funny because – I've actually been doing that on the podcast for the last couple of years. You know, this is my podcast, blah, 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 and stuff. So we'll see how this goes. Apparently, they're going to send me some things, and maybe I'll do it on the podcast. I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe they should sponsor the podcast. They should. So that way, them a bunch of free (laughs) You know? (laughs) People have checked out the magazine, you know, just because I've talked about it so much on the show. I've heard people say that to me, and it ain't even my morbid fact. They'll be like, yeah, I never really heard of Rue Morgue, but I, I knew, like, Horror Hound and... And, uh, you know, Frank Gloria, Frank Gloria obviously. Yeah, I haven't yeah. really heard of uh, Rue Morgue, but I checked out a couple copies. I found a couple used copies, this, that, and the other. And I'm like, see, I, I know we've sold them copies. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> and they can't even list yeah. us in our top up-and-coming I, podcast well, that was, or whatever. And that's where the whole joke was stemming from. It was like, you know, they obviously are not checking out all the good horror podcasts. You know, I think their list was uh, – it was incomplete. I'm not going to lie. It was incomplete because, you know, yeah. I feel like we should have been on there. It, you know, what? It, it was more joking around and stuff. Rumor is a great magazine. They're a good company. They do yeah. good things. So, yeah. uh, but that. yeah, the Rumor, uh morbid fact 
uh, from the coroner's report here is coming from the brand new issue, actually, from January, February 2017, issue 174. It's got the girl with all the gifts on the cover, uh, which, Mm -hmm. you know, is apparently going to be a very, very big film. I can't wait to see it. It actually looks really up my alley. I think this is going to be a good year, man. Yeah, I, I, mm-hmm. yeah. It's cool that a film like that is already being talked about this early in the year, and and uh, it's right up my alley. So yeah, looking forward mm-hmm. to it. Uh, yeah. So I guess I'll just do this one. I guess this is kind of I didn't really know this one, but uh, yeah, the town of Santa Mira in Halloween Three: Season of the Witch gets his name from the town in the 1956, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Hmm. I think I knew that. Yeah, I did not. But then again, I probably did, and, you know, I forget things, so, but, a connection, Halloween 3 and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, I don't know, I don't know, I never put two and two together, because I'm just dumb, you know, we never figure it out, man, never figure figure out the small things in life, you know, (laughs) I'm too busy breaking fucking JP's Mexi tots (laughs) online and shit, (laughs) yeah, yeah. All right. Nice. All righty. So that is going to conclude Mood Swings. And now moving along and getting into the WWW portion of the show, what we watched. Uh, yeah. I, for some weird reason, I feel like we haven't done one of these in a while. Has it been a while? Did we not do one on. I don't know why. It just seems like we've been a while. We didn't, since we we didn't do one on the Christmas show. I know that. And then it was just a year end show after that there's, one. So, yeah, it's been a couple shows since we've actually done this. But. Uh, but yeah, so basically we just go round tree here, review a couple films. We'll get into segments after that. And uh, any volunteers going uh, first? Yeah, Let's I'll, go, I'll first. go first. I'll go first. All right. All right. All right. So um, I, this one will be short because I, I did watch it a few weeks ago. But uh, it's one of the first watches of 2017 for me. Technically, this film has a 2016 uh, IMDb release date. But I'm almost certain that it was not out in 2016 for the average Joe. Uh, so this is my, this is one of my first 2017 watches and it is drifter. Uh, this is, um, I thought it was the drifter, but it's just drifter and it follows a pair of brothers who, uh, it opens up like post-apocalyptic and I'm like, Oh, okay. So this is going to be a post-apocalyptic film. Um, and then, uh, it follows them, they run into some, you know, hood like thieves and, and they have to handle them, you know, kill them. Everything's dirty and dusty. And, uh, you know, you can tell that, you know, they're dehydrated and malnourished and stuff like that. Uh, and then they, they find a sort of desolate town and they sort of make their way into that. But it just so happens that the town is home to a family of psychotic cannibalistic lunatics, um, so my thoughts on this one are that it starts off pretty good. Like I, I felt like the post-apocalyptic feel was definitely there. There's a lot of wide, long shots of, you know, like desert and, and things like that, uh, which always add to the, you know, feeling of post-apocalyptic when you have these like wide shots, right? Because it just shows how barren and, and wasteland everything is. Um, mm-hmm. And then they get into the town and it mainly like focuses in this small town, like in, in houses and and stuff. So it kind of loses that um, pure post-apocalyptic feel because it's, it's small scale. I think that early on they, they wanted to establish the, the, the feel, which is smart. You know, if you're going to have a film that's, that's set, you know, primarily in this small town, it's best to, to establish that we are in a post-apocalyptic apocalyptic universe by um showing the terrain and and things like that um i thought it was gonna go like mad max territory almost because they're in a car and you know it's called drifter and it you know the even the poster has like the uh, rpm um gauge uh with the characters in it and like a gun and stuff in a car and i'm like oh this is gonna be straight mad max but it's not really at all um and i I guess i was almost hoping it would have been uh, the stuff with the family of uh, psychotic cannibals are, is it's very much like, you know, Texas Chainsaw style uh, family, you know, like just crazy ass people that, that are clearly like cannibals. There's even like a dinner table scene, you know what I mean? So, uh, so uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's very it's very culty. It, it's got a very cult type feel to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and, and you know the stuff that was happening it's, it's like kind of plays out normal like you, there's not not really any huge surprises or anything um but it, it was definitely fun it had a, it had its moments you think so you think so i think i think there's one kind of major plot development that happened oh, you've seen with, this <laughs> yeah with the so far i was agreeing with everything i mean my quick thought quick thoughts on it i think the first half of the film is fantastic i love the opening of this film i like how rough and rugged i love the train i love the the cinematography in the film is fantastic and as soon as they get to the town it loses all its steam it comes to a screeching halt i didn't find anything to do with this cannibalistic family interesting um i don't like what they did with the main character uh, I didn't like the direction that the, the film went at all. I thought it was actually really bad. The second half of the film killed this film's momentum for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the that it definitely, um, you know, lost its its strong points. You know, because I, I was was you kind of yeah. looking at Mad like hoping for Mad Max as well. Oh, I I was hoping it was going to stay out in that terrain in that type of you know setting the whole time, and yeah you know, more Mad Max type thing with maybe a little bit more gore and shit, but it so you, just, you uh, did, did you find that the, the, what was happening in the town was just kind of generic and it, it was very generic and it was very predictable and well, maybe except for with the main character and stuff, but yeah. the things that were happening weren't that interesting. It was very bland and kind of by the books. It was very tropey. It was like, there was nothing original about it. And and it's kind of funny because the film almost feels like it's two different films, mm -hmm. right? You know, it has this major, awesome, like kind of high octane feel to it. And then it just gets in this town. And like you said, it loses all its feel and appeal too, because it doesn't have that openness. It, it's all now kind of condensed, but very tropey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, I, I kind of enjoyed it still. You know, just, you know, I, I don't know. I, I kind of like the cannibalistic, like, family aspect. But it, it just was very basic. Um, I think that I personally came in at about a 6.5 on this one. Uh, just since you've seen it, what, what would you give it? I think I I think I ended up coming in at 5 because I loved the first half so much. Or the first, like, 45 minutes or whatever. And then, you know, I mean, you know, the – the second half of the film wasn't horrible. I just didn't find it overly that engaging. I just, it lost a lot of my interest. Let's put it that way. It so, definitely did. So I mean, did the dinner table stuff, I was thinking, well? I was, no, I actually saw it online. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Did so. you see it for 2016 or did you see it? I watched it for 2016. Oh, so I, I guess watched, this I, isn't a 2017 watch then. Yeah. Yeah. I watched this, oh, fucking December sometime. Yeah. Huh. Because I, I I saw the cover and I was like, well, I mean, this thing, you know, this actually does look promising. And I first thing I was thinking was kind of a Mad Max type, but anything to do with post apocalyptic type settings, I love. Yeah. And too. it started out great. I was really, really excited in this film too. I was like, oh, this is awesome, man. It was really cool. Like the uh, the main lead, you know, um, he was awesome. He was like, he was like totally tough and wicked and shit like that. And you know, I, I liked it. And then it just kind of went downhill from there for me, but. <laughs> But it was it didn't turn out to be like a horrible, horrible film. I just wish they had to take it a little bit of a different direction because you kind of knew things that were happening because, they, you know, this whole city, this whole cannibalistic family, this cult type thing was was known. You know, it was out there. Right. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Seemed a little a little predictable to me. But yeah, it was OK. It was all right. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> all right. Uh, who's next? Uh, I guess I'll go next. Uh... Okay, so since we were talking about Screen Factory and their double features, it's actually hilarious that one of these films is actually on one of those said double features. And it's one that I revisited earlier this week. It's a film I have seen before, and I always wanted to actually review it. And this film comes from 1962, and it's from Dan Denmark, and it's known as Reptilicus. Yes. Yes. Stuff. Yeah. So the main like beginning of this film, we're introduced to like this like I think what we sort of call it is like a mining expedition where they're doing like mining for oil, and unbeknownst when they bring the drill up, there's actually like blood on it, and what they discover is this like frozen piece of like this tail inside the mining area, and they take it back to study it and the scientists dwell that this tail actually has the power to regenerate. So they keep it on ice for a while. 
Then, unbeknownst, uh, they had like this bumbling like guy who works at this lab, and he accidentally turns off the freezer and the tail defrosts, and it regenerates into its full form and escapes, and it kills one of the scientists, and the military gets involved with this expedition to try to find this creature before and see what happens to it. And we're introduced to Reptilicus, and it's up to them, and he's havoc in Denmark throughout it. So, and it's trying to figure out how to stop him. Now, if you haven't seen Reptilicus before, it's pretty much like Denmark's, like, trying to rip off, like, a Godzilla-type film with, like, a giant monster-type deal. But the giant monster, if you see it in this film, is... A puppet. It's very cheesy looking if you look at it on the screen and you know what you're going to get when you look at it. It's a fucking like the giant claw. It's just like this cheesy looking puppet with like slimy features to it. And it's kind of entertaining at the same time because the movie, the monster itself is so fucking ridiculous looking when you're watching it. And with this cheesy, like, uh, dubbed acting, because the, the, I believe this film was dubbed, and there's a lot of, like, weird, like, scenes of, like, one scene where the general character is, like, going on a date with, like, this girl, and they, like, trying to exploit, like, Denmark and Copenhagen in a way, and there's, like, this weird, like, musical number in the middle of the film, so you're like, what the fuck is going on? Why are they doing and this? And I thought Kyle was the king of likes. <laughs> Locked. Just just pipes in with the likes. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're that totally about caught me forty-five off guard. and a half likes in that. That totally <laughs> caught me off guard. Hundred percent caught me off guard too when you said that. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> but yeah, it's a, a very cheesy film with uh, the monster itself, and of course when. Uh, the studio got it to distribute through America. Uh, they actually added this thing with Reptilica shooting green slime, which isn't in the original film when yeah, I was reading cool. about it. So you see like this weird like offshoot where Reptilica just shoots slime into like the film and the sleet slime goes down the camera and shit. It's very retarded, but it's a <laughs> it's a very f- fun film in my opinion. It's one that is aged like if you watch this as a kid you'll probably enjoy it more as if you watch it as an adult for the first time you'll be like what the fuck this is a film that probably zach will fucking hate because of the cheesiness but it's a fun film for if you're a fan of creature features like myself i give it like a six out of ten it's not like a perfect film but it's a fun film to watch yeah it's pretty it's pretty cheesy it's fun yeah. though it's fun <laughs> Yeah, it's actually funny, too. Uh, in the Danish version, there's actually uh, a scene where Rept- Reptilicus flies. He actually flies in the Danish version of this film, which was kind of a shame because it would have been fucking hilarious to see on, like, uh, if Screen Factory, but they couldn't get that version. I don't know if there's, like, a master of it or not. Yeah, that would have been cool if they put both versions on there. That would have been a great feature. Yeah, and there's, and there's even, like, a... And, and then you remember that bumbling idiot that I was telling you about that like eats the sandwich in the lab? There's actually a musical number with him in it too, which is fucking hilarious. Like a full blown like half an hour musical number. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so Reptilicus. That sounds retarded. <laughs> uh, I think we've featured artwork so many times on this show tonight. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, uh, so. All right, so first, first up for myself here uh, is a film that I mean when I, when I first heard this the title of this movie I I literally burst it out laughing I was like that is the craziest and awesomest title of all time and it's called Don't Fuck in the Woods I mean it's a <laughs> don't title and it's got fuck in the title I mean these guys were not going for any type of mainstream exposure whatsoever <laughs> you know a title like that and. Um, the interesting thing about this film is that, you know, it's obviously kind of sold to you as like a slasher film. I mean, don't fuck in the woods. I mean, the cover, everything about it, uh, it's sold to you as like a slasher film, but it's actually a creature feature film, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, but basically, it's just about a group of people. I think there's what, six or seven people that go out. It's actually kind of an interesting cast that they have in this one. 
um, I think there's like four girls and two guys. Am I correct, Derek? There's four girls and two guys in this one. As, I think as so. Characters, which is very odd to see more females on screen than males in a film like this. I, I thought that was very cool. But the reason for that is because there's a lesbian couple. Actually, a lot of the characters in this film are very cliched, like a lesbian couple. There's this like this pervert guy, and then there's this jock. <laughs> you, know, you got like you got the slut. You, got, you know, the character is very cliched, but kind of funny. Uh, it's uh-huh. basically just about a bunch of friends that head out to the woods to celebrate them graduating uh, school and stuff like that. College, I, I believe. And, um, of course, you know, something shows up and starts picking them off one by one. Uh, basically, you're, you're very typical slasher type setup with a creature. Um, it's a pretty fun film, actually. I, I was I was really enjoying, you know, the dick and fart jokes and, you know, the kind of the crude humor. I was expecting it to be a lot more of it, though. It wasn't as over the top as I was expecting it to be. You know, with some of these low budget films, you know, sometimes the acting is just an abomination and and the dialogue and everything and stuff. This one actually had pretty amazing production values to it though. There were some mm-hmm. really amazing crane shots and overhead shots throughout the woods. Like they spent money on this shit and it looked pretty damn good. Like the actual look of the film looked really fucking good for what they did and stuff. So I was impressed by the presentation. The acting was it it's pretty much what I expected, you know. It was actually a little better than I than I was expecting. It wasn't too too bad. Dialogue and stuff all over the place, but my main gripe with this film is that it's, you know, it's pretty short. It says on IMDb that it's 73 minutes long. It actually isn't 73 minutes long. It's about 63 minutes before the credits start rolling. Uh-huh. Um, and, then, and then they have, like, these credits and they have, like, post-credit bloopers and things like that. So this film is actually quite short. It's only about an hour long. Um, my biggest problem with it is that it takes a, a, almost too much time for an hour length film to get going to actually see the creature. You don't really get to see the creature a lot. So basically mm-hmm. what we have in the first 40 minutes of the film is a lot of lesbian sex. We have a lot of perverted talk. We have a lot of uh, just r and type stuff, you know, guys drinking and doing retarded things and stuff. Tits and, and muff, yeah. Th- yeah, and there's this, like, of course, it's full of nudity. We have all those trope things that we're going to see in these slasher-type films that are going on. It's pretty entertaining, but then when the creature happens and the film ends, you're just like, oh, that's it? It was kind of disappointing in that aspect. Overall, I did enjoy the film. It's not mind-blowing or anything. Um, it could have actually used some more time. You know, if you're going to build up 40 minutes, you might you might as well have it like an 80 minute film, you know, have the battle with the creature a little more and stuff. Um, another thing that kind of bugged me about the film a little bit was there was scene, there were certain scenes in this film that, you know, I feel were kind of off putting. They, they felt like they were just kind of thrown in there. I don't know if it was during the edit. They're just like, hey, we need a scene here. Kind of fill in time. Uh, I don't know if you felt the same way, Derek, but I found there was a couple of scenes that just weren't needed. They felt awkward. There were scenes that felt awkward in this film. It was very strange to me mm-hmm. uh, while I was watching it. But, you know, as a whole, it was still pretty entertaining for what it was. I mean, you're really not going to waste a lot of time watching this, like I said, an hour. The music was pretty <laughs> – was all right for the film and stuff. It mm-hmm. wasn't too, too bad. Uh, the creature, um, I felt like I wanted to see a little bit more. I don't know. Yeah, if it was in the, the dark. It was in the dark a lot. It was definitely very, very dark and stuff. I, I did like the see... aspect of what the creature was doing, though, and... Well, it goes into the title of the film, too. I did like yeah. that aspect. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I, I, I don't want to fully disclose that, but like, yeah, yeah. The, the reason why the killer is, or the creature's killing is actually pretty funny. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of an interesting storyline, uh, which just plays into, it's, you know, it's such a spoof on, on slasher films, right? It's, you know, yeah. it's playing right off that, you know, what, what happens in those films? If you fuck, you get killed. Well, there's a reason for it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, so, you know, it, it's overall, it's a pretty fun film. I believe this is uh, Sean Burkett's I want to say first film I don't know you probably yeah uh but you know I I think it's a really good first effort and you know he shows some promise and stuff it's not mind-blowing a little too short like I said a little bit gripe stuff I'm gonna give it about a six and a half out of ten it was uh definitely worth the watch it was fun and just another one to add to the don't collection and it's got yeah. a fuck in the title don't fuck <laughs> yeah that's exactly what I gave it too is a sounds six like a don't watch to me <laughs> you would I, I, honestly JP I think you'd like it yeah I think you'd like All right. it. yeah yeah, cool. It has right. a cool concept, at least. No, honestly, um, it's not. It doesn't look like it was a five dollar movie either. Like the presentation was. Movie. I could not believe the overhead crane shots. That blew my mind. I was like, "Wow, this has like established." It was, it was actually. Did you, did you watch film. special like, features on it? I didn't actually. I watched it really. It was, late. It was watched... actually. It was actually odd. And a lot of the people that were negative on the title of the film, like people involved in it. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Well, because I mean, when you have a title like that, you really can't, you can't Sell push it. It's not towards certain. Be in red oh, box. 
yeah, you, that's the thing. You, you know right away that this movie is going to be indie for life. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's going to have no further distribution. So it is what yeah. it is. But. All right. So uh, back to me. Uh, segment time. It is – I haven't done one of these in a little while. Um, I actually could have did two separate versions of this because I have watched two or three even. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a Horror 101 Welcome to Horror 101. This is a segment in which I review a documentary, whether it's on a horror film, a horror director, horror actor, or some sort of real life horror. And uh, this is actually a TV series. It is Making a Murder from 2015. This is a Netflix original series. Mm -hmm. Uh, So when this show came out, it made a huge fucking splash. And I watched the very first episode when it debuted and I was like, I was, I was, I was like, wow, that was really good. I thought that was it. I didn't know it was a series. I thought it was a goddamn one take thing. You know what I mean? So, um, I didn't even realize it was a series and then I found out that it was, I just didn't go back. I just didn't go back until nearly two years later. Um, and I finally, I binge watched this thing, man. I watched, uh, the entire you know, 10 episodes in, I'd probably say uh, uh, two weeks, maybe a week and a half, something like that. Uh, it's, uh, 10 parts. Uh, the first part primarily follows Stephen Avery, who is, uh, a man who was, uh, arrested for the rape, um, of a woman. And, you know, it goes through, uh, his court case. And then, um, after that, it picks up where he actually gets uh, is the word exonerated, right? Exo- mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exonerated, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Who due to new DNA evidence? Uh, so after he spent eighteen years in prison, he gets released, uh, and then he begins to um, get like you know retribution uh, against the what you know, is considered the corruption, uh, local law enforcement who, um, depending on how you view the documentary, uh, might, uh, there might be an argument for they had it in for him. So they ignored certain facts in the case. Um, and when he's, you know, in the process of sort of, you know, suing the, the local law enforcement, uh, he actually, becomes the prime suspect in another high stakes criminal case involving uh, the murder of a um, woman who worked for auto trader as a photographer. Um, And it's basically the entire story of that, man. I mean, I was so blown away by this. Like I I reviewed um, uh, paradise lost jeremy reviewed the trilogy i just reviewed the first one which by the way i did pick up the second one on my trip to that cash and culture the other day uh, so i look forward for a review of that in the near future but um this is very much like that you know it's uh it's a documentary it was filmed over 10 goddamn years yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. you know it's it feels like a documentary without an agenda um it without much of an agenda, like, you know, a a choosing sides type thing. It seems like they present all the evidence as it is, all of the information as it is. Um, they don't mess with anything. They don't, it didn't seem like they ignored things because throughout this entire process, I have never experienced something where I flipped back and forth so many times. I was like, yep, that motherfucker did it. Nope. No, no, that motherfucker didn't do it. He did not do it. Oh yeah, he did it. Like, it was crazy. I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, it's, it, it felt, I, and I kid you not, when I was watching it, I was like, there's no way this is fucking real. Like, th- this has to be like a, a crazy script that somebody wrote because it has so many twists in it. Like, where the fuck is Shyamalan? Is he behind this shit? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I was like, what the hell is going on here? It was just back and forth and reveal after reveal. And I'm just like, like you couldn't write this shit. Like you could, you like this would be the an award winning script. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It was crazy. Uh-huh. I could not believe how, you know, just more information, more information, more speculation, more uh, question marks. You answer those questions, and there's fucking ten more questions behind that door. It was mm-hmm. it was insane. 
And I'm, as I'm watching it, there was so many times where, like, it's going from, like, this year and it has, like, these audio clips from some random interview that, that, that Stephen Avery did with, uh, you know, some random newspaper. And that's spliced in with the footage of him. What, like, I'm just like, this would be a goddamn editing nightmare. This would be the hardest thing to edit in the world. Like, like it is so fucking in depth with this editing, dude. Like, well, it, it took just, like ten ten years to dude, do that. So. It, like, uh-huh. this is how you would torture somebody that would go to hell. Like, uh, here's all these fucking pieces. Here, go ahead and edit it into a movie <laughs> yeah, with make, music. Put this and, puzzle together. <laughs> like, I'm just like Jesus Christ, dude. Like. You had to have a team of editors. <laughs> like, like I would, you would g- go gray in like ten years editing this shit because it is insane. Um, it deserved all the hype that it got. It really did. Like, I was so fascinated and involved in it. Um, if you've never seen it, man, do yourself a favor. This is this is some of the best film I've seen in a while, and I, I was super into it. Uh, I, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Like, there's not even a single complaint that I could have. It's not too long. It's, it, it tells the story. It feels like you got all the information, and at the end of it, you're still left with questions and wonder. And I thought I, I have been thinking about this since I finished it. I really have. I've been thinking about it, uh, trying to. Th- I just been thinking about different things that happened in the case, like like how I feel about it. Um, man, I, I gave this thing a, a straight ten out of ten, dude. Yeah, you know what, man? I would rate it 10 out of 10, too, man. I've never screamed so many fucking times while watching a program in my life at the TV. Well, like, if my TV could talk back to me, be like, shut the fuck up. You are well, freaking me out. I, I was screaming, man. I was like, this is crazy shit. Uh, like, man, in my honest opinion, man, those cops are the dirtiest motherfucking cops alive. They had it out from this, they had it out for him since day one. He was a prime suspect to you know, to pin this on and stuff. Yeah. The questions are there. Did he do it? Did he not? I truly think he didn't. I mean, there, I mean, if he actually did this, I mean, the evidence that they're planting that whole scene where the cops all of a sudden found those keys, like five days later. And it know, was the cops or whatever. who he, who had, I'm like, like, it wasn't the, it, like the, the fact that they were supposed to be not involved and they're the ones that found it. Yeah, and those are the those are the questions that rise, and you're like, "Hey, something, you know, there's something else going on here. These cops are really trying to frame him and stuff." And, so you uh, think that he didn't do it? I don't think he did. I honestly yeah, don't. I'm think. kind of in that camp, or I'm definitely in the camp that, um, you know, the whole must be proven guilty without a shadow of a doubt. There's plenty yeah. of fucking doubt, dude. So, like, yeah. I would 100 well, percent would have not convicted him, even if. You know, it's possible no. that he did, but there's not enough evidence to show that he did. That that's exactly what I said to to the wife. I said, "Man, you know, you can't convict this guy. There's no, there's not enough physical direct evidence to you know to actually convict him on here. I mean, look at look at the culprit. Look at the young boy. You know, the cops fucking basically created this story and they made him admit to it and everything. It's just it's all on tape and shit. Oh, it's it's like, fucking brutal, man. It's so brutal what they did with that kid. Like it's just nasty shit. Like I mean, obviously if he was guilty, you know, do your job properly and get the right information the right way. But mm-hmm. I mean this is this is stuff that you question, yeah, man. This kid when definitely has an job, IQ level that that is not that yeah. of uh, an and they knew that so they being. they they 100% knew that they could manipulate him and they could get him to say and do anything that they wanted to. It was an easy target. It was a bona fide easy target. They used it like dirty cops do and they rolled with it, man. That was a big piece of the case. That was a huge piece yeah. because his testimony was essentially what buried him because yeah. they're like, well, he, he, he was there. He's, he's a witness. But, he but it, it, it was so inconsistent it. like, because he said they slit her throat in the room and it's like there was no well, fucking blood anywhere. Like that should automatically tell you that that story is not true. Exactly. And that, that uh-huh. really that really bugged me when I was watching it because the forensics, they came in, they tested all the shit. And blood does not – you can always pull it from anywhere, right? You can't clean that shit. Not from so, mattresses. Where the <laughs> fuck did where, – where, if she was killed right here like the story says, where's the blood? Where's the evidence? You can't convict somebody on this, man. This is crazy shit. I felt crazy so shit. terrible for that kid, even more so than than uh, Steve, you know, because like. But to be honest, though, man, spending eighteen years of your life in jail and then going right back after, like, he went to jail what a couple years after. <laughs> so I'm like, it's that's a harsh life, man. That's, yeah, yeah it, it was brutal. It was brutal. It was it was brutal. a gut wrenching watch, and 
I'll tell you what, man. I the, I, I think that um, I don't know if he's innocent or guilty, but I do know yeah. that there was definitely so much questions that was involved in that case that I could not feel comfortable being on the jury and putting him away. I just could I couldn't live with that because I, yep. I there's too many yep. questions. And there's they so even interviewed tampering. the one guy who got removed from the jury who um, also felt that heavily. And you know, it's it's a tragic case. They're actually doing a season two to follow up on it. I actually believe that the the young boy is actually released. Um, oh, really? I believe he actually got released this year or 2016 because of, of um, sort of uh, whatever. I, I forget the exact reason. I'm sure they'll cover it in season two. Um, but yeah, yeah evidence. It, yeah, it was, uh, mm-hmm. it was a, such a watch, man, such a watch that, that should have won so many awards. That was an incredible piece of, of film. Yeah, man. I marathon that shit. I started watching. I couldn't stop. I started watching like six, seven at night and literally watched like, I think I watched 11 straight episodes or something. I think, and there's, only, the I think there's only 10. Or is there 10? Or, I so, so I watched like eight or something. I think I watched like two in the morning, but it was fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. I just couldn't, I couldn't stop Mooch watching. making up the episodes now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I watched all this bonus shit that you guys didn't even see. <laughs> it's only available on Netflix Canada. So you gave it a 10 too, huh? Oh, easily. It was yeah, one could... of it was one of my favorite programs I've watched in a long time. Yeah, and dude, it sat with me too. forever. <laughs> I sat there and thought about it. I sat there and thought about it for so long after. It was crazy. Like I just kept putting the pieces, and I was like, "Hey, there's no way that I could ever convict this guy." Crazy. When's but... season two coming out? Um, sixteen this year, I think. So, um, it's crazy they're making a season two, but I, I mean, it, it, there's there's a lot more interesting stuff to talk about. I mean for sure uh but anyway it might not be this year actually they might they might just wait till there's developments you know or whatever but Mm -hmm. um you said you gave this a 10 as well Derek. yeah you you watched the whole thing yeah dude all right so that i mean that's our first actual like tv series inducting into the uh hall of fame that's pretty crazy perfect 30 rating and i I honestly think 100 percent did you know if there was an 11 rating i'd give that (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's well it's, deserved it's it, man. So and, good. you know i do agree with you man the editing my god like there's Mind so lower. much so much man <laughs> so much time put into that it's crazy i hate when man. you watch something like this and like nobody you know has seen it and you're just like want to talk about it and you're like you're like you gotta yeah. see it, you gotta see it <laughs> i think tonight's the uh the review that moods has watched <laughs> seen everything you guys have reviewed yeah. tonight it's crazy <laughs> Oh, oh! By the way, moods. Um, the Drifter or Drifter. It does. It did not have an official release date in 2016. Um, so uh, the, I, I believe wow. it does count for 17. Wow, crazy. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because I I watched it. I think I might even have watched it as early as November. It's interesting. Was that an Orlick reference recommendation? I don't no, I actually asked Brandon if he had watched it, and he said he was going to. He said it looked uh, good. And I said, well, give it a shot. <laughs> I said, you might like it more than I did. But, yeah. yeah, you never know. All right. So it's my segment time. And this is my Asian persuasion course. I'm probably going to butcher the fuck out of this title because I was trying to practice it like during the break when we took a little break. It's uh, What this title is entwined is it's the name of the, a tree that's involved in the film. And that's Ashia from 2003. This is an interesting release history with this film. It's a Tarn Asian Extreme. And Tarn also released this under the title Roots of Evil with a different cover art. So if you already own this film or you own the other version, don't double dip because it's the same film. So I'll leave that out there for people uh, if they do cool. own this film. Yeah, this film's from South Korea, and it's directed by Park Ki Hong, who's a director I'm not really familiar with his work, or don't know if he did anything else. And this film entwines this young couple who has problems uh, conceiving children, so they end up deciding to adopt. And the wife, at first, is very hesitant to uh, actually adopt, because, you know, it's pretty much her fault of not having birth. So she has a, like a resistance because it's more about her husband and her husband's father that want the baby. 
So they end up going to the adoption agency and they meet this young boy whose name is Jing Song, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. And she gets connected to him because he's an artist and she's an artist, so she gets connected. And once they get home, though, uh, they have like this Ashia tree in their backyard and he gets very connected with it. And it's very odd, like the way that his character dwells and then her mother comes over and dwells into hating the child because it's not her like bloodline and stuff. So what ends up happening is the wife ends up actually getting pregnant and Jin Sung gets disconnected with the rest of the family and ends up disappearing. What ends up happening after that is there's a lot of turmoil with uh, the, the husband and wife and they're trying to figure out what happened to Jin Sun, and a lot of weird and supernatural shit starts happening around the house, and uh, physical and mentally to the young couple. That's all I'm going to give away with the plot without going way too into it because it's a kind of a complex story, the way it's presented to us. And I got to say, it has a lot of like odd scenes in it with like uh, this one character, uh, Min Sink, I believe her name is who's this young girl who calls herself a vampire that befriends Jin Sung earlier in the film. She's like, I can't leave him and go to school because I don't have blood. And there's like a weird, like odd scene where uh, there's a scene where it's edited weird, where uh, Min Sink actually becomes Jin Sung, but it's supposed to be like a different scene. Like like she opens the door and then it goes into like uh, another scene with Jin Sung opening the same door. So it's kind of odd editing choices. But I gotta say, it's kind of a slower paced film for like South Korea, even though this one is only an hour uh, and 40 minutes long. So it might be one of the shortest South Korean films that I've yeah, no watched. Doubt. But it's kind of a, like a slower pace because of the subject matter and what's going on with it, with like its characters and the way it's edited in style. But it does have some cool performances, and I did actually really enjoy the ending when it all came full circle. It's uh, a very engaging story about like uh, this couple that was engaged with like uh, wanting to adopt, and then a lot of batshit craziness happens within like after the spirals in life, and a lot of like deaths and supernatural shit starts happening. It's a very complex story with a deep message that about like wanting and loving and being a part of somebody. And I like the way that it was told and it's not a perfect film by any means with like its length and the way it's slow burning dealing this. It's, if slow burn films are for you, but it has a very cool imagery and stuff and a lot of uh, good like scenes with like uh, its imagery with like red vines and the way the tree is uh, intertwined with the story is really cool. I like how they intertwine the actual tree with the film. So I'm going to give it a solid 7.5 out of 10. It was a very interesting watch. I had to say if you're into like South Korean cinema. Q Q. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was one I have not seen. <laughs> so I was on a roll there, but, uh, yeah, I need to check that one out. Yeah, it sounds cool. it sounds weird. It sounds strange. It is strange. So yeah. Director of the X-rated films Hot Summer in the City, Erotic Adventures of Candy, Candy Goes to Hollywood, and coming soon, The Longest Foot, starring John Holmes. Hi, I'm Gail Palmer. I've been hired by Stallion Releasing Company to supervise the editing of this new X-rated film, The Italian Stallion, with Sylvester Stallone in the starring role as Stud. All right, so for my Italian Stallion um, is a film from 1975 directed by Aldo Lado, um, and it's called, well, <laughs> it's got many different titles, uh, Night Train Murders. Yes. Also known as Last Stop on the Night Train. Also known as Don't Ride on Late Night Trains. And I think there might even be more titles for it, too. It's ridiculous how many titles. You know, very, you watch, very typical Italian. You watch the 88 films release? Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw your posts. Yeah. 
um, yeah, you know, I hadn't seen it in a while and, you know, thought I'd pop it in, check out transfer. It looks really, really fantastic. I will say like the transfer is great. Um, Aldo Lotto actually directed one of my favorite Giallo type films from 71, uh, called short nighted glass dolls, which also is put out by, um, 88 films, I believe too. So yep. love that film, man. Really trippy storytelling in that one. Uh, he's, he also directed Hussar die, which is pretty cool. Um, I haven't seen that one in a while. I honestly need to revisit that one. But, but yeah, if you guys uh, are familiar with um, Night Train Murders, you know, it's very notorious for being a video nasty. Uh, I think it was on, was it on the ban list? It was on the section one list, wasn't it? I believe so, yes. It's, it's either on one or two, but I think it was actually one of the banned ones. So uh, basically what this movie is, it's Aldo Lotto's version of Last House on the Left. It's pretty much the identical story as Wes Craven's, uh, you know, last house on the left, but this one's set on a train. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's about two girls. um, What are their names? Margaret and Lisa. They are in school in Germany and they are heading to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Italy to go stay with Lisa's parents for the Christmas holidays and stuff like that. So they got to take a train there. And ultimately what happens, they're on this train and they come in contact with these two low life thugs who ultimately, you know, start to do nasty shit to them. And with the help of some, the story is so weird in this film too, how this third character gets involved in this film. The but female, there's also, yeah. there's, there's a female character that gets involved in this torture of Margaret and Lisa also. And she was actually never with them to start. Um, there's a really odd scene in this film where one of the characters actually approaches her in a bathroom and then they end up having sex and stuff and they become like, you know, this item thing. And mm-hmm. she gets involved with, you know, doing torture and Margaret and Lisa too. So it's basically these three, nasty assailants doing sexual things to these girls and stuff on this train and and yeah they basically need to survive well try to survive but i mean if you're familiar with with west craven's last house on the left um this movie follows the same type of structure and format so you know what the third act's gonna entail it mm-hmm. turns into a you know it turns into a uh, basically a revenge film um <clears throat> i've always loved this movie i think this movie's fantastic i don't know what it is man but i just always enjoy i i'm you know i've gained more of an appreciation for craven's last house on the left over the years just watched it many times and stuff and there were certain things about that film that used to bug me uh this one right here unlike craven's film this one has an amazing soundtrack man the soundtrack Ennio is, maricone any maricone does the soundtrack and it's just beautiful man the, the music fits so oh, he's he's like a master of putting that amazing music into these type of films that are so frightening you know like you, you feel so bad for these girls that are being the victim of all these sexual crimes and things like that. You feel so shitty because they got nowhere to go. They're on a fucking train. Like they have nowhere to go. And the the score is just so beautiful and touching and it just makes you feel so shitty while you're watching it. But mm-hmm. um, it's really good though, man. I think honestly the performances in this film are quite well done. Love the setting on the train. Like I said, the soundtrack is just the big, one of the biggest selling points to this. But um, you know, it's a nasty little flick. I can see why it ended up on the video nasty list, man. I mean, the things that are done to these girls and, you know, minor spoiler, but I mean, like I said, everyone have, should have seen um, Craven's film. Uh, you know, it ultimately turns into the parents getting revenge on these assailants and things like that. It's very much the exact same story. Um, and I like it, man. I actually prefer the ending of this film than I do in, in Last House. I know mm-hmm. some people don't, but I actually prefer the way it goes down in this one a lot more and stuff, but uh, yeah, it's just one of those, it's one of those films when you watch it, you feel super helpless, you know, and you feel kind of dirty too. <laughs> shit that's yeah. Funny. It's real nasty, man. It's real, real exploitive, real nasty shit, man. Um, I've always been a big fan of this one. Uh, Night Train Murders. I'm going to go ahead and give it an eight and a half out of 10. I think this one is definitely one that you need to check out. It's definitely one of the better video nasties out there. I remember when I first watched this film years and years ago, I was like, this sucks. It's fucking Craven's film. I just, I couldn't respect it for what it was. I was like, they they just ripped off Craven's film. This is ridiculous. Um, But then, you know, I didn't really realize that this is what a lot of Italian films did. (laughs) You know, they took like these films, kind of made their own versions of them and stuff. It gained a a really, you know, a lot of more respect for the film. And uh, it's definitely one you need to check out, man. All the lotto. I wish he had done more films like this. Like he really only did, you know, he kind of went into what doing comedies and action. He, he yeah. like a lot of Italian directors, TV stuff. And, but he didn't really, you know, do a lot of very notable films, which is kind of unfortunate, but, yeah. but uh, yeah, man, I really dig this one, man. So give it a shot. 
Yeah, I'm sure most people listening to this has probably seen this film before. I mean, should have. Uh, it's one I've reviewed before. I reviewed it like a few years ago on my uh, 25 Days of Christmas horror too. So, but give it a shot. I actually would like to go back and see what I rated it then. <laughs> you know, it's always curious, but but uh, yeah, check it out. Awesome film. Yeah. And that is going to conclude what we watched. Yeah. Sweet. Down the round tree. <clears throat> so, have you seen that film before, nope. JP? Mm-mm. Oh, it's so good, JP. Yeah, I think that you would probably really like this one, man. You know, if you like Craven's film, there's no reason why you shouldn't like this one, really. Um, my favorite Last House on the Left ripoff is House on the Edge of the Park. Which I actually also watched the other night, too, because I got the... I got the Blu-ray in, so I was what checking out. What transfer? Man, it looks really good. I was impressed by it. Who put the Blu-ray out? Code Red. Oh, fuck. Yeah. I thought it was like a foreign Blu-ray, so I was like about to grab it, but no. I ain't. No, they, they actually, no, they actually showed up on that one and did a really good transfer, but uh, yeah, I know it's, it's still a nasty little flick. Um, last yeah. house, in the, or, uh, house in the Edge of the Park. I like it, man. Who David has that? Just... Diamato? Yeah. yeah Diodato, yeah. Diodato. Diodato. Yeah, hmm. the that might be a interesting pick for next year, maybe. Oh yeah, Ricardo Diodato's got to be done. <laughs> got to be done. But yeah, no, it's still a good film, man. I actually, oddly enough, I watched these in the same night. So, <laughs> having an Italian marathon with uh, with some video nasties, <laughs> both on the nasties. There you go. So, anyways, guys, that is going to conclude again uh, what we watched and. Moving along into the meat and potatoes of the show. Yes. I just say that. Extra that so meat. Stu- You're that hungry. So stupid. <laughs> meat and potato. Who talks like that? <laughs> um, with a trilogy that, you know, I think it's been requested, I, I swear, since day one. Since we started doing the podcast, I think it was around the time the third one came out. Yeah, right? it, it's weird because sometimes organically like i don't even know why we did picked it now right like isn't it weird that we just like what about the hatchet trilogy and it's like oh yeah let's do that you know what i mean like it, to, it's... Be, to be honest i was really just wanting to watch the films again <laughs> i'm not gonna lie uh it'd been a while it'd been a, well i i don't know not too too it's long it's been I mean, a few years i yeah, watched uh for me i part i watched part one and part two a couple years back and uh, i had actually watched part three as recent as like the summertime you know, it's actually it on, funny. You, it's actually funny. I actually did watch this at work on your on your phone. No, we actually watched it in break. Oh, really? <laughs> so one yeah. thing that uh, I do want to get in a habit now that we're in 2017, we should have this down by now. Uh, I do want to get in a habit of mentioning off the bat instead of in the middle of the show that when we cover trilogies, we spoil. So trilogies, franchises, uh, especially these three particular films, considering they blend into each other so, so much. Uh, yeah. There's definitely All three films. spoilers. Yeah, it, this is like the Phantasm franchise. Like one film or the next film starts exactly where the previous one left off, like literally in the same scene. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah these three films take place over three nights. So it's it's just like one big long nightmare. So yeah. So yeah, cool stuff. Yeah. Hatchet Trilogy, starting with... Hatchet 1, uh, from 2006, directed by Adam Green, the homie Adam Green, um, yeah. who just, I wish would do more stuff, man. You know, even I more mean, he's constantly there. working, right? Like, oh, he, for he's sure. He's constantly for sure. working, but it's just these things take so long. Like, if, if anybody's not listened to his podcast, The Movie Crypt... It's one of the best podcasts out there. Like when you're talking industry oh, podcasts, people that are in the industry, it's truly top notch. Like it, it's fair. I'm still working my way through the back catalog because I got so far behind. I'm still in 2015. I'm at episode 123. <laughs> yeah, I love that show, man. They're they're always just a riot. They got great guests. They're just everything about that show is good, man. I you know I never knew that Adam Green directed Coffee and Donuts. That's it was his first feature from 2000. No, I've seen Coffee and Donuts before. I don't but... think you have. Uh, is that not the same? Oh, no, that's the Coffee and Cigarettes one or whatever that one is. Yeah. You're thinking oh, of the Jim Jarmusch film. Oh, I'm thinking of a totally different – I'm totally thinking that one. Okay, so yeah. um, just because this is a bit of an Adam Green director spotlight, um, Coffee and Donuts was his film that he made in the year 2000. Uh, he was – he graduated film school and he was working for like a shitty public access cable 
station channel thing that shot like shitty car commercials. And, uh, it, you know, the, the Holliston really represents, you know, it, it parallels his life. Um, and they, that he's also doing that in Holliston, only that his, uh, boss is D Snyder, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. coffee yeah. donuts. Um, he was, I believe with his, with his friend and longtime contributor, I, it might've been, I forget who it is. Um, but one of the one of the people that he made movies with afterwards was working there with him, and basically he was basically saying like, "Hey, do you want to be here forever?" Like, I don't like like. And they started stealing the equipment at night to make their movie, Coffee and Donuts, yeah. and that is uh, essentially. I've not seen it, but I've heard Adam Green talk about it plenty. Essentially, it will never be released because it uh, has p- tons of copyrighted music in it. And uh, it's available online, different places you can find it. You know, it's been out there, but it will never have like an official release. And uh, it basically is Holliston, um, but uh-huh. in movie form and not as good. Uh, so, yeah, that's yeah. that was his first film. After he did that, he, uh, I believe, did a short film that got like tons of um, like hype. It, it was like around everywhere and. Um, he flew out to LA to meet somebody, uh, but he did it like two weeks after instead of the week of or something, or it was like a month after. And by then, like when you're hot, you're hot when you're not, you're not. And it was just a pointless meeting. Like he just went out there for nothing. Uh, and then he decided in 2000, I think five, four to put together a mock trailer, uh, for hatchet, uh, which Mm -hmm. was just a, a teaser trailer. Like they went to Louisiana with like all of their money and they got a couple shots of the swamp and then they had a friend's daughter narrate um the trailer like the legend of Victor Quawi like and uh it it, it, it hit the internet um 2006 this was like a, a interesting time for horror um 2005 or whatever and and horror sites pushed it they were like man this is going to be so cool like you know and there was no money no film put together yet and they eventually got funding and that is the brief history of adam green before hatchet and going into <clears throat> hatchet old school american horror yeah hatchet from 2006 it's crazy man i can't believe how long it's been since that's come up 11 out. years man i remember when hatchet first came out it's like me too oh, man it's slow i remember like the old like previews on like some of the old anchor bay dvds where you just see like the the hatchet going in the air and you see the blood coming off of it. And I'm like, Oh my God, I can't wait to fucking see this. Yeah. Quick little synopsis of the film here. <laughs> when a group of tourists on New Orleans haunted swamp tour, find themselves stranded in the wilderness, their evening of fun and spooks turns into a horrific nightmare. <laughs> yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it still cracks me up, man. It's hilarious. <laughs> that that whole shit, man. Oh my god. Him so, p- playing three different characters is so fucking fun. <laughs> I love it. Yes, Hatchet, man. Thoughts on the film? We got uh, some uh Well, it we opens up with from... cameos right away, and I think I think that's yeah. a huge point with the Hatchet films. Um this wasn't being done that much back then, right? It no. this kind of kicked it off. Then you got the yeah. behind the masks and all, all these films that like the the horror stars of yesteryear had a huge boom in the mid to late two thousands. That's right. And yeah. um, it started with with films like Hatchet, uh, where Adam Green was just a, 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 a young in filmmaking and just wanted to to have all these people that he looked up to in his film, and it gave it credibility. Um, and you know, most notably Kane Hodder, who plays Victor Crowley, of course, former. Yeah. Um, just, just think about this. This was just, when they started filming this, this was just two years removed from Kane Hodder, not playing Jason in Freddy versus Jason, you know, yeah. I mean? like that was a, such a sore spot. Like it was a huge, and I think that's, I believe that's one of the reasons why he took it because he was like so bummed that he didn't have a character anymore. He, cause he was Jason, <clears throat> um, film opens up with Robert England, of course. And I believe, mm. is it, is it the guy Shot. from... Who's Blair it? Wish, Joshua Leonard. Yeah, yeah. So, so two yep. cameos right away. Um, yep. Brother and uh, father. Father, yeah. Son and father. Samus and Amos. Yeah, Robert England's always such a damn 
down. He's fucking. He's fucking funny when he's oh, just yelling. He's, fucking queer. He's he's <laughs> one of the dudes who never yeah. got enough roles, man. Like he's in these yeah. little bit roles sometimes, but the, the dude can act. And even yeah. when he is in these little bit roles, he steals the show. Mm -hmm. And so that the, you know, it, it's set in a swamp, which is interesting. You know, it it, it it's uh. It's not your typical um, slasher setting, it, so that that was kind of yeah. interesting that they that Adam chose that. Um, so I love everything about that setting, man. Setting it in the swamp, in the bayou, in New Orleans during like Mardi Gras and shit. Yeah. There's just a lot of things, like a lot of cultural things that people like and recognize that are going on right there. You know, I love I the love whole montage part. in the beginning of Mardi oh, yeah. Gras with like Marilyn Manson's The New Shit play. Well, yeah, it, it even yeah. starts out with like swamp footage, right? It's like fast paced swamp footage, and then the camera yeah. goes, <laughs> goes under, under, under the, the sewer and into the into goes into pipes into... and flies out. It's just like, and that's when I was like, wow, this was actually pretty impressive considering the budget that they had and, and things like that. I was like, this is actually where Adam Green shines, is, is that moment mm -hmm. right there. Like, he did a fantastic job setting up the film. And if and if you watch closely in that scene, right, the Mardi Gras scene, they only yeah. had a short amount of time and very limited extras. So you'll see that this guy is over here and in the next shot he's over up on the balcony. Like you know what I mean? It's super yeah, super yeah. Uh, low budget stuff there, but they they utilize it well because it doesn't seem like the characters are repeating. You don't notice it unless you've seen it a couple yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Adam Green himself actually has a cameo there, um, which is funny because his character, and we'll talk about this in the other two films, he has an arc. <laughs> just a yeah, random yeah. extra, he has an arc. So we just see him, he's friends with Ben, played by Joel David Moore. Yeah, and Marcus. <laughs> I love how they put uh, Adam Green in the in the films, like how they use that character or the extra or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The, it's, like, the it's, way, so good how, it, it's just funny. And the way the scripts work, and the way the yeah. scripts work was, uh, especially when we get into part three and his reaction that, but we'll get into that when we get to part three. Yeah. yeah. So basically we have here, Joel David Moore. Um, he's, he, he was like a really fantastic actor, by the way. Well, he, uh, he went on to be in the star of avatar, which was like, I guess the highest grossing film of all time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've seen him in a few things over the years. Most notably for me is Spiral, one of Adam Green's yeah, other films. He's yeah, fantastic. Spiral. He's in Dodgeball. He's in a lot of like been Dodgeball and like uh, Common Grandma Boys. He's in like a few comedies. Yeah, you know what? Actually, you know, on the topic of Joel David Moore, um, he was actually when they were casting for the character of Ben, they were looking for. You know, jock type, like regular, like normal look, good looking lead males. Mm -hmm. And that's what they had in mind. And he came in to read for somebody. He's like, wait, you're reading for Ben? And he performed a scene and, and Adam was like, oh, yeah, this is the guy. This is the guy. Stop all the calls like this. I didn't see it this way, but this is the guy. So that's kind of interesting that they chose this guy because he doesn't look like your lead male character. He's tall and skinny no. and awkward looking. Yeah. He looks yeah, like I think Shaggy Adam from Scooby Doo. Adam Green more looks like a leading character than he does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So basically, he's—I don't know—he's uh, heartbroken. He, he kind of comes off as like a total pussy in the beginning of the film because <laughs> they're in New Orleans, they're partying it up and stuff like that. Him and his friends, and he's not really into it because he's just broke, or his girlfriend has just left him actually. So he's yeah. all fucking bummed out, and he doesn't really want to, part uh, you know, participate in the in the festivities and shit. So, um, and he hears about this uh, the swamp tour thing, and he's like, "Well, that sounds pretty damn cool." So a haunted swamp tour, a haunted yeah. swamp tour, and no one's really into it. So everyone else kind of books off, except for uh, Marcus. Marcus, played by Dean Richmond. Yeah. And you know, he does, he's very hesitant. He doesn't want to go with them. He's like, "Fuck, this is gonna be stupid, man. There's no titties." Oh, on look at some stuff. titties, man. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's got a good point, though. You're at Mardi Gras. Like, who wants to go on a haunted swamp tour, yeah. you know? Um, and he's got a really funny line. He's like, what does he say? <laughs> he's like, I would, oh. rather, I would rather skin my own dick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that line tracks me up every time, but man. He, he shows, I like their chemistry together because it shows they're good friends. Yeah, oh, exactly. for sure. So, so ultimately, yeah, they end up going on the swamp tour. Well, and you can tell they're good friends right away because um, – you know, he doesn't want to go, but then his dude's like, all right, man, it's cool. I'll just go by myself. And he's like, fuck. And that proves that he's a good friend because he's like, all right, I got to ride with my boy on this. 
Um, <laughs> it, so they, so they go to the, but there's they actually before they get on the tour they they go to Reverend Zombie's shop to, to take right. a tour. Tony and, Todd and he's like. <laughs> He, oh. he can't have a uh, he doesn't do swamp tours anymore or whatever you know uh and uh he sends him somewhere else but actually don't walk on the sidewalk <laughs> there's some funny stuff behind the scenes with that shot where he's in the shop they had um they actually had a storefront that was in new orleans that they shot but for some reason they didn't get the shot. So if you watch, they have to shoot like really awkwardly where like, look the sign says it's closed, but you never see a shot of the sign. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh. Um, so yeah. Uh, and I think even something along the lines of like, they went, they did something to, to fix it. And then like, they even fucked that up and the door is different or something. Mm. So they had to just do nothing, but like show this weird, awkward shot. Um, so yeah, they go to, uh, another shop, which is ran by, uh, a Perry Asian Asian. Yeah. Yeah. He's Asian. Um, but he has a, <laughs> uh, what kind of accent? Cajun. Cajun accent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and they get on this boat and there's a few, few interesting characters, right? I mean, Bayou Beavers guy. Yeah. Doug. Shapiro. I love the fucking, I love Joel Murphy, man. Or, uh, Joel <laughs> Joel Murray, yeah. Fucking Joel Murray. Bill yeah. Murray's brother, yeah. Yeah, fuck, his character's so... He's just, like, this total dirtbag that's, like... He's got these two sluts with him, and he's got a video camera, and he... What does he call it? The the Bayou... Bayou Be- Beaver. I like the... the I like the... I like the old... <laughs> all the old couple, the, the reaction. Did you ever hear of Bayou Beaver? Sure. And the wife's like, no, and he's like, no. Yeah, um, exactly. Funny story <laughs> about the Bayou Beavers thing is they didn't actually know what it was going to be called so they would just say all these different things and they would have to uh they were they were going to figure out what it was in like post or something like that and do a dub and they it, they originally was saying girls gone wild i believe and when they contacted girls gone wild to use that title they said no this is a little too like raunchy or something <laughs> Girls Shut up. That's Adam Green tells that story. That's what he says. Whether it's true or not, I have no idea. <laughs> it's too raunchy. Yeah. That's classic. That's fucking uh-huh. classic. But yeah, yeah. Anyways, his character is funny as hell, man. He's got these sluts and um, the boat driver or the the tour guide is played by Perry Shen. Yeah, um, who's absolutely hilarious, man. <laughs> so he's he's so, hilarious. He's hilarious. Yeah, he has a Cajun accent. <laughs> so ultimately they take this boat to her and uh and, and it still cracks me up that he's asian and he just drives so bad you know he basically drives <laughs> he drives this boat right up onto a log and it essentially puts a hole in it and it sinks and we're, stuff we're, so. we're just stuck <laughs> dude he has so many funny moments where he's like doesn't so know many. what's going on or just like, <laughs> like just winging mm-hmm. it like just complete bullshit in his way through yeah yeah oh, and then i was the, like when the truth comes there's out the pirate, and there's the pirates that guard the legs that's a fucking stupid story <laughs> no that, that totally never happened that's not true <laughs> he's like getting called on it every five minutes <laughs> actually it <laughs> is true <laughs> <He's> getting... <laughs> yeah, like... so then yeah he fucks up he, he you know drives this thing into a tree basically and another stranded out in the out in the uh yeah the so swamp so, areas so this old elderly guy gets injured because he gets bitten by a croc yeah and yeah. then uh and then victor crowley appears and yeah people start getting done they start getting dead yeah uh oh. mary beth dunstan uh played by tamara feldman uh yeah, is the fa- the daughter of robert england's character samson and joshua <laughs> leonard's character ainsley and she's, so she's on the boat to looking figure out what for them. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, one plot note is that this part of the swamp is, is off limits. Like it's been closed down, uh, yeah. due to what on the Island swamp, you, you know, but up. it's probably because of Victor Crowley. Uh, that, then we do hear the actual Victor Crowley story that involves, um, uh, Thomas Crowley, his father. It's kind of an interesting, you know, it, it's typical of like, sympathetic like revenge stories like similar to like friday the 13th it, it, it very mirrors friday the 13th in, in a way um but it it, it, has it, it to... is it is and it isn't like you know the whole story of you know victor i, I actually like 
how they kind of break it down a little more in part two and stuff. They kind of give the story a little more girth to it. You know, they, they yeah. elaborate on things. More I think that's pretty cool. Story. Which was and, always yeah. intended, actually. They, 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 Adam had all of these ideas for part two while they were filming this one, long yeah, before yeah. they it, even You did. know what? It completely shows, too. You can tell this was calculated, too, that you kind of get, you know – you know, 30% of the story kind of thing, or maybe like half the story basically in this one. And I, I like how, I like the idea that Adam Green presented with us, you know, like, you know, this whole, like why he, they're living out there and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, how Victor Crowley, you know, was harassed and, you know, kind of burnt up, but essentially it was his father that actually killed him. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and I love that angle. I love that angle. Like he was being tortured and, you know, he probably would have burnt in there, you know, uh, but essentially he actually died by a hatchet by his own father. And I like that whole aspect. It kind of gives a little bit of emotion to the film, too. It's not just like a straight up like, yeah, whatever type story. But, you know, to take it one thing further, it's I like the aspect of, you know, Victor Crowley is more of like a, he's more of like a supernatural type character. Uh, he from is kind the get-go. of snap. like he is from the beginning yeah. unlike how right Jason and Michael turned supernatural. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's the angle that they play and they never turn back from it. It's kind of cool. Like, yeah, they like, even Victor give him like a... is kind of forced. He's kind of stuck in this weird world where, you know, in this revenge world, um, which we learn later why, you know, what's going on with that and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it's kind of cool that he has to relive this night over and over again because of this huge tragedy and shit like that. Mm-hmm. They and, label you know, him as like a repeater. That's what they I call. love that. Yeah, I love that. I, I love that too because it's something yeah. we hadn't seen with a slasher killer, um, yeah. done this Especially type the of backwoods way. one. Yeah, yeah, and you know, Kane Hodder actually plays Mister Crowley as well. And one of the main reasons he took that role was because there was a little bit of behind, uh, you know, outside of the mask type role for him, where he did get to show emotion. And Adam Green has went Act. on to say many times, and including in Kane Hodder's book. Like, Kane's a fucking actor, man. Like, like nobody was giving him credit ever. Like, they just saw him as a stunt dude. Like, can you be big? But the dude the dude does emote. He for sure does. Mm-hmm. And I've always yeah, been yeah. a huge mm-hmm. fan behind the mask and in front of the mask for, for Kane Hodder. He's an amazing uh, contributor to horror. Uh, he's, you know, I, I, think he's, I think he's very solid as an actor. And, yeah. um, you know, both, you know. He as shines Jason, in those roles. And, you know what I mean? As uh, Thomas Crowley or, or Mr. Crowley. And, uh. So, um, one thing that I will say, you know, kind of, kind of just to get into a, a little bit of negatives here, um, can't, Victor Crowley does look a little rubbery at times. In this one? Yeah. In the first one, like his shoulder, like, his shoulders are very like big and bulky, but like when he moves, like you can see them shake a little bit sometimes. Did you guys notice yeah. that? Yeah, there's, yeah, a there's some bit. certain like it kind of looks like kind of like a bladder effect at some point. That's like, one thing so. with with the, like the look of Victor Crowley's face. If you look at his face in part one, two, and three, there is subtle differences. But if you pay attention, yeah. like they actually do look quite different. I, I know uh, John Carl Beekler actually did the effects on this one. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, this has the best effects of the hatchets, in, in my opinion. Um, which is kind of ironic because he actually does a few of his kills from. Friday seven that he never got to do it cause they were edited out. Yeah. 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 Um, I right. think that the, like the best kill in all three hatchets is the, the face rip. Um, oh, where it's actually it. a really so... cool shot. He comes running out of the goddamn house. Like, and that, that's the core difference right there with, um, if, if people say like Kane Hodder's one note, uh, no, because his character is completely different than Jason's. Like the, yeah. the, his mannerisms, it's much more aggressive, aggressive and and violent and like just in your face, fast rage, rage, rage yeah. induced. And Definitely there's that, there's that, revenge, there's that yeah. camera <laughs> shot that spins all the way around as the face is ripping. And that's that was one of the core shots that Adam had in mind um, yeah. when, when thinking of of uh, kills for this film. Uh, I think I, what do you guys think? You think that's a, uh, the best kill? <laughs> Oh, it's, it's it's such a good it's one. Fucking, it's there's a lot of good. Yeah, it's one of my. There's a, like a lot of the kills from like the first film are some of my favorites. Like when he's just splitting the fucking dude in half with the fucking hatchet, yeah. and you just see the fucking torso, and he's just throwing the fucking body. Yeah, man, I love that mm-hmm. when he kills the old couple. Yeah, <laughs> they're <That's laughs> brutal in it, man. It's just nasty. Dude, yeah, uh, you know, um, I, and I'm sorry to be such a like fact giver or whatever but I, I do think that these are interesting that's why i keep saying them uh if you watch the movie closely 
the uh, old woman, um, uh, uh, Patrika Darbo, I think her name is, uh, she, in the original script, was a racist. And she (laughs) didn't like Marcus because he was black. And if you look at her, there's a couple scenes that they couldn't edit out where she gives him, like, dirty looks and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So Completely. Oh, I mean, oh, that makes sense. I was wondering about that. They cut all <laughs> of her funny. saying, all of her lines where she, like, physically, you know, you know, actually said something Like, actually something said negative, racist comments, yeah. Because he said it didn't come off funny like it, like he originally intended. It just didn't feel like that character... Um, it, it just didn't feel right, he said. So he, he tried to cut it out throughout the film, but there are still moments where she gives him dirty looks. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man, that's so funny. But knowing that now, that's even more funny. Yeah, right. <laughs> like an evil stink eye for no reason. It's like, why is she giving him yeah. an evil stink eye? <laughs> that's hilarious, man. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, and Perry Shen to stay on like the the race and like stereotype things. Um, when he has the Cajun accent, and then when shit hits the fan, he goes like full blown back to like Asian descent Asia. accent. Well, you yeah. notice that he changes into a third accent, which is just a regular, normal, like, you know, English accent. He does that a couple times because doesn't he say that he's from Detroit or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm from Detroit. The yeah. reason there... that he yeah. does that is because Perry Shen is an American. Like he was born in America, and he actually has an American accent, not yeah. an Asian accent. So once in the script, when he switched from the Cajun to the Asian, that was it, and. He didn't. He came to Adam and he said, "You know, I find this like the stereotypical Asian accent kind of degrading. Do you think it would be okay if I switched again to my normal accent?" And Adam's like, "Actually, yes, that's perfect because it's it's a, mm-hmm. it adds to the joke." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love when the fucking guy Marcus calls him a fucking Jackie Chan Chris Tucker. <laughs> 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 And Mar- Marcus is an interesting character too because he's kind of like the us of the movie, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like he's yeah. he's the version of like where how we're like, why the fuck doesn't anybody try to climb a tree? Uh, like I never seen a slasher killer to climb a tree, just hide there till the night's over. You know? Yeah, I'm not fucking moving. I'm not getting killed by some elephant man. <laughs> fuck this shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he's probably he's probably like the coolest character in the film, man. God, yeah, the conversation. His the conversations of... between the two fucking uh, titty sluts. Oh my god. Oh my. It's just messy and Jenna. Fucking. I know that's. I know that's like purposely. Like it's intended for. Them I'm calling to the police. To call the cops. <laughs> uh, don't you know they're the same people? No, they're not. <laughs> Shut up, <laughs> slut. Like. It's so oh, funny, man. They are funny too, and like yeah. even like the ongoing joke where um. You know, he he hooked up with that girl with crabs, and then lay, like he's sitting on the chick the whole time, and then he's he just when things scratching. couldn't get worse, he sees her he itch, and he's like, "God damn it!" Yeah. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, they they have good chemistry, and Joel David Moore as Ben when he meets Mary Beth, and he's like, like oh, like Mary Beth, that's that's a nice, that's a, that's a nice name because it's, it's two names like Mary and Beth. Like, like it's not boring. Like Ben, that's just boring. <laughs> I'm just like this guy, man. I like your coat. <laughs> He's a, totally it's... that guy too. He's that character that you know is just gonna start spilling his guts. <laughs> He's like, yeah. you know, I'm here to get my mind off it. But why would she leave me? And then he just starts fucking breaking <laughs> into it. <laughs> it's like, okay, okay, I'm here. I'm here to forget about. It. I'm here to forget about it. <laughs> Love that performance, man. Yeah, it's, it goes over so well. Well, how do you guys yeah. feel about the comedy? Because that's something that runs throughout I, these films. Honestly, I, I like the comedy because it's I, not like it's not that stupid slapsticky comedy. I like more situational comedy where and you know things that kind of fit into into the characters, like you know, with the girl scratching her crotch and shit. Like that's I love that type of shit, man. That's a yeah. great addict. It's yeah, just it's, it's Adam based off like the funny. reactions of the other characters. Exactly. It's like they, they told the story, you know, in passing about him sleeping with this girl with crabs. And then they throw in this joke where she scratches herself. I mean, if you weren't paying attention to the story earlier, that doesn't make sense, you know, kind of thing. But if you are, it's funny. It, it's not slapsticky. I like the subtleness of those jokes. I'm a big fan of like subtle comedy and like dark, subtle comedy and shit. Yeah. Like if you kind of read between the lines, you're like, oh my God, that's so bad. So, you know, so, you kind of shake your head and shit, but I so, think the comedy blends perfect in the film. I, I honestly think it's actually really well done. 
Plus, with the yeah, chemistry well, of the characters, like Marcus and uh, yeah, ben. because when when you have them cracking on each other all the time, like that's what I do with my yeah. friends. That's yeah. what I do with like, you well, guys. That, that's so exactly what, does... like how we are with our friends too. It's like, yeah, trust and, me, man. There's been some STD jokes around my crew of friends, too. <laughs> and, and the comedy doesn't a hundred percent, um, just for comedy's sake. Like, like if you look at for the example that Sean switches his accent like yeah it's funny it's it's a comedic moment but it it also parallels the fact that he's a phony right the whole tour is a phony tour he doesn't know what he's doing so it it just further um you know grounds the fact that he's a phony mm -hmm. so there is like it's it's well done comedy for sure oh for sure 100 percent. yeah i thought the same thing about that it's a great switch up and it totally shows who he who he really is he's just uh an asian guy from detroit (laughs) You know, yeah. trying to make his way out in the in the bayou, shitty for I, him. I I do kind of feel bad for him after we get more into like why he was actually doing that tour in part two, though. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, and what's yeah. so cool about the Hatchet trilogy is there's so many setups. Um, yeah. That it is cool that Adam had these in mind, um, mm-hmm. and it it even makes more sense that he would think this far ahead because Adam came up for the idea of Hatchet when he was eight. Yeah, eight years yeah. old. He was at a camp, a summer camp, and the camp counselors didn't want them to go to a certain area of the camp, so they said, "Stay away, Hatchet Face will get you." And all the kids were super scared, but Adam was like all into horror and stuff. So he's like, he's like, w- w- he'll get. How will we get me? Like, what do we do? Like, like who, who is he? Like, and they were like, it's just a fucking it's a scary monster guy, dude. So he created the story of who he was in his head. And he just kept mm-hmm. it with him throughout all those years and periodically thought about him. And then when he was going to make movies, just natural that he would use that idea. A cool story exactly. about cool story about like when this film first came out. As you know, Adam Green's from Massachusetts, so he's from my area. And one of his favorite stores growing up to go to like to buy movies was Newberry Comics. Yep. And he has been the main character of the film where like this Newberry comic shirts throughout it and once this film was released and stuff it was like advertising like Newberry comics had like this special Newberry comic shirt called the blood spatter shirt where it had like all the blood spray and stuff I wish I bought one back in the day it was really cool looking and it said like exclusive hatchet edition Newberry comic shirt yeah he has said in the past that that he you know loved that place and so he would always try to give it a shout out in in a lot of his movies and and a lot of his uh pictures and stuff like that they're, they're in most of them like the logo mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah man one thing about this film that always always brings a smile to my face is the <laughs> i keep wanting to say hilarious hilarious uh the soundtrack man you guys ever notice the music, how happy it is for like the dark setting and shit? <laughs> uh-huh. The music is so funny to this film. There's so many music cues in this film that just crack me up, man. It's like the like music is overly happy for what they're doing. It's like, what the fuck? It you know, that's, like a... that's purposely intended by, by Adam Green. It's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, his idea of just kind of making the, the moments a little lighter, you know, but. Yeah, it has like a I... Empire or like Full Moon-esque, like a Richard Band type sound to it. A little bit, a little yeah. bit. It, it just, it just has that feel where, you know, it, it's kind of perfect. It's not all, it's not too goofy, you know. Yeah. But it brings a yeah, smile to the face. It just kind of adds to the, you know, almost like the subtleness. You know, sometimes people don't even really notice those type of things, those musical cues and shit. But, yeah. you know, generally a film like this would have more of a, more of a darker score. Probably the most, you know? probably the most but darkest it, it, stuff in the score is probably like the, that, that slow piano, like. Do 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 that plays during like the flashback scene when Mary Beth's telling the story about mm-hmm. Thomas Crowley. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a, there's a um part where they're in a cemetery and you know another um flaw that if, if you've seen this movie a couple times, uh, it's all sort of styrofoam. So yeah. uh, there's yeah. there's a scene where Crowley shows up and they jump and there's a like giant mausoleum next to him and uh, the uh, Dion Richards character uh, actually bumps the 
the giant mausoleum and it, and it yeah. shakes. It, it literally yeah, shakes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, there's also <laughs> moments in this film. Uh, I don't know if you guys caught this, but early on when they're in the, you know, still in the Mardi Gras scene, um, the character's lips are moving, but there's no sound like in certain scenes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, mm-hmm. there, there was a f- little bit of like ADR issues throughout the film. That, that I did notice. And I, I've seen this film a couple times, and I've seen this film uh, when it came out. I haven't seen it in years, though. I haven't seen it since, like, 2011 or mm-hmm. 2010, actually. Mm-hmm. So it's been, like, seven yeah. years since I've seen it. But I, when this film came out, and it, I, it was, like, right when I started getting into collecting a little bit more, um, or at least when I bought it, and uh, yeah. like, I watched it so many times. <laughs> this, mm-hmm. this is the... This is one of the first films I actually upgraded the Blu-ray because it just had like a new, another commentary track on it, but mm-hmm. then it wasn't on the DVD. Are you serious? Not yeah, it has. It. Yeah, it has the the commentary track with uh, Kane Hodder on it with Adam Green. That's not yeah. on the DVD release. Yeah, there's a couple on there. Um, yeah, man, sure it's that? a fun. Yeah, I think there's. I don't have my copies with me right now. Yeah, there's, there's the one that was on the DVD, and then they have the there's, new. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, is, there's two commentaries. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um. So. Yeah. Uh. What else about Hatchet? I, you know, one one thing I like about this film, uh, which I will state now because since we're going to be getting into part two shortly, um, one thing about this film I do really like is the pacing's really good. I feel like there's really not not a lot of downtime in this one. There's no. There's no extensions of scenes where, you know, I just feel like they could have been cut down and stuff. I, I figure – I feel the pacing is really good in this one. Uh, it's short, man. You know, what does this one run? Just over 80 minutes or something? It they're kinda, they're, yeah, all, yeah, they're all like 80 uh, – yeah. so, that's but, a good thing about this trilogy. They're all like – Yeah, well, well, that, well, that's the good minutes. thing about Adam Green. And yeah. it, if you watch his entire filmography, they're all very well paced. And he is very conscious of pacing. He really is. Yeah. Oh, and you can tell in this film, man, it works out great. Like, you, you know, when they're telling the backstory and stuff, it, it goes by really quick and kind of blends in with the rest of the story, like the present story and stuff quite well. Um, yeah, you know, I think he does a really good job in this one. Uh, we'll talk more about that in part two, uh, which I do have. I have. It's probably my biggest problem with the film. But uh, but yeah, um, no, this one just it comes off as just like, bam, bam. And, and you know, and the ending to this, the ending to part one is very much what you would expect just to like, just fucking hammer it out and just end, you know, kind of thing. It just, it mm-hmm. seems like it's the appropriate ending for this type of kind of fast paced film, you know, in a yeah, sense. We kind of get a um, bit of a uh, lead switch in the film though. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cause it, the story seems like it's going to be about Ben, but it's yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like I like that you know that approach to the filmmaking though you know you kind of introduce this character as the main one and then they you're right they follow his character until they get on the boat and then you get introduced to Mary Beth and then yeah you know the, the story just kind of like switches the hero it, of the film yeah it, it totally just kind of switches to her because why are you here oh well you know I'm looking for my dad and my my brother who went missing gator poaching <laughs> they call they call it hunting but they're fucking so poaching. What, what do you guys think of Tamara Feldman. Because we we obviously uh, will talk about this in the next one, but the, I the lead that, changes. I I think that she's pretty good. Um, she's not bad. I I personally think that Daniel Harris is so much better as mm-hmm. the role because, because I think it's also because of when Daniel Harris's characters or when she's introduced into this franchise, she's always under duress. Mm-hmm. So her, she's always like, you know, she's just there's so much emotion in every scene with her in the next two films because it's like, you know, there's so much going on, right? Mm-hmm. Never had, she never got a chance to relax. Like her character was never relaxed. So I think Daniel Harris's performance is actually pretty well done in the next yeah. two films based on, you know, the emotional, you know, the, just think, the emotion that she has to display on screen constantly, man. It's crazy. At, so. at first when they did like, uh, cause Danielle, we we're going to talk about this when Danielle take over the role. It was kind of confusing to me at first because it was well, I know who Danielle Harris was at the time of course, then, but I did enjoy Tamara Feldman in the role too. She did a pretty good job, kind of mm-hmm. later in the later scenes. Anyways, she kind of was off putting in like the beginning scenes because well, we didn't get to know her character until the second part of the film. Yeah, like 
Yeah. Well, it's because her character comes off as someone that's hiding something when she doesn't yeah. really need to be hiding the yeah, fact. Yeah. That, like, I mean, she can tell someone that she's why she's on the boat. It doesn't really need to be a hidden fact that, you know, oh, I'm looking for my dad and brother that went missing. Like, it, it doesn't need to be hidden. So <laughs> you kind of get that impression that she's hiding something. And it's like, why? Okay, so they went missing. Let's go find them. Fuck you, it. You, you, <laughs> you reminded know? me of a joke where once she does reveal why she's there, why she has a gun, why she took that boat. She's yeah. like, the thirty dollars swamp tour was a hell of a lot cheaper than buying a boat. And and oh, Joel yeah. David Moore's like, wait, you paid thirty? Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, we never comes got... back. He's like, why did she pay thirty? Because <laughs> he paid yeah. fifty. Uh, <laughs> and then like Leon's when they... part they got when, the boobs price when uh, they first go there, and he's like, or, or it was forty or whatever, and he's like, he's like, it was forty dollars a piece or something, and he's like. Marcus is like, can you spot me, dude? And he's like, wait, you don't have any money? He's like, no, I'm just not paying for this bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's awesome. I, I, Marcus is my favorite in this yeah. film. It's like when he's talking, like when him, uh, Mary Beth were like trying to talk Crawley when uh, Ben is trying to get the gasoline. And he's like, you look like you've been molested by wolves. <laughs> well, one thing about yeah. Hatchet and the characters mm-hmm. in Hatchet, and, and really all three of them, um, but this one, we spend more time with the this cast because it's a little smaller. Um, yeah, yeah. Th- this is how you write slasher characters, right? Like, they don't have to be random guy in shirt number one, right? Like, like yeah. all these characters have you can you can piece together a backstory for each character, like everybody from you know Marcus to Ben to Mary Beth to to Misty and Mercedes to Doug Shapiro and. That scene where they find his, you know, ID and that they he's find a, out he's a, that fo- he's a phony. phony. Like, <laughs> yeah. that also, you know, that wasn't needed. Like, you didn't have to have yeah. that. But that's depth. And that's that's what a lot of indie filmmakers miss. And that's what separates people like yeah. Adam Green, who go on to be successful, and then people who just make movies where there's there's no depth to anything. Because if there's one thing that you can control without money is depth in characters. Exactly. You just have to. You have to write it. It's properly. so funny you brought up the Jug Sapero scene too, because then Marcus is like, "All right, does anybody else have a secret?" I didn't go to NYU. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's like, she's like, I went to NYU, and she's like, yeah, like anybody's ever heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> she's so dumb. She's dumb as fuck, man. It, it, you know, it's it's actually something I have noted here is honestly. Um, the characters in this film, man, are, you know, I mean, a lot of them are very kind of stereotypical type characters and stuff, but it's crazy how the characters, like you said, have depth and, you know, it's not really needed, but it's amazing how just a little bit of writing, you know, can go such a long way in the film. Plus yeah. it works. You, with, like, you don't good. need those things, but you, you know, he never spends that much time on any of the characters, but you feel like they're actually like real people, you know, yeah. like it's, in a lot of it, films, especially in slasher films, char- the characters come across as non real people because they have absolutely no depth, no backstory, nothing. And this is where I always have the argument sometimes, you know, just knowing certain things and getting to know these characters is, is for you know these type of films is nice because when they die like you have that emotion too you're like holy fuck man <laughs> that was plus, brutal. Plus, plus plus the character like real death plus yeah. the the performances of these characters is executed great too like uh that's the performances in general like would they actually cast people that would could be these actual people in real life which really fits with the film too you know what i mean yeah oh, for sure for yeah, sure. like like yeah. Joel Murray actually could look like like this Doug Shapiro guy. Oh, yeah, these these are all potential real type characters for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, they're not really the most like. I mean, honestly, if I was on that boat tour with those two girls, I would probably strangle a bitch. Like <laughs> seriously, fuck you hit me. Those type catty bitches arguing and they're just moronic and shit. Like it's funny, yeah. but to be around that in a long period of time for a long period yeah. of time would be. Would be devastating. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Brutal. You know what I'm saying? It's like my god. But uh, yeah, the, but no. But everybody but has a personality in the film. That's one thing I like. You know, mm-hmm. the characters are bubbly, even though some of them are annoying and very stereotypical. They're bubbly. They're You know, they're noticeable. You can tell the characters apart. That's another problem with a lot of slasher films too. You know, you get a you know abundance of characters, and you're just like, who's who? Who's that chick? Yeah. 
You know, yeah, like at least they have identities like, in this and stuff. So yeah, like, there's it's like good. nine chicks with blonde hair, and you're like, which one's this one? Exactly. It's a testament to Adam Green actually thinking about thinking out uh, what he can do with these characters and, and you know create memorable characters, which is the reason why we're talking about this because they're actually memorable. You know, yeah. it's hard to do it. He's got 80 minutes, and he doesn't waste a lot of time. And and like I said, you know, the pace in this film is fantastic. You know, the time he spends on telling the backstory and stuff and incorporating these little mini stories with all these mm-hmm. characters. It's impressive. It's impressive low-budget filmmaking. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, it mixed in with a great funny-ass score. I love the score. And, you know, Victor Crowley is a scary-ass person. Mm-hmm. And there's just a lot of elements in this film that's really cool, man. Really, really cool film. Uh, Surprised young, people don't like this film. Young Victor Crowley was actually played by Adam Green's ex-wife, uh, Riley. I, um, I saw that. I was like, what the fuck is with the girl playing? And, <laughs> well, do you know why he did that? No, I don't, actually. Because he remembered in Pet Cemetery, uh, the Zelda character is played by a guy. And <sighs> it gave him like more of a creepy look. And also, Victor Crowley needed to be small. And apparently, she's really small. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, you guys want to jump into ratings? Sure. Right. Let the let the hatchet uh, fact boy over here go first. <laughs> Were you All reading right. shit off? Is this off the dome? No, this is off the dome. Holy fuck, man! You're a hatchet. I don't fucking... even. Ha- I didn't even take notes on this movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I told I you guys I was a fan that. of hatchet. <laughs> No, it, it's cool, man. It's cool. I, I, and I knew that you guys would be full of the facts, so I wasn't doing a whole lot of, you know, uh, research and stuff on it. But uh, yeah. no, it's, it's a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, you know? ironically, I didn't really write a lot. I just wrote, like, character names and stuff, so I remember a certain I, yeah. I actually never write character names because I always have it beside on, you know, IMDb and stuff like that. But, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, so. I've listened to every commentary except for, obviously, uh, apparently the one that's on the Blu-ray that I didn't know hmm. about and all the special features on all Upgrade the it. films in the <laughs> past. So, uh, I, you know, I, I know this information from the special features and stuff, but yeah. it just yeah, stuck yeah. with me a little bit. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, hatchet one, um, I'm gonna be honest. I, I came in, I was coming in at one rating and I, along with you guys kind of even talked me up a little bit. Um, so, so my ratings actually got changed while we talked about this film. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, I just love the, the whole film. Like, it, it, I don't really like when people call it like it's tagline old school American horror. Cause it's really not, it's not at all. Um, no, a, because it's better storytelling. <laughs> well, <laughs> well it, it's just, it's, um, I just don't remember old school American horror being like that type of writing and, and comedic moments. But yeah. anyway, yeah. Uh, I digress with that. Uh, I, I love the characters in this film. I love how everything is set up for future um, reveals and different things. Uh, it's a good story. It's a good original story. Although it parallels Jason in just the on the surface, it is a lot different. Uh, I love, and we didn't even mention like Jack Cracker's character, uh, played by John Carl Buechler, who did the special effects. Of course, directed Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven. Um, like that, that is that character has fucking depth, and you see him for two minutes. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, mm-hmm. And it gets fleshed out more in in the sequel, uh, and you know everybody sort of has their uh, arc. Like everybody has an arc, and including people that we only see for a moment in this film. Uh, I love Hatchet. Hatchet's Hatchet's Hatch is a great film. Plenty of interesting stuff going on. A uh, lot of legends in this film. I give it an eight point five out of ten. Derek? Nice. Yeah, Hatchet One, man. It was a fucking. This film, when I first saw it years ago, this is when I actually. This is the film that actually got me back into horror. I just. Super. This is like my type of movie. Super fun. Uh, with the minuscule budget that it had, but it was like a big like film for me. Like, with its uh, gore effects, which I learned more about later on when, like, the special features of when the dvd and blu-ray came out and just the, like the performances of like the cast i like ben and marcus's chemistry as friends together and the dwelling of victor crowley's character and the backstory is immensely like the mythology just behind his character as we learn in the other films when we get into them is really great and i really like the comedy it's really toned and Really funny shit. It's hilarious, as we always say. It's, it's hilarious. 
Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, the effects and the awesome quirky score is what really makes this. And I really just have a blast with this film. For me, it's also an 8.5 out of 10. <laughs> you know, man, this movie right here gets all the praise in the world for me because uh, the boat name is called the Scare Boat. <laughs> <laughs> i fucking laugh every time i see that i don't know why it's the subtle things that make me laugh in film sometimes the scare boat like could you get could you come up with any more anything more lame than that <laughs> it's just so fucking funny to me man honestly man one of my favorite one of my favorite scenes in the entire film has to be when uh i, I think uh, I can't remember who says it, but they're like, like, oh, tell me this is part of the tour. And this is right after they sing or the Asian guy sings the boat. He's like, he's like, tell me this is part of the tour. And he's like, oh yeah, I try to sink the boat every night. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally the funniest line in the fucking movie. I had to pause. Yeah. I was pissing myself. <laughs> the, way he, the way he executes that line. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> He should just won an Oscar for like all his performances in these films. <laughs> oh, it's so funny, man! It's just so funny. Uh, but yeah, Hatchet Man. I I've always been a really big fan of this film. I've never kind of went back and forth on this one. I really think that you know it's too bad that there's a lot of people out there just like oh it's you know it's just a Jason film. It's just it's actually not. It really isn't. Um, I I love what you know, Adam Green did with this story, man, you know, and how the story progresses itself too. I think it's a really well written trilogy and this is just the start of it. And, um, but man, you know, you can't have a, a great story and, and fun characters and stuff without amazing kills. Like there's really not a lot of aspects of this film that suck at all. Um, obviously some, you know, budget constraints with, uh, <laughs> with minor fuck ups in the film and stuff, but you're going to get that in, in low budget filmmaking. Yeah. Um, but you know, Adam Green really makes up for it in every other in every other aspect. You can tell he calculated a lot of things in this film, and it shows. You know, it really does show. Um, I don't really have a lot of bad things to say about it, uh, really at all. Um, but uh, I'm also going to come in at an eight and a half. So it's very rare that we all have the same rating yeah. <laughs> on the on the film. We so. love. Hatchet. I actually, I actually had this one at an eight, and during our talk, I went up to eight and a yeah, half. Yeah, me, so. <laughs> me too. Me <laughs> too. That's really funny. So yeah, sometimes you need to see it all presented out in front of you to to really get a grasp on it. That's what's good to talk about these films. Yeah. So uh... I agree. So uh, Hatchet one was two thousand six. So then we moved four years into uh, into two thousand and ten, and comes the sequel hatchet 2 also directed by adam green uh now starring daniel harris in the lead road lead role as mary beth dunstan um i don't know man i never really found it that jarring i've heard some people say it's like it was so no, jarring and stuff like, i really honest I, i'll be honest with you guys man the first time i watched i didn't even notice at first like because literally this movie starts in the exact scene exact that scene. ends in part Where one. It it's ends. literally the exact scene. And at first I was like, okay. And then obviously you, you, you notice right away, but, uh, um, hatchet, two, I don't know if it's done well. hatchet, hatchet two was when I first started finding, like when, when I found YouTube, like I, at this, by the time this came out, I was like two years away from starting YouTube and I was really into watching people's videos and I started following the horror sites like crazy. So, I knew way ahead of time that this casting change was happening, and uh, so I was already prepared for it. Mm -hmm. I actually saw this in theaters. Really? You're one of the rare people. I saw this at the Kendall Square Theater. Played there. They advertised the shit out of it. Play, watch Hatchet 2, unrated. Yeah, this was a huge deal. When did this actually come out? Like, I know it says 2010, but did did it take a while to actually get out? I think it did. It might have been. I, I think it was the when I saw it in theaters it was 2010. Isn't this one of the first films to play in theaters unrated? It, it was. Yeah, it was 2000 what... and uh, shit. When was it? I think I read somewhere that this was like the first film since Dawn of the Dead that played unrated. No, that's the truth. Yeah. Um. It, it came out in October 2010, limited in the theater. Yeah. Um. And yeah. then it was uh it play it got D V D distribution in I believe 
2011, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but w- one thing that I will say about that is the MPAA fucking wanted Adam to cut so much out of this movie. It went back yeah. so many times, and he finally gave up, and he was like, fuck it. I'll release my film unrated. And that was a huge ballsy move because you're essentially saying, fuck the MPAA. Yep. I'm not going to get wide distribution, but if I could get a place to house this, I'm going to release it unrated. And it was the first film to get that wide of a release unrated since 1978's Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. Yep. So, um, and what had happened was it played a weekend and got pulled from release, I believe. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, and it just was it was a huge blow. Like Adams talked about it a bunch of times, but it was a huge blow to have his movie pulled from the theatrical release. Like, you know, that's tons of money lost, that's tons of revenue lost for the, you know, production and the producers and stuff. Um, not to mention you started a war with the MPAA and you kinda lost. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um I, I do know that they also made this like a an R rated version for like the red box for this film. Yeah. And the rentals. Yeah, I believe so. Um, so hatchet two, you want to get into the plot? Mary Beth escapes the clutches of the Bayou butcher, Victor Crowley and returns (laughs) to the swamp with an army of hunters and gunmen determined to end Crowley's reign of horror once and for all. (laughs) I gotta stop doing that. It's fucking stupid. (laughs) Voodoo magic. So, um, I guess we can get into right away, like, the film picks up right after the other one, um, like, exactly, like, the same scene, um, mm-hmm. but this time it's yeah. Daniel Harris. Mm-hmm. Now, interesting yes. story about that specific switch, because, um, Daniel Harris actually read for Hatchet, the first Hatchet. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, Adam yeah, Green that. was a huge fan of her, he knew who she was, he loved Halloween 4 and 5, um, and, but, he thought about it and he didn't he already had so many horror people in his movie that he just felt like that was just one step too many and he wanted and he wanted a fresh face so he he went with uh tamara feldman now Mm -hmm. whenever tamara feldman did not come back for hatchet 2 and i'll tell you right now if you listen to the commentary on hatchet 1 when he talks about Hatchet 2 and like, oh, yeah, it's going to be, you know, uh, I got a whole thing planned out for the sequel. Uh, you know, that's why I zoom in on the pig head like like that. That falls up in the sequel. And, and Reverend Zombie has has a part, a bigger part in the sequel. And, you know, he sounded excited about it. She did not. She did not sound excited. And it was like more of like a uh, yeah, type thing. Um, and he, yeah. was at, he was taught he was kind of messing with her like. Like, um, because he wanted her to, he wanted the Mary Beth character to be nude in the sequel and she was like not having it and not really feeling it. And it was kind of jokey, but at the same time now knowing that they didn't cat, that she didn't come back. Like it kind of sounds like she wasn't really liking the horror much. And from what I understand, I remember Adam talking on one of his podcasts that there was actually, um, her family or friends or something advised her against doing the sequel because she's going to get stuck in a bubble as a horror actress. And she didn't want that. Um, Oh God. Yeah. So one of those, what's wrong with that? Come on. Yeah. So when Adam called Daniel Harris to offer her the role, she said, the first thing she said was admit you were wrong and I'll do it. (laughs) So he said, I was wrong. I should have casted you. Uh, so that's how he got Danielle. Now, nice. even to make that story more interesting, right? Danielle Harris was on an episode of the movie Crip where they did a commentary for Halloween 4. And mm-hmm. Adam said that he recently listened to the commentary of Halloween 4 on that old Anchor Bay edition uh, from around 2005. Where Danielle Harris said how much she wanted to do horror again. And she's so surprised that she hadn't done any horror since then. And if you look at her filmography, she wasn't mm-hmm. doing horror at all. Like she'd yeah, done right. one horror film since Halloween. And it turns out in legend? that commentary, she says, I actually was, I did read for a horror film recently. That's about the film. Uh, but I didn't get the part. And it turns out 
due to the timeline, Adam is like super sure that that film that she mentions in that commentary was Hatchet. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking super in depth storytelling. <laughs> Right there for me. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. That's cool. <laughs> so I, li- uh, I like I like being a listener on my own show. <laughs> um, but, but super uh, super cool to cast Danielle. Um, this was like you know Rob Zombie's Halloween just a couple years before this. Like she was like this was during the boom of like the horror renaissance with the actors oh, of yeah. yesteryear. Like. Yeah. Danielle was doing so many horror films. She, she did like Stakeland too during this time. Yeah, legitimate Scream Queen at this point. This is when horror conventions were booming, and it was just like a huge. I remember the. This is when I first started getting into YouTube. I remember how many mo- like wasn't it a movie like every week like Bill Mosley or uh, yep. you know Tyler Maine or Sid Hag or Danielle Harris or Tony Todd or any Ken uh, Foray, Ken Foray <laughs> like just yeah. left and right and left and right oh, they were everywhere for it, sure. it slowed down a lot now it definitely has yeah but um it was a, it was an interesting era cuz there was a lot of bad movies that came out during that time that just capitalized on names after they seen the mm-hmm. success of films like Hatchet but there was also other gems there too that that you know like you know Derek mentioned Stakeland and stuff. So uh, I, I like that they cast Daniel Harris for sure. Just another awesome horror actress. Horror mm-hmm. bitch yeah, she, in that film. Yeah, she does a good job in this film, man. She really does. Yeah, so do her eyebrows. <laughs> so her uh, eyebrows. Did you guys notice that? Like, I've always noticed that with Hatchet too. One of her eyebrows is way up, and the other is way low. It's a weird, I, like, I'm like, did she get punched in the face or something before filming? <laughs> <laughs> you never noticed that, Moods? No, I have noticed, but, like, I, I could never figure out if, like, that was purposely done to give her, like, a certain look or something. I don't know, man. It's weird. Uh, like, I, I how, how, can you fu- how could you fuck that up? Like, I mean, so you go to get your eyebrows done and they're just, like, completely uneven and fucked up and stuff. I always kind of looked at it like maybe she got really into this character and kind of, you know, shaped them. You know, like eyebrows make a they make a facial expression, right? You know, yeah, yeah. like a, like a like a happy one or a or a mad one or something like that. And you know, she's very intense in this film. There's not really a lot of, uh, you know, downtime with her character at all. Oh yeah, yeah she she gets she's tossed got a lot of anger. The fire man, she's well, gets... she's, she's a, yeah, she's angry through the, the whole thing. So maybe that was kind of the. Maybe that was kind of the point of she, making I, those you know, eyebrows. The shape of these eyebrows was done purposely. <laughs> who knows, man? <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't put a lot of merit into it, but who knows? Um. But. So she gets rescued by Jack Cracker, who we were briefly introduced into the first film, where they say, um, he dr- he drinks his own piss. <laughs> yeah. Take this. It's nice and drink this. It's nice and warm. Yeah, so that, that was a really funny joke. That actually wasn't even supposed to happen like that. Um, it was actually supposed to be where it was more of a direct, like, notice that he, like, peed in a cup or something along those lines. But yeah. they, at the, they didn't actually have a cup or something like that. <laughs> so they just used that. And uh, the it works perfect because she doesn't notice it. And she's putting it up to her face. And it was apple juice in the first film. It was Mountain Dew in the second film. I do know that. <laughs> awesome you know when the when, when hatchet 2 starts and yeah she's kind of you know in the water and stuff and then she ends up at that you know the house um on that the first time i watched hatchet 2 the sequel i was like what the fuck happened to ben yeah what did happen i was like I, I i was like what the fuck happened to him because like she was right there by the boat and his character isn't even introduced at all. Like we don't get to see him at all. And I was like, did fucking, did he get killed off screen? I was like, that's so fucked. And then it used to bug me. And then hatchet three <laughs> came out <laughs> and like totally made my fucking day. Yeah. <laughs> and the coolest things ever, but like, we'll get into that later, but that was yeah. one of the coolest shit. I was like, Oh my God, that's so fucking genius, man. So- I absolutely love that. Yeah, I was always like, what the, what the fuck happened to Ben? Yeah, we'll <laughs> definitely touch on that scene for sure. Uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, Mary Beth Dunstan um, is in Jack C- Cracker's house, and he's like, I tell him all the time they shouldn't go out there and stuff. You know, he's a doomsayer. <laughs> he's a crazy route. Yep. Yeah. And um, then she reveals who she is, and he's like, my God, you're Samson's girl? 
or whatever, and he like, flips out, out and she gets out, and she's like, yeah. I don't know what's going on. And then she's like, go, go see, see Reverend, Reverend Zombie. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Jack Cracker finds dude uh, from the first so film. Shapiro, Shapiro's... <laughs> His camera, okay. and that was pretty cool because we got a cameo from the two girls, the two dumb, dumb horse from the and Jenna, first yeah. one. Yeah, and that, that's neat. You know that that's a cool little. Uh, and, and, cameo. I just wondered, did it, did they shoot that specifically for part two, or did they have that footage? They shot the it for part two. They did it in Adam Green's uh, house in his bath in his shower. Oh, that's that's cool. Isn't the chick from? Isn't that one of the girls from Hollison in that footage too? She plays like the. The one girl, Mister, you're not. I'm 14. Why are yeah, you that's, following? Yeah, that's Laura Ortiz looking young as fuck. That's yeah. totally Laura Ortiz. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, she looks young as hell. She oh yeah, and then Cracker, he's like, oh, he's like, oh, that's just wrong. Yeah, <laughs> and then yeah. The, the girl who's like flips out, and he's like, she's like, she's like, I hope my dad sees this and stuff. That that girl was actually on Scream Queens, the reality show. I noted, I recognized her back in the day when I first seen that. Oh my god, really? Yeah. Um and aren't you my science teacher? Yeah. Yeah. Not that one, the other one. Um, oh yeah, I know. But, yeah, yeah, so um Adam Green uh actually when they were filming that, they didn't know what was gonna be on the camera, so he's just reacting to what Adam Green's telling him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's not actually watching any footage, the actor, uh John Carl Buchler. Yeah. Um but <laughs> yeah, so so he gets Victor Crowley. What did what did you guys think of that kill? Of what a crackers kill? Yeah, pretty it's awesome. pretty. It's pretty comical. I mean, <laughs> you probably he gets I like killed it. by his own intestines. <laughs> I love I like the it. intestines part. I love the the you know shadows and stuff. I fucking hate when his head pops off. It makes no sense. <laughs> and it does. I, I will there, return. Isn't there a stupid sound effect in there too? Yeah, and I if, will if return I to that time and time again in the hatchet sequence. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean. The yeah. gore, the realisticness of the gore takes a huge step down from part one to part two. Uh, it it wasn't actually done by John Carl Buechler in this one. It was done by his, like, understudies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that, sure. that makes sense. Because yeah. I was like, how, how the fucking same guy did the gore, but it's it's nowhere near as good. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, to me... Well, honestly, like, his intestine looks like a rope. I actually think the intestines look okay, but... Um, <laughs> Like it somebody... feels so solid. It feels like a solid rope. Like, you know, when you're watching something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can just kind of, like, feel the texture. You're like, ah, oh, no, that doesn't seem right. It yeah. just seems way too solid. I don't know. But... Yeah, well, maybe it's full of shit. <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> I mean. Uh... <laughs> so <laughs> after that, we get kind of a cool. Um, I thought this was a brilliant way to, like, open the film, like, the credit sequence. Where it's just mm-hmm. zooming around the swamp and it stops on all the carnage from part one. Absolutely love the opening credits in this film. Yeah, it has like yeah, dude's so jacket good. It's a, I... and dude's shirt and like dude's arms. The hat and yep. Perry Shin's hat. It. Yeah. And the ministry yeah. song playing. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I love that. The, and did you know that Adam, it was a, a suggestion of the DP, I believe, that... that uh, suggested they do that that they have oh. like the gore because like the, the the you know pieces of uh, familiar items and stuff like that yeah, yeah that was a cool way to just once again hammer in the fact that these are happening back to back like it's the same mm-hmm. night when it starts yep uh so daniel goes and finds reverend zombie who has a much bigger part in this one yeah he does um and my god thank god because tony todd is such an again with like robert england tony todd is so fucking underused man like he's fantastic in final destination he's fantastic in candy man like he's fantastic in all the shit that i've seen him in dude he's so good and he just did not get the amount of roles tony tony todd is a presence that's why he's he's so like he's he's honestly a scary person like you know for the people that have met him in real life they always say he's like the nicest guy ever but yeah but he's actually a present and he's got a great voice. Um, he, yeah. He's perfect in these type of roles, man. It's believable. You kind of, you get involved in it, man. You know, it's like, yeah. oh yeah. You just want to listen to everything he says, man. He's perfect. He's His episode mm-hmm. in season one of Holliston is fucking hilarious too. <laughs> yeah, it is. And <laughs> so, yeah. Adam yeah. has told the story of, uh, of uh, Tony Todd and his acting, how it's such a unique thing. 
uh, I believe he told it in Holliston where he said that he just came in the room and started picking up all kind of shit and just doing weird stuff. And they're like, what the, and everybody's looking like, what the fuck is this guy? Is this guy serious? Like he's like doing, like not acting at all. And like, he does that for a take or something. And then he like, then he's in character and um, (laughs) he just, he has these very unique ways of doing it. Um, like Adam tells a story that he was asking all like, like where did Reverend zombie grow up and what's his, and who's his parents and, and where, where did he come from and how long has he been doing this and asking all this backstory stuff. And I think that stuff really matters when you're portraying a character, you know, like it, 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 it like that subconscious level of like who he is, you know what I mean? Cause mm. all those things define who we are. And there's actually a funny story that Adam tells where Tony Todd gets so into his character that he texts him at like two in the morning one night. And he's like, he's like, Hey Adam, do you think that Reverend zombie knows magic? And he's like, no, no, Tony, like Reverend Zombie is a con artist. He, he's fake. He's a phony. And he's like, oh, okay. He's like, do you think that Reverend Zombie thinks that he knows magic? And he's like, no, no, he's, he's just a con artist. And he's like, okay. He's like, but do you think it would be okay if people thought that Reverend Zombie thought that he knew magic <laughs> or something like that <laughs> and he's like yeah Tony that's cool that's cool <laughs> that's great that's so cool. <laughs> that's good shit man. that's good shit <laughs> good <laughs> stuff though like cause it just shows the the, the, the uh, expertise and the professional nature of Tony Todd that he takes it that serious you know what I mean mm-hmm. 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 So, I mean, there's a ton of people in this one. Yeah. Yeah, there really is. Um, So basically what we got here, we got Daniel Harris kind of escapes the, uh, the bayou, makes her way to, uh, to the Reverend's place and where Tony taught or Reverend zombie basically proceeds to tell, which, you know, in my opinion, man, it's a little redundant that, that they repeat pretty much the entire story and they all obviously throw in other you know little tidbits of information into the story but i always found like the retelling of you know basically the the whole story was unnecessary i mean you could do it in bits and pieces but see and we're in part two we just need the other we need the other bits of the story it obviously comes out and stuff you know we get the infidelity and you know do you exact, think it would have flowed the, right though if they didn't tell it again and added the stuff i just feel i just feel like when he tells the story considering if you actually think about it because when when reverend zombie tells the story to to mary beth mary beth had literally told that story to everyone in in the first one so he's kind of like telling her the exact same story that she just finished telling not a couple hours before of course we we get the new information in things yeah yeah i mean I, I, i I just didn't feel like they needed to tell the whole story. I, I wish they had to just kind of went into it and went, okay, you know, the short and long of it, you know, you're, you know, uh, Samson's daughter, you're connected to this. Uh, they explain the infidelity. I like the actual, you know, the parts where they kind of beef up the story and stuff with the infidelity. And that's maybe yeah, the that's real reason. Yeah, that's great I, stuff. I love that aspect of this They, they really put and, – and those aspects are really cool. And then, and then we learn more about, uh, yeah, like her family's involvement and why, you know, exactly – these things are going on and shit. It's cool, but I just felt like the the retelling of the whole story was so redundant. I was like, Jesus Christ! Especially yeah, when you watch it, the it, back. It can't to be back. longer than four minutes, can it? It's, it it really isn't. But when you watch the films back to back, it's like you just heard it. Yeah, you know, and then and then you hear it again, and it's like a it's a full story. Although I do like when they tell the story because there's a lot of kills and a lot of shit that's going on in there and stuff. That's like, where most of the body count comes from. Is the back. Yeah. Story. yeah. Well, in the first, yeah, in the first like fifty minutes of the film, actually, those are all the kills. There isn't even a kill until about fifty-four minutes into the film. Yeah, exactly. So that wasn't part of a backstory. So this, this one, you know, okay, we get the story and stuff, and which I really do enjoy. I, I love how they threw those little tidbits in there. I, and I, shit. I it, love that great. story because it, it's yeah. not what you would expect, right? It, it is not no, it what isn't. you expect at all. They kind of put this emotional attachment onto it, like you know the the real reason why Mister Crowley was you know, out there and it, it wasn't, you know, to hide uh, Victor's deformities. It was to hide his own shame because he was, he wasn't true to his wife and stuff. And yeah. yeah. And who would have known that fucking Victor Crowley's a bro. That, and, and that's where I was getting at. And, and, and add to it, he's like half black. Yeah. That's pretty so crazy. crazy. Like they throw this fucking story there. And you're like, damn, that's crazy. He's, like he's Debo he out there because he felt 
shitty about his infidelity to, towards his wife and stuff. It wasn't the fact that Crowley was you know born with all these skeletal deformities and shit. I thought that was brilliant. That's yeah, a, that's yeah. a really I, I thought it was super well and interesting story. Yeah, it was super yeah. well acted too because you have you have this woman who is dying of cancer mm-hmm. and they have a maid who's a black woman. Yeah. And Victor Crowley, or, or Thomas Crowley, you know, uh, yeah. Victor Crowley's Kate father, yeah. um, begins to have an affair with her while, and, and you know he feels bad about it, like, because he, he cries on her shoulder right after, you know what I mean? Like, but it's, uh-huh. he's still doing that at the same time while she's on her deathbed. And whether he was just looking for comfort or what, it's still, you know, kind of wrong. So it adds this depth to, to and, that character. And, then, and they're not even, like, in the like, different rooms, like, in the same room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Might have been a mistake. And I she- think the emotion was captured quite well. I think, the, you know, Thomas Crowley, he feels quite shitty. And I, I think that he never really strays away from that in the storytelling. Yeah. I think you actually legitimately feel bad for him, too. Because, I mean, let's face it, man. Your wife's dying. Like, she is going to die. You know, if she if she did die, then he's and then he did these things. You know, he obviously wouldn't feel as bad. But the fact that she's living, mm-hmm. I think it's all captured quite well in the story. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you really know, do. she curses the baby, and I like when they're when they say like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, when Victor Crowley was born, like the swamp stood still and the, the wildlife died or something, and like the whole yeah, yeah. swamp wept or something. I it was just it, and how it you know the camera work where they show it just dead water like I, that was really done well. yeah mm-hmm. so, and then then dude's uh baby mama even gets killed after she she just dies when she sees victor Crowley. <laughs> yeah 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 so that was part of the curse too i i would assume but um so you know reverend zombie kind of has a, a unique thing here because at the end of the day, he's a con artist. He wants money. That's all he cares about. And when he hears this, he thinks that he ha- he knows a way to rid Victor Crowley of the Honey swamp, Island which swamp, would yeah. then make his business boom and he would make money again. Uh, so he enlists the help of all these hunters and fishermen in the town, um, making sure to bring two specific people, which is uh, Daniel Harris's uncle, played by oh, yeah. Tom Holland. Tom Holland. And mm-hmm. uh, another guy who um, I forget his name. You guys know his name? R.A. Mavilov. Yeah, he played Leatherface in Chainsaw Three. Yeah, which I believe Kane Hodder stunted in. Hmm. Um. So yeah, I mean that that's kind of interesting. You also have Perry Shen back, uh, which his reveal is hilarious, right? Hmm. Yeah. You're um, like, first time I watched it, I'm like, what? <laughs> Dude, I laughed so fucking... I was like, oh my god, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we can't forget Adam Green, who uh, was at the beginning laying on a sidewalk, like, with throw up everywhere. Puking. Puking. Yeah, yeah. puking. So, uh, Perry mm. Shen this time has a French accent. Just just to add one l- a little extra thing of the joke, you know what I mean? Yeah. And he's wearing, like, one of those little French artist hats. <laughs> yeah, he plays... Uh, <laughs> he plays... Um, Justin, this Justin, time, which is the brother Sean's, of Sean. Sean, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They're either twins or all Asians look the same. <laughs> yeah, which which they do touch on in the third one, which is the funniest joke of them all. <laughs> yeah, um, you got Tom Holland, uh, AJ Bowen's in this film. Nice to see him. I like AJ L- Bowen. Little little on screen cameo by Lloyd Kaufman is one of the yeah hunters. Lloyd Kaufman. That's right, there. man. Yeah. Um, Fucking stuffs the cookie in his shirt and then <laughs> like, it's so like Kaufman, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Good yeah. stuff. Um, what do you guys think of Vernon? Um, oh, who's that? Colton Dunn? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's all right. He's all right. I mean, he's not, honestly, man, he's not as good as uh, um, Mar- Mar- Marcus. Yeah, as, as Marcus in the first film, to be honest, but yeah, he's all I mean, right. did you notice that? Um, th- this is something that uh, Adam Green does a lot, but most of these characters' names are ba- are names of his friends. Yeah, oh, really? yeah, like uh, I mean, ton- tons of them. Like Dunstan is Marcus is is Marcus Dunstan, and and the the character Sean off of Sean Ashmore. Uh, if you go even further, like Sean Ashmore's name was Joe Lynch and Frozen, and of course Joe Lynch is his fucking friend. Like, like he does that a lot. He does that yeah. a lot, a lot. 
Um, but there's tons of people cameoing. Uh, Mike Mendez is in this film. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of the crew, Lloyd Kaufman, of course, uh, Marcus Dunstan, Sean Ashmore has a credit. Uh, just tons and tons and tons and tons of uh, horror actors and, and just, you know, people who work with Adam a bunch, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked the character of Vernon. I thought he was funny. I liked his, uh, well, later on, the interaction with, like, uh, what's the other guy's name? The the silent one? I actually don't know his or... name. Mm, John? I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. Something, something rather. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah when they're, like... <laughs> Good. Like, later on, when they're, like, just talking and punching each other. <laughs> yeah, that, that's funny. I've seen that done in a bunch of movies, though. Yeah. But you know, this is where this is where this film right here I I have a problem with. You know, this one right here, you know, I, I love how they expand on the story, you get to find out all these things and stuff. Um I'm not really crazy about, you know, the actual pacing to this film. I think it takes so long to get going. You know, after they gather all these people and they have this meeting. Then they go on the know, boat. They, through, they yeah, they go through all these things, they get on the boats and then they finally get out there and stuff. I mean, really, I mean this movie is like what eighty five minutes, and nothing, none of the action really starts until about fifty four minutes into the film. It's crazy, man. There's so much build up to this. I mean, even though the last like half an hour of the film delivers quite, you know, quite immensely, really. See, um, um that's where I, I actually am completely different. I actually do not like the last act of this film that much. I think all the kills are silly and ridiculous, and I I don't like them. Uh, I don't like blood that sprays like the. Psh, psh, psh. Yeah. It, it takes me out of movies every time. I actually like when they're all in the room and they're all conversating, and you have that scene where the one dude's like, lo, like, uh, what, who is this Victor Collie dude? He's like, he's like, he's a lo- local legend, and and he's like, you mean like a Jason Voorhees? And he's like, yeah, something like that. And he's like, oh, back in my town, Green Meadows, we had this guy named Leslie Vernon. And I thought that was so yeah, they, cool that they threw. No, I, I like those things. I like those things too, for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, those are you know minorly entertaining and stuff. But I just feel this one takes forever to get going. I, I really don't mind the third act. I mean, I understand where you're coming from and stuff. I guess I've just watched a lot of uh, Asian films that have that kind of blood spray. Same <laughs> you know? here, man. You see that all the fucking times. So it's just kind of comical, but. Uh, I don't. This one just it takes so long to get going, man. It's just like, oh my god. I, think I just, just think things are through. happening though. Like, like, uh, like while we're waiting though, like things are happening. Like you have the interactions between Vernon and Mary Beth, where he's like, he's like, why don't you turn that smile frown upside down? And he's like, oh, Vernon, make out with me, and she's like, what? Right here, all on this boat in front of everybody. And then, you know, and he's like, Todd Reverend Zombie. <laughs> Voodoo magic, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, um, well, I surely didn't come here for a date or whatever. Like, I don't know. What, and, what about the what about that couple's relationship in the film? Ooh, AJ, AJ Bowen Bowen. and the girl didn't care for it. That that is a that's big point that, for me. That's one thing I just I've never I find it so it's it's like irresponsible. I don't but, know why you, you know why throw this he did in it, there. Though, it's, right? There is a why? purpose because, um. They wanted to have a sex scene, and how do you have a sex? You can't just have two random people just randomly having sex. You, that doesn't you, make sense. You have to you create have, an establish a relationship between them. Why they would what, have man, sex but, in a swamp? This, <laughs> this is the type of film that I, even if there was no sex scene in the film, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have cared. It, it didn't bother me one bit. It wasn't about you know camping in the woods and uh you know having sex and shit like that it, no, it just... I, I don't think it's sex scenes needed either but it was for the purpose of yeah. that kill which i don't think i i think when yeah, the I head get... comes off and it's the body starts <laughs> like that is kind of funny oh, honestly oh, oh, oh. and she's like oh my and then she's like she's like what like she starts banging on him and she's like what the hell <laughs> yeah oh, it done so, she said something about done so or something like that she's like, yeah. tell me you love me more than ice cream that shit is funny Tell me you love me more than baby Jesus. And he's like, nah, duh, about the same. <laughs> like, that right, shit, who is, talks like that that? shit is who funny, though. Talks like, that, that? I, like, that was funny shit. Like, it's I hate better. that. That's... I don't really care for the scene as a whole, but, like, th- there's moments yeah. in that scene that yeah, it's... I can't stand that whole relationship. It drives me nuts. I think it's totally unneeded. I mean, they could have done something else at the time and have that. It, it was pointless. I, I, I like, like Cletus and Dunstan. Yeah, see, like, I like those two's conversations where they're like, you know, like, 
um, he's he's driving. He's like he's like, what'd you bring that for or something? He's like, in case I get laid or something. And then she's he's like, with who? And she's like, her. Sorry. <laughs> and she's just standing right there, <laughs> like that's just that guy's a dick, man. He's just like he's just shooting fucking gators for no reason. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing, dude? Fuck. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. I which I thought in itself was kind of funny too. It's like, you know, they're out there and they're you know they're trying to look for. Victor Crowley and shit, and this guy's just fucking blasting guns away, like, <laughs> like, try, you're not trying to be a little, uh, you know. Yeah, well, he doesn't be believe in Victor that. Crowley either, because he even says, yeah. like, if I even thought, no, I don't, if I really I don't, thought, for, if even a sure. shadow of a doubt that I thought, I wouldn't be out here. <laughs> They never had a scene where it was like, dude, shut the fuck up, stop shooting your fucking guns, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But yeah, uh, he's like, I'm going gator hunting. Fuck this. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's blasting gators and shit. Fuck. Yeah, uh, I, I like the interactions between the characters, man. I, I really do. Be, minus the one that you mentioned, Moods, because I'm not crazy about that one either. AJ Bowen and and the Lexus chick. Um, she mm-hmm. felt out of place. She didn't really feel like she belonged there. Um, and he was. I like AJ Bowen, but I just th- there was not there was not an interesting. I actually like fucking Tom Holland, <laughs> Uncle Bob. Oh yeah, Tom Holland's cool. Um, when he's like, when, in, when later in, when they're before they go to the, the Mary Beth goes to the, the shop again and they're talking, he's like, Reverend Zombie said, why the fuck you keep calling him Reverend Zombie? His fucking name's Clive Washington. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, fucking, oh my God. Like, Danielle Harris is so fucking tiny, dude. Like, and you really notice that when she stands next to Candyman himself, Tony Todd. Oh, like, yeah. dude, he's, he's <laughs> so he's huge, but she's so tiny compared to him, dude. And he's got this giant bone staff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, one of my other gripes with this that I I find kind of a plot hole is once the reveal was made that oh shit, like because the whole idea is that Tony Todd wants to bring, you know, because Samson in the first film Robert England was already killed. He was one of the boys that caused Victor Crowley's death and and um the other two was his brother which uh allegedly is her uncle right makes sense yeah which is played by tom holland and the other one is the guy who played leatherface in Chainsaw trent. Three, trent. Yeah. trent so his yeah. idea is he brings them both there victor Crowley kills him the revenge he gets revenge and he goes away uh but there's a reveal that shows that oh turns out that her real uncle died of um Leukemia. leukemia and yeah. this dude is actually not her real uncle but her father's he, he, best friend yeah now my biggest he, he was just problem an uncle in name yeah <laughs> is no way shape or form in hell does tom holland's character seem like he would be best friends with robert england's character am i right you know i never even thought of that before <laughs> <laughs> like I honestly, uh, yeah, I, 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 I never actually thought of that myself. Like it's hard enough to That's believe that that was her father and brother, and Danielle is so much different than her them that she yeah. even cares about them that much. You know what I mean? It seems like like I know it's their father and brother and stuff, but they seem so different. Um, mm-hmm. They just seem like Hicks, you know, like shitty poaching Hicks, mm-hmm. and uh, she's. You know, like so, it, there is that. You know, like <laughs> mm-hmm. I've always. I do like that whole. Sure. I like that whole storyline, though. Like you know, with uh, with Reverend Zombie, just kind of coming up with this theory that you know, if you kill, um, if Victor Crowley gets his revenge on the people that were responsible for his death, that it would stop the curse and stuff. Because it was, it wasn't actually a bona fide thing, though. I, right? They did. They did give you like a little hint of it, like in a certain scene, like. Well, like when, what do you mean by it wasn't a bona fide thing? Was it just a theory that he came up with that was potentially the actual thing, or did, how did he know this? Well, it, it we don't. The thing that I like about it is you don't know that it didn't, wouldn't have worked, right? Well, that's the well, thing because there I might understand not be his one motives. way to get his rid of motives him. were yeah, his motives were completely personal. You know, like go out there and this might actually work, but it turns out it it kind of kind of was you know and like but for like the longest time i'm going did he just come up with this theory and it actually was potentially the actual way that you're going to kill victor crowley yeah i mean it could <laughs> or, be it could be because or, um he is a repeater he just thought of it what's that the Derek? way that the way the way that tony todd's character is in the, the film he probably did just maybe like 
Maybe this will work, and he just actually really believed it See, after I'd a like while. To think that Tony Todd's That's why I asked because he's a con man. I would like to think that Tony Todd's smarter than that, and he wouldn't. And he's so sneaky that he wouldn't put himself in in that much danger if he didn't know that it would work. So I think that he knows a lot about these repeaters, and there it's you know he is in yeah. voodoo shit. So he yeah, probably so. has... see. It was hard to believe though. It was hard to believe that he actually came up and, you know, figured this work. But I understand that the aspect of he would never put himself in danger if he truly believed that this wasn't going to work. He obviously yeah. thought it was going to work, but it was like, but he was a con man. But he was, a, yeah. and that's well, where he it's hard them to believe. Into going out there, but what, what reason would he go? Where's the con if he goes out there and he can't stop Victor Crowley? Like, what's the point well, of doing that at all? Well, who knows? I mean, he, he yeah. figured maybe he could escape and prove that it's all real and make fame off that and shit. Who knows? I, I, from what I got from the backstories and, and the commentaries and stuff that I listened to is mm-hmm. is Tony Todd is into this shit. Even though he is a con man, he uses it as a tool. But he is actually yeah, yeah. into all the voodoo. And he does know a lot about the repeating thing because that does prove to be true. So if he knows that much, then he might know more about how to stop him as well. Mm-hmm. And I just I, always it, thought that it was like a random guess that actually turned into being the real thing. You know, it was yeah. like this, this, this actually seems very logical. Well, well you know, in he that gets the revenge, case, he kills off these I people. Mean, it's like, it, I, I mean, you really, can't say that it's a random guess though. Right. Because he, it's not random, but yeah, it definitely makes sense. I mean, I don't really, think he knew for sure that it would work, story, but yeah. he had a good hunch and it turned out his good mm-hmm. hunch was true. Yeah. 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 No, but, it's still cool. I, I really I like that aspect of the story. I think that's fantastic. I think it's one of the coolest things about part two is just incorporating that rule, you know, mm-hmm. and it kind of gets you thinking. So I think that's one of the coolest things about it. I, I think it's awesome. I think uh, that I, Victor Crowley looks the worst in this one out of the three. What do you guys think? Yeah, about that? I, I, me too. And, that, and I mentioned this in the first review that, yeah, he does look different in all the films. And I think this one, he definitely does. He looks yeah. different. Apparently, they couldn't mm-hmm. get the hair. His right. nose? His hair and his his bridge on his nose is all fucky too. It looks different, like it's not in depth or something. I don't know. There was something weird going on in that that facial air or that part of the face for me. Yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was mm, as good as uh, I think three is my favorite look for him. <clears throat> yeah, me but, too. Uh, three is definitely the best he looks. But um, yeah, so. Um, I, you know, th- this film to me, I-, I used to like this one the most, but, um, I, I do think that it definitely has its issues. Uh, I yeah, think that's interesting. That's, that's interesting. You used to like this one the most. I actually, when, you know, it took a little bit for the third one to come out, but, uh, I always liked the first one over the second one. Yeah. When it was just the two films. Oh yeah. Big time. Yeah. Oh, you know what else is another really cool thing in this film? Actually, when, when, uh, uh, Daniel Harris's character, Mary Beth, is talking to what, her uncle or whatever, Tom Holland. Um, is she's fucking wearing a Twisted Sister shirt. It's totally awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. so out of green, right? Yeah, yeah. There's actually a big story behind that, but I don't know. All, I don't remember all the details. <laughs> Dude, there, there apparently is a story behind every comment that we make. <laughs> there, there's, that, that's how Adam Green thinks, and that's why I've always been a huge fan of him. I've said that many mm. times because he reminds me of myself – uh, in in terms of like how I just love how there's all these different reasons why things happen and, and just like I don't know he's just real into making things come full circle and and you know have he he has thought process behind why he does things that's good oh, filmmaking for sure. you know what yeah. I mean um, and it shows I might not always shows. agree with it uh, because there are moments in in the films that I disagree with like and one mm-hmm. specifically in part three. And more so in part two where um, he said that he made this one, you know, he made this one for the fans and stuff and gave the fans what they wanted. And I think that that's true to the most case. For some reason, people do cheer when there's big fountains of blood and stuff. But Mm -hmm. I find it lame as fuck. Like, I hate it. Um, And I feel like all the kills look cartoony in this one. Like, nearly all of them. I do like the double chainsaw kill, though. That th- that chainsaw that is absolutely chainsaw ridiculous. That chainsaw is fucking huge. I it's ridiculous. Said, okay. And it's kind of funny to think about it because it, <laughs> yeah, it couldn't have been modern. Like, you know, it would have been like an old school chainsaw. That thing, fuck that. <laughs> Who has a chainsaw like that? <laughs> it's like the funniest thing ever, man. And, uh, uh, his signature and, and the, sand grinder. Okay, is it just me with the power sander or 
like i mean because the story is taking place back did they have like wireless power satters okay, and stuff so like that I, there's a story behind that too because so, i was wondering i was watching the film again i started laughing i'm like how in the fuck does he have power with this thing okay, man? so <laughs> if you pay attention yes um yeah so one is of the it? things in uh, the in the script they had and the, the sanders in the first film too um, and in the second film, and yeah. in the third film. It's yeah. kind of his weapon besides the hatchet. And he actually only kills one person with the hatchet in the first film. It's the first kill. Um, mm-hmm. But they had in the script that he kills with it. Because Adam was thinking of like power tools, obviously. Like, what haven't I seen? I've never seen a belt sander kill. Okay, let's do a belt sander kill. Then all of a sudden he was like, wait a fucking minute. Why would there be fucking a belt sand? Like, where's he plugging this shit in at? And then he's like decided to scrap it all together. But then like the special effects dudes was like, yeah, I, I can't like, he started doing research. He's like, yeah, there's no fucking such thing as a gas powered belt sander. Um, but he said, if I can make one that actually functions like a real belt sander and actually works and you can use to, to sand things, we'll use it. And he did, he fucking made one that works. So, so that's why they decided to use the belt sander. And it turned out to be a good choice because people like that. Uh, another thing from the first one that I forgot to mention is when they come to the woods and they start look. There's a scene where they start looking at the trees and like some, some they kind of cut a lot of it, but apparently like there was hatchet marks in all the trees, and like the characters are like looking at it before they see Victor Crowley and stuff, and they're like, oh, what's all this? And then one of the like dudes on the one of the like DPs or something was like, we so why why is he chopping the trees? And he's like, oh, yeah, good point. And he's like, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> like, cause he was like, he couldn't get the, the lighting right to capture that the trees are chopped. And he's like, this isn't working. He's like, and the dude, the lighting guy is like, so wait, why, why is he chopping the trees? And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like so, <laughs> that's the greatest question ever. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah, fuck that. So <laughs> Let's move uh, on. That's hilarious, man. So, yeah, the, the, the belt sander kill in Hatchet 2 I actually like, though. Like, Dude, it's so brutal. It's yeah. awesome. I love it. Yeah. It's awesome. But you know who's deaf, man? It's just – it literally brings tears to my eyes. It's so funny. <laughs> it's Tony Todd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, like, you got to be fucking kidding the me. The way that he just – he, like, literally shreds him. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and then, like, rips – oh, my God, that death is just so it, – it's very and comic book because it's so – and then throws the body at the end, but he like <laughs> he like rips him out of his own skin. Like, it's like ridiculous. Like in Fuck. the facial expression, like of the muscles. Like, uh. Oh my god, <laughs> that thing is so funny looking, man. It's crazy. So it's pretty uh, gory though. I mean, the kills in this film are pretty damn gory. Yeah, you gotta it's, admit. Yeah. it's shitty gore. It's not great. Yeah. I yeah. I personally don't like it. I mean, there's so, I like I like maybe like two kills in the entire film because they're just too. They're too fake looking, too like rubbery, too like prosthetic looking, um, too much spray. Like you literally hear blood, blood sprays, like hose sprays. Like I hate that. Oh, I know. <laughs> but you even see it sputter a few times yeah, too, right? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe like a oh, gas oh, fart. I had, like, had a little bit of air in the lines there. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that's the thing that I talk about where I disagree with Adam, where like – he makes those kills look like that on purpose so that they're not mean spirited and they're more fun. And I'm like, I don't like that. I like, I, what, like to me, like what, Tony it's Todd's death wasn't mean spirited. It's, it's, it's <laughs> serious. Gross him. Oh my God. <sighs> so, um, yeah. Uh, well, you guys want to go into ratings? Sure. Yeah. I'll go first. Right. Yeah. Hatchet two. I really like how they dwelled more into the, like the bad, I sort of Thomas Crowley's character and what uh, his whole character was about with like uh, uh, the infidelity stuff and the addition of adding more Tony Todd in the film was really good. I really like Tony Todd as like this way of moving where he's introduced when he's doing like his big speech, like we do in his like hand singles and the little like weird voodoo dance that he does, which is really cool. And another thing that I had to say, though, I do agree with Moves with some of the pacing issues of this film. I do think they spent a little too much time on the boat, even though I do like some scenes on it, like with uh, uh, what's uh, the black guy's name again? Vernon. Vernon. Yeah, Vernon. 
Fern, I like like his interaction with like uh, Mary Beth and uh, Reverend Zombie and Uncle Bob. I like Tom Holland in the film, and just I uh, do think the kills are kind of like the worst of the series in this one. Kind of like cartoony, like JP said. So I'm just going to give it like a solid like seven out of ten. <clears throat> yeah, this film um, has always been what it is to me. It, I've never really kind of fluctuated on this film to my. I just feel like the first film is so much better than this one, uh, with pacing in every aspect and stuff. I just wish that the pacing was done better in this one. Um, to be honest, you know, the kills and the gore and the cartoony stuff at the end doesn't really bother me a whole lot. I actually find it very entertaining. It, it makes me laugh, so it doesn't really bother me a whole lot. Um, you know, I, I have fun with it. I mean, the belt standard thing, knowing that story now, which it, which is pretty funny because it, it makes me laugh every time I watch this. I'm like, how the fuck is he using this thing? <laughs> doesn't even make sense. <laughs> uh, it's just hard to believe that, you know, that – you know, they even had belt sanders anyways. I, I don't know <laughs> what's up with that. But, uh, but yeah, th- I th- the best thing about this film is the elevation of the story. Adding in all those little things, man, with the backstory and shit and, and creating more depth in the story is just really what this one seems to be about uh, before you get the finale of uh, Hatchet 3. It's kind of like – it, it feels like a total build-up piece to me. It's a, it's the, a precursor to Hatchet 3. It, it really is. It, it's just – that's why it's kind of, you know, a little bit slower and stuff and – you know, I, I get that and stuff, but this one, man, I don't know, man. It's definitely one that I just – I could probably do without – there's so many it's kind of subplots and things in this one that I just never cared for. I absolutely hate the relationship thing. It's just such garbage. I think the characters aren't as fun as the first film either. Um, it, it For me, it, it's quite a big step down you know, from the first one. I still enjoy this film for what it is, but I don't think it's great by any means. I'm, I'm giving them six and a half out of ten. Uh, yeah, me personally, I, I agree with some of the things they said, um, because I, it is true that the characters aren't as fun. I still do think a lot of them are fun. I just feel that there's so many of them in this movie. Like, the kills are literally doubled in this film, um, mm-hmm. because the old slasher, you know, how do you make a slasher sequel? Well, you double the kills. So, the Adam mm-hmm. had that in mind when he went in. And I think that you don't have time to spend and really flesh out the characters like you did the first one. I still think for as little time as we spend with them, they do actually are pretty unique. Um, just not unique enough to really make them up on par with the first film. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I do like some of the interactions. Like the Leslie Vernon thing I thought was super cool. Um, oddly enough, uh, the director of before Behind the Mask, um, when Adam asked if he could do that, he said, yeah, absolutely. And then when he made, he was writing before the mask, the prequel, the, the prequel sequel remake that never came out that might actually get made this year. Apparently uh, there's actually a further continuity between those two characters that is supposedly in that script. Um, wow. That ties them together a little bit more, or at least a little another nod, which is pretty interesting. Uh-huh. Like it would be pretty cool to see a Leslie Vernon versus Victor Crowley. I can, I can picture it now, right? Like Leslie Vernon, um, is all about being the next level type slasher killer guy. Like that's his passion. That's his dream. And he could even reference like the fact that the two big bad ones that went against each other was Freddie and Jason. And like, that could be his next move. You know what I mean? Um, right. Shit writes itself. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I, I have issues with the later half of the film. I, I actually like the stuff on the boat I, it, minus that sex scene and that build up. I like the characters interactions. I like when they're in the the room with the cookies. Do we have more, do we have milk? Uh and he's like no. <laughs> no milk. He words it, you know. That shit's funny. Uh-huh. Um I like Danielle Harris in this one a lot. Like she she seems just utterly just fucking pissed and defeated and and you know just just you know just fucking a, a lot of different emotions going on through through this film. Um yeah, uh I do like Hatchet 2 a lot, but um, I'm going to come a little higher than those guys. I give it a 7.5 out of 10. Well, Q, Q. All right. Um, jumping into 2013 with Hatchet 3, directed by BJ McDonnell. Yeah. Of course. Uh, who was Adam the Green. camera operator yep. on the first? Oh, he was the DP on the... 
No, he actually was the guy holding the camera. Oh, he was actually the camera guy. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, and of course, Hatchet 3 takes place right after the events of Part 2, which would be somewhere in the early morning, I guess. Um, yeah. A search and recovery team heads into the haunted mm-hmm. swamp to pick up the pieces and... And Mary Beth learns the secret to the ending, the voodoo curse that has left Victor Crowley haunting and terrorizing Honey Island Swamp for decades. Yes. Yeah. So yes. Um, Adam Green did not direct this one. Uh, I believe he was busy like with Holliston and, and a lot of other shit and they were going to make it. Um, I'm not sure if he always planned it to be a trilogy or not. Uh, I know he planned a sequel, but I'm not 100% sure that he actually planned a trilogy. Um, but, uh, he did, he did want to, if they were going to make it, he wanted to make sure that it was somebody in house that, that directed it. And it was like a promotion with BJ McDonald, who's shot films for Adam in the past and, and has worked on, on all the films. And, and for the most part, all, all three of these films are the same cast, the same crew, um, Uh lighting, like all the departments, producers, like they're, it's, it's really the same crew that almost, you know, almost you know 10 10 years later from the initial start of when they started um writing and and pushing hatchet uh you know it's pretty cool pretty cool that that many people and you could tell too man because all three films pretty much have the same look and feel to them so they did a really good job with that too it's good and you know me with that you know sometimes the third film doesn't really match up to the first two three mothers trilogy so are they like (laughs) Or if some if a director directed a whole series and the one dude directed a last part of it and then yeah. looks like a totally different film. Yeah. yeah. And and if you watch the features, Adam is always on set. So um mm-hmm. he was definitely there like you know, the whole time. And he wrote the film, so um yeah, I mean it, it's interesting that he cho- that he wasn't able to direct it or chose not to or whatever. Um but uh, we do. It is. It is more. It, it does feel a lot of the same. Uh, so I love the ending of Hatchet Two. We didn't talk about that, like the final shot. Um, but it picks up with Mary Beth over Victor Kali after she just shot it, like splattered his brains, right? Yeah. And then she yeah, dismembers she him, dem- <laughs> demolishes his face. Like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 So she she wanders into the police station and uh, she's covered in blood, holding a gun. Oh. I believe Holding the Shining scalp. twins oh. have a cameo up in there. Is that, do I don't know. Do they? Uh, Who is the Shining twins? They might. I thought I'm they not were. Sure. I'm not sure. I have no. I don't think so. I don't know. No. I knew one to me. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I learned something new about Hatch every day. It might not be. I, I thought. I don't. Was. I don't know. I don't think it is, but, but, uh, yeah. So Daniel Harris basically makes her way to the police station, where she, she had run in with the sheriff, who is Billy from Gremlins, Zach Gallagher himself. I know, right? It's like so random. <laughs> Zach Gallagher. I wonder how like where'd that come from? The casting mm-hmm. for Zach Gallagher. It's crazy. Um, I but ultimately, was, I think he was friends with Zach. Not yeah. sure exactly, or he became so. So ultimately, Mary Beth walks in the police station. She's got a piece of uh, <clears throat> Victor Crowley in her hand, uh, like scalped him, kind of mm-hmm. thing. She's covered in blood, got a gun. She gets arrested, obviously, and uh, yeah, that's where your story takes starts out again. So I, I, you know, this one right here. I remember when this one first came out. Everyone was so disappointed. They're like, "Oh man, like Daniel Harris is in the police station the whole film and blah blah blah." And I'm like, "What the fuck? Did, what were people watching, man? She was, like, she's basically in there for a half an hour of the film before she gets released by uh, Caroline Williams' character Amanda, the reporter. Yeah. It's like, but all that stuff is actually quite interesting. You know, like how, you know. Like how she's all interested and how she wants to prove that Victor Crowley's all real and stuff, and she needs 
you know, and, and like how the story pro- progresses itself too. Like, I mean, all that stuff is needed in the story. Like, I, I don't understand why people have problems with it. Yeah. I whatsoever. love that stuff, man. I, Me I too. love yeah, it. Like, 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 like w- that's her story. That's Daniel. Ha- that's Mary Beth's story. It, it why does yeah. it have to be? She's in the swamp again the very next day. Like, like, no, that's stupid. It doesn't make sense. Like it, it has to, yeah. has to have a fucking reason to go back and, and, exactly. and it, it builds and it builds. And then that moment when she's there, and she doesn't want to fucking go because she's done with it. She's she 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 got her revenge. If it didn't work, it didn't work. If it did, it did. It's it, you know. There's nothing more to prove at that point mm-hmm. for her. Uh-huh. See, at, the, at this point in the film, you know, Daniel Harris thinks that she's actually killed Victor Crowley, and she's talking to Amanda. Amanda wants to get her story from her, which is really cool. She doesn't want anything to do with her. She keeps calling her a fucking bitch and stuff, which is actually really funny. Not to um, mention the, that she barely yeah. slept in three days. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So she's True. yeah, she's on it. That's she's not on even edge. a plot thing. Like, at, like that's actually like Adam intentionally, like has our character play that way. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And uh, so basically, you know, they of course they sent out a team to go and check out the uh, the bayou, and they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a fucking massacre out here. So they they want to charge her with all these murders and stuff, and then people start getting killed again, which allows the story to progress itself. Um, uh, after mm. Sheriff Fowler starts getting the word that, yeah, shit's going down in there again. So she obviously can't be responsible for these murders. Uh, and um, then the one thing leads to another. They figure out that, you know, there is a way that they can actually oh, defeat Victor Crowley, which yeah. I love. Car- Carolyn Williams, and, yeah. um, who, by the way, is definitely channeling her inner stretch from Chainsaw 2. Yeah. Uh, man, yeah. dude, it's so cool to see her play like a similar character because I, I love her in Chainsaw 2. And it was yeah. cool to, like, why? It's just a weird casting choice, you know what I mean? Like, because it's like, why her? Like, you know, she hasn't been doing much. Like, she's not really one of the main horror actresses that everybody talks about. She's a very yeah. um, offbeat looking final girl for Chainsaw 2 anyway. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was so dope that Adam cast her. Uh, mm-hmm. And of course, Perry Shen's back. Mm-hmm. Derek Mears is in this one. Uh, D. Snyder's son, Cody Snyder, is in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Adam yeah, Green's ex wife plays one of the SWAT team. Yep. Doherty. Yeah. I love, I love like, you know, how they reveal it where, you know, um, in the story where, you know, how they can kill Victor Crowley, man. I, I, I love that, man. <clears throat> I love that shit, man. So good. Um, it, it makes sense because we, they say it at the end of every like time they tell the story, but I just love how it sets it up to like to get introduced to Sid Hag's character in the film. Fuck that! Those that scene <laughs> is so cool, where they have to go get the urn from her father, oh, <laughs> from dude. her uh, from her yeah. uncle. Oh my god, dude! Yeah, so they go, so they head to Sid Hag's place, uh, which houses her uncle's urn, and this is what this is kind of the key to kill Victor Crowley here. But so when we get introduced to this character, and he's just this fuck man, he's this racist fucking redneck. And of course, the Elliot, the deputy. Is, there's so many funny lines in that dialogue, <laughs> dude. Every Sid Haig time, kills that role. Oh my god! It's so every time the black cop says something, he's like, he's like, well, I, I can't understand you. You're mumbling, and he's totally talking like <laughs> clear. Uh, <laughs> it's so fucking funny that almost uh, man. Come on, shoot me in the head. I was yeah. a nah. So basically what happens, they end up getting this, they end up going back to the bayou um, and where shit is really going down now. They've sent in a, a paramedic team, which, of course, Perry Shen is part of. He's now playing a paramedic. I love and, when him and Sean Willen are, like, talking in the, the paramedic. So, so he's he not, he's not the like, a third brother or anything. He's just a completely different no. character. No. Yeah, no, he's he's a, different, he's a different character. He's totally a different character. And, and dude, there's this fucking when they're yeah, talking. Yeah, when I'm talking to Sean Whalen and talking about like, uh, yeah, we found an Asian guy that looks exactly like you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's like, oh, because we all look the same, huh? And he's like, yeah. no, he's like, no, he actually like really does look like you. The fuck that joke is funny, man. It, isn't that, that is... um, isn't that fucking Roach from People Under the Stairs? Yeah, that is Roach. Yep, that's totally. cool, man. Yeah. Like it's so but, cool that but, he grabbed him. But that's one of the funny. Yeah, exactly. But that's like one of the funniest jokes. But no, he seriously <laughs> looks exactly like. <laughs> it's actually, He's like, yeah, we all look like. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's so good. And, and of so, course, we get the final part of Adam Green's uh, character arc, arc, where his character is now in jail. <laughs> Um, yeah. In the in the next cell to Mary Beth, and he's like, "She's the one on the stomp tour." <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and and it's funny because there's actually a fourth wall 
uh, breaking moment where the uh, officer is like, you mean to tell me you went out there, all your friends and people died, and then you went back again the next – he, like, breaks it down how stupid it actually sounds. He's like, that could be the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. And and, and Adam (laughs) Green's reaction. Yeah, and he's like – Adam Green's – that, yeah, that's the scene I was part talking part about. Like, yeah, yeah, because it's like Adam a wink Green to the audience him. who who did say it's actually a wink to the critics who said how dumb who who like pan these movies because it's dumb and stuff. You know, the sequel or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, that was the whole point. Yeah, exactly. Because that was everyone's main gripe. It's like, why the fuck would they go back into the the bayou? It just got slaughtered. But no, Adam Green kills the script in this film, man. Like some of the lines and some of the jokes and stuff are so clever. Yeah. I love how he like incorporated himself and put, gave himself an arc with, with being yeah. arrested. And shit, I just love that how he just like it, it's a quick shot too of him being handcuffed and walking through or being escorted through the police station. I yeah. love that. Yeah. He's in the cell. It's like so I, I, good. I like so Elliot, the, the deputy. He's fucking funny. Like when he's seeing fucking Amanda in the hallway, he's like turning to try to fucking avoid her. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, one thing that I really like about this. Uh, installment is and I've said this before that um, Adam Green is a really good writer and I think he's really good at direction but I when it comes to shots and and things like that I don't think he's the best and it, it kind of proves my point with this film this film is way more cinematic looking than the other two uh, and, it also helps that BJ McDonald's a great well, he knows about like camera operating, so it helps because he could. I always say this: cinematographers always make the best directors in a way because we see like in other certain like cinematographers and DPs that went on to become directors, like Nicholas Rogue, and like uh, what the fuck's the other guy's name? Uh, there's a few other examples, but Nicholas Rogue was like one of Roger Corman's uh, cinematographers, and he went on. To become a director in his own right with like don't look now. Yeah, so I mean it, it, it makes sense though. It, it absolutely makes sense. It really does because those guys they know how to frame shots and this is what. Oh, they Al Lotto. Al Lotto was the other guy I was thinking of. We just talked about one of his films. He was a cinematographer too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, like not only that, but you know, from the remembering the commentary and stuff like they did a lot of different things all together. Like they used more dolly shots. They only had a couple in, in the other films. Um, they, they had, yeah. uh, more, um, they used a lot of steady cam in the, in the first two. And, and they, they just do, they do a plenty. There's just way more shots all together and just different oh, yeah. wide angle big lenses and, and stuff like that. That like when yeah. Daniel walks into the police station and stuff, you know, it, they just it just looks way more cinematic. The shots where you have well, it's even panning. Uh, the SWAT team walking through the swamp and it's all that fog and lighting and stuff like like that yeah. wasn't really done in the other hatchets. And in fact, one of my other gripes with Hatchet Two that I didn't mention is it looks like the whole movie was done on a soundstage. Mm-hmm. And this yeah, one this, was the I, second one lacks an atmosphere big time. Yeah, it definitely does. This one sure. right away, man. When when uh, you know Derek Mears is is. Uh, the head of the SWAT team and shit, and those scenes where they're they're walking through, it just looks fantastic, man. It's got really effective atmosphere and shit like that. I love the look of this film; it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just feels it feels so much bigger than the second one. It yeah, feels a lot. It, it more... really does. It really, yeah. really does. And um, this one was actually filmed in Louisiana. Like the first one and the second one had shots in Louisiana. Yeah. Um, they actually filmed. They yeah. actually filmed this one, which. By the way, apparently the production was absolutely hell because of that. Like everybody it's had, the heat. Uh, they yeah. were get they were catching diseases and mosquito bites, and one person had a full blown panic attack from like the, this military grade like uh, mosquito repellent that's supposed to go on your clothes, but she put it on her skin. Mm-hmm. Um, just just tons of like nightmarish stuff that that they had to deal with yeah didn't kane didn't kane hodder say this was like the worst shoot he'd ever had in his life and i mean you got to remember he got burnt on set one time too. he <laughs> like actually this did not most... get burnt on set it wasn't actually oh well, no. whatever but the point the, the thing is that he said this was the most grueling uh film that he ever shot because of you know the uh basically his costume and stuff right yeah. the really heavy silicone and it mixed with the heat and stuff i guess was just painful yeah and actually it was really really hard to move around of the the costume in this one they actually switched up the makeup again and in this one they 
they finally kind of nail it. They use um, they they use a, a silicone latex instead of foam latex. Yeah, and uh, it's heavier. It's the the I guess the headpiece was like fifty pounds. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, but it yeah. has way more movement. Like when you, when he opens his mouth, like he has way more jaw movement, and it doesn't yeah. look like a mask so much. It looks more of like his actual face. Like you yeah, can actually yeah. see Kane Hodder's face coming through. Yeah, like well, his yeah, reactions. He, you exactly. see like his acting performance in this one. Yeah, it feels like it feels a little more realistic. The other ones, you know, without when you're talking, your face should be moving a little bit. But when it's like full blown styrofoam and shit, it's, it's like probably not going to move a whole lot. <laughs> so this one's especially cool. when he, especially when he's got his super pissed face after his house falls down. <laughs> oh, that shit's funny. <laughs> yeah, he's right. gonna like super rage mode at that moment. <laughs> yeah. So what's, now, what's interesting so you, is they actually built that house separate in all three films. They had to rebuild it each time. Jesus uh, Christ. So this one has. One of my favorite moments in in the entire trilogy, man. So going back to the first one and our main one of our main characters in Ben, I raised the question of what the fuck happened to him in the second one because he's in the boat mm-hmm. at the end of the second film and we don't see him again. Well, there's this great fucking scene in the third one here where we actually get to see him. He's still lying in the boat. And he briefly kind of yeah, and you know, he's like up crushed or something. And he's like reaches up and he's like, ah, uh, and, then, and then he gets killed. <laughs> yeah, he, and then he gets hit in the face of the fact, and he's like, oh, what the fuck? It's like the fucking best. It's like I just love the fact that they threw that in there, man. Yeah, Adam and, Green, and you have to really give Joel David Moore mad props because he was huge at this moment. This was like right after Avatar, and for him to come back and do this little cameo in a in a horror oh. film. Like um, ten seconds. Adam Green no. praises him for that because you know he definitely didn't have to do that, and and he Adam actually said that that was supposed to happen in Hatchet too, but the scheduling never lined up. Yeah, oh, really. I'm glad. Yeah. You know what? I'm glad it didn't, and it I happened. Know, and you'd, you'd forgotten about it, yeah. and then you know I watched. I I marathon these um on Thursday night or whatever. I watched all three in a row, and I was just like, I love that. That's yeah, one of my favorite so parts. Cool. It's so cool. It's such a cool part, man. It's such a cool thing. They, they actually – that's actually nice the boat touch. from the first film too. Um, Is it really? It yeah. They shot that <laughs> in the Aeriscope office, believe it or nice. not. That, it, was, it, was a, it was in the, his office and they put that set together. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. That's cool, man. Also the uh, like house boat things, the ambulance boats, turns out mm-hmm. those don't exist at all. Um, they, they found it that when they started researching them, they were like, really? Like that, that seems like it'd be a thing, but apparently there's <laughs> n- none in existence. <laughs> are you serious? Especially in Louisiana. Are you, yeah. Like... Um, so yeah, th- they, those don't exist and they actually shot the interior of them in, uh, I believe the Aeriscope office as well, um, mm. which was actually way bigger than the, the room looks on the boat. Cause it just looks like a little yeah. shack. So they had yeah. these interesting angles to make it look small. Um, there's actually a really good one shot where Victor Crowley first comes back to life, uh, where they bring the body back in and, uh, it's a one, it's just one long shot where it shows the dude and it shows the bag in the background, uh, inflating. There's no cut there or anything. There's somebody off camera who pulls the bag off and puts a deflated one on there that doesn't have a body in it. And Vic and Kane Hart is actually standing to the left the whole time. Um, oh, yeah. it's, it's a really cool shot. Once you know how that went down too, it's, it's even more interesting. Huh. Um, I, I love how, uh, like as the series progresses, Victor is intact of pain because in like the first film he gets shot and he falls, he takes like numerous shots in this one and it fucking doesn't even stop him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You notice yeah. That, I he mean, he, he just seems, he's, com- he's he seems like really pissed off in this one. Like Jesus Christ, how many of these fools do I have to kill? They keep coming in my swamp. Um, exactly, man. <clears throat> and I actually like how big it feels too. Like if it, like it feels like there's a ton of pe- like the second one had a ton of people too. But you got SWAT teams now and shit. And I love how the there's bought like apparently there was supposed to be pieces of like clothing and and. And all the, from all the kills in the previous Hatchet films, like all throughout yeah. the trees and stuff, only some of it came through because so much of it got washed away with a crazy thunderstorm they had the one night. Yeah. And um, but like dudes' balls in the tree and stuff. 
Co- Cody, <laughs> Schne- Cody Schneider. Look at that fucking guy's balls. Yeah. <laughs> I love this character. He's fucking yeah, hilarious. Yeah. yeah, apparently he didn't even want to do that role, and he was so fucking nervous, and he kept calling like Joe Lynch and everybody, like, dude, I don't, I don't know what to do. But I think that helped his character because his character is so nervous. Yeah, no, exactly. Dude, his death is so funny too, man. Fuck <laughs> like, yeah! That's the one Adam bru- doesn't like. Really? That that death is brutal, yeah, man. He says it's too mean spirited. <laughs> oh, that's what's so good about that's it, what man. I'm saying. That's what he I steps on his head and pushes. I love that. Like after he just destroys the body, man. He steps on him and is and you hear that kind of sound like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot more choreography on this one. Like a lot of gunshots and um, yeah, yeah, multiple kills in five man, seconds. I, love, yeah. I honestly really like Derek Mears as an actor, man. He's like he's this like big burly fucking dude, man. He's he's scary. It, it's a great role for him to be like the lead of like a SWAT team or something. Yeah, I like Derek. It, it just kind of it kind of fits. I, it. I ironic, love that. I, ironically, it's Jason and Jason and two two Jasons, and, and that's this. why you have that moment where they clash. You know what I mean? Well, exactly, yeah, and that yeah. that's what I love about the casting. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a definitely wink a to the audience. Thing on, yeah, it's definitely a crossover it. thing done on let's purpose, do this, right? Bitch. But yeah. this is what I love about his casting. Like he's, he brings in all these people from various films and stuff, and it just fucking makes sense, man. And what's cool is I all love... these people are his friends. Like he brought Derek, yeah. Derek Mears is in Holliston, Holliston, and like he's friends with these guys. So it's it's cool yeah. to see them all like make these movies together. And um, and us horror nerds are like eating yeah. the popcorn, like oh my god, it's see, awesome. I love I love <laughs> the part when they're when they first get, when they first get to the. Uh, uh, well, the the kill site basically, <laughs> and Derek Mears looks over and he goes, "Well, it's a good thing you got that girl in custody, eh?" <laughs> yeah, because yeah. she obviously did all this. This little five foot girl. Yeah, like, he was, like even the paramedics when they're when they got Ra's head from when after he got uh-huh. killed by the table. A girl did that? Yeah. <laughs> it was literally garbage everywhere, like bodies thrown apart. Uh, it's so good. And, and um. It's, you know, speaking of Derek Mears, like he actually has that disease where you can't grow hair anywhere. Like that's why he doesn't have any eyebrows or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But he's he's I like him, man. He's cool. I, I like seeing him yeah. and stuff. And um, actually, the gun. When I was talking about the guns. Uh, apparently, uh, when, whenever like I'm sure you guys know, you've seen a ton of special features. Whenever you use guns on a set, they have to be cleared. Like like after you you like you, one person handles the gun it gets cleared and then it's put down or whatever. One of the guns actually went off mistakenly after it was cleared, um, which is pretty scary. Uh, it was blanks and stuff, but you know, that's how people motherfuckers die. Yeah, man. That's how, that's how Brandon Lee died. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. It's crazy shit, man. Um, what do you guys think about like the, uh, just this, the, doesn't this feel like just a, a perfect finale? It does, it man. I, I think that I think the wrap up to the story is is phenomenal. I can't believe the amount of hate and shit when this film came out. Everyone's like, "Oh, I had to three sucked. It sucked." And I was like, "What the fuck?" I'm like, "I love this movie, man. It was it's great. Fucking awesome. <laughs> it yeah. looks good. It's got amazing kills. It's got awesome characters. It wraps up the story it, fucking perfectly. It feels like it's the best made. Oh, by far, by yeah. far." It's definitely the best ma- best made film. Yeah, I like the story. That, like, I like Danielle's arc. I like the cameos. I like uh, the cast. I like that. Um, like, shit's really hitting the fan now. Like, if it hasn't already, like now it's super hitting the fan because you got the SWAT and you got like all this shit going on. Like, I don't, and Victor just looks even more mad, and and he looks better mm. than he ever did. His hair is good now. Like, I, I just like Hatchet Three, dude. You know, and this one, you know, and it has an insanely high body count, too. I mean, even considered the second one has a big one, but this one has a lot of kills in it, too. But, you know, the effects are done well, and it's done. I, I, and I think the thing I like about it, a lot of the kills are a little bit more mean-spirited, and I like that because mm-hmm. it makes more sense for Victor Crowley's character because, as we've stated, he was obviously quite pissed off in this film. I mean, Christ, I mean, the second his house goes up, goes down, it's like, it's on. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you expect bigger things, and it's showcased in every aspect of this film. He did such a great job, you know, developing that story and creating that, you know, just that mean spirited anger and displaying it on screen. And, and, and that's what we got. And it felt right. It felt appropriate. And I love. And I, again, this film has great pacing. It doesn't overextend its welcome. It's. I think it's actually the shortest film. I think it's only like eighty minutes. Yeah. And it does a great job, kind of getting to the finale. And when it happens, you're just like. Fuck yeah, that was awesome. 
That totally makes sense. And honestly, like, what I like about it is Danielle and, you know, Victor Crowley don't have a ton of scenes together. But when they do, it really feels like over the course of these three films, that character and Victor Crowley and Mary Beth have really developed sort of a Jamie Lee and uh, – or uh, uh, Laurie Strode and Michael Myers type relationship. Um, And it spawns differently. Like they're not brother and sister, but her father killed him essentially, you know, caused that, that terrible thing. And like, it's almost sort of like a, a a hate for each other, a deep hatred for each other that that is Mm -hmm. finally started to develop like rivals almost. Mm -hmm. And um, it shows in the final scene uh, of the film uh, which I think was I think was pretty good. Like I like how it ends. Mm-hmm. It feels like the perfect wrap up. Did you like the effects? Yeah, like in that scene. Yeah, yeah, me too, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm a big yeah, fan yeah. of like anything melting. <laughs> I yeah. love melt. I love melt. Yeah, man. melt's I'm a big hard fan to do melt. right. Like no. um, reverse melt. Pretty good. Hellraiser. Yeah. <laughs> it was um, awesome. and explosion and you know ah uh, it's it's get just, up. Yeah, this is good, man. It's so, really good. Um, I guess we can kind of wind down. You guys have much more on this one? Not really. No. No, not really. This is hilarious, you know. All right, uh, <laughs> ratings, moods. All right. Um, well, I've stated many, many times that this is my favorite one out of the three Hatchet films. I love this film, man. I think everything about it is just executed perfectly. I like. Oh, so many great cameos in this one. Sid Haig is just the funniest shit ever. <laughs> this film is so good. So good. Um, it's cool to see Zach Allegan in a film again, you know, in something like this, you know. Uh, Victor Crowley looks amazing. Gore effects, awesome. Shot well. Uh, pacing, everything about this film is good. I love the story. It, there's nothing really that I can really harp on it too much. Um, you know, I think the comedy works really they, good they too. They even and toned lo- down the the ridiculous like unrealistic looking kills like it's still there a little bit there's still some blood sprat sprays and shit but they definitely turn Mm -hmm. it down yeah and i think i mean some of the jokes in this film were just brilliant you know with uh, with ben's character i thought that was that's just over you know that's just over the top that's genius is what that is it is man it's things like that that make me respect the writing of adam green and stuff and it's just it worked out so well for this type of film like yeah, and you know, it's just, you know, even giving him his random background character an arc, you know, it's so cool. You know, it's just these little things and stuff. And I swear these are the little things that people miss in these films. You know, the, the yeah, joke like about they don't notice this shit or something or or else they would love believe it. This. You're yeah. not gonna believe this. I found this this Asian guy and he had his leg blown off and his arm cut off and he looks just like you. Oh, what are you saying? All Asians look the same? <laughs> It's like the funniest. Sh- I love that. I absolutely love that scene, man. It's, it's brilliant. Um, this one right here, I can watch all the time. I swear. I'm giving it nine out of ten. I love this film. It's good. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Me, I, I, I love Hatchet Three as well. Uh, I said for the longest time, I think it's the best one. Uh, ever since it came out in 2013, when it actually made my top ten of 2013 list, I think it came in at number nine, if I'm not mistaken, nine yep. or eight. You know what's funny? Remember, I didn't get a chance to see it until after we did the show. Yeah, I do so, remember that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I said it was the best one back then, and I say it's the best one now still. Uh, I think it's just the perfect wrap-up for the series. Like, I really have very little, like, qualms with it at all. Um, I give it an 8.5 out of 10. Nice. Mm-hmm. Again, like, First time I saw it, I was just blown away. It's my favorite Hatchet film, too, of the three. And it's just fucking awesome. We didn't talk about, like, the opening of the scene where, like, the credits of this one. Guar. Genocide. Genocide. Rest in peace to David Brocky. Of course, it's that makes Adam's, yeah, friends and stuff. And it was just a fucking open, awesome opening when Mary Beth just walking to the PlayStation back into town. Really awesome stuff. And I really just like like the fucking the mean spirited fucking darkness of like the kills and like is just is like a bigger picture and it just feels like a bigger film. Fucking awesome kills, fucking awesome Victor Crowley look, fucking awesome everything. Wicked awesome film. Nine out of ten. Awesome. 
Yeah, uh, Hatchet Three, man. You you know what? Uh, I, my my ranking did change. I used to go three two one. I'm three one two now. Yeah. So, um, I think that's, yeah, that's what you are, moods. Yeah, that's been mine ever since I seen this third one. So, three one two. Yeah, and yeah. I actually did change my rating on Hatchet Three from what it used to be. It used to be an eight when I did it on the top ten of 2013. Uh, but I did change it to an 8.5 after this. Re- this is my actual first rewatch of Hatchet 3. Um, and wow. it, still, it still holds up, you know, uh, three, four years later. Wow, Jesus Christ, time flies. Um, so one thing that I wanted to kind of talk about, like, just really briefly before we wrap up, is what do you guys think about a Hatchet 4? Bring it. Do you think it's done? I don't know, man. I, I, I was actually you know thinking about that too and i was trying to figure out what exactly they were going to do with it like what do you think the story what we don't see mary beth die no but i mean we we assume that victor crowley is because i mean that was kind of yeah but what we don't know that that's right i mean like like he came back the next night so like what if it just well fucking didn't work (laughs) yeah maybe these rules actually aren't effective who knows? Yeah. Well, maybe. maybe I, honestly, I, if, if they're going to make a, a hatchet for, I'm I'm on board. You know. Yeah. I was, start that it, shit, I'll, I'll fend. I'll put money into it. Well, <laughs> since it's in Louisiana, they might do some kind of weird voodoo shit and bring him back somehow. So I'm down that, for. That's it. there too. So, yeah, if there's a curse you, that can cause that's it, always... there's a curse that can bring him back. You know. Um. But I, okay. So my <sighs> thoughts on hatchet four is I don't think Adam Green wants to do one. Um, Daniel Harris has said before I heard in an interview where she said, um, when asked about it, she's like, no way in hell. Um, but then in commentary in the, in the hatchet three commentary, I remember he's like, he's like, like kind of teasing it a, a little bit, but not really like, like leaving it, the door kind of open. But one thing that he does say is that if he does one, or he didn't really say if he does one, he said, he thinks that this story is over the Mary Beth, Victor Crowley story. Like that was the conclusion of it. That, that, that story is over. If, if he did another hatchet, it'd be different. Um, which is, interesting, that makes sense. I think, but in 2015, mm-hmm. he actually came out and said what his pitch for a hatchet for would be on episode 123 of the movie crypt, I believe with Patrick Lucier. Um, and essentially I didn't, I, I'll be honest guys. I didn't really like where his head was at. So if he ever does it, I hope he goes, doesn't do this idea. Think of, uh, Wes Craven's new nightmare. Um, oh, yeah. hatchet is a movie that, or, or the character of Victor Crowley is not something that Adam green actually made up, but he's an actual person. And, he doesn't look anything like Victor Crowley. Like he's not like deformed or anything or like, or maybe not so much or, or whatever. He's like a real person. And he comes after the filmmakers for that. I personally don't like that meta idea, but I don't know about that. It looks, sounds weird. I, you know, honestly, yeah, I'm not really hundred percent on board with that either. I think, you know, something ridiculous like something to do with Louisiana voodoo and shit like that. I mean, make it a little more simple and more believable. <laughs> as as a voodoo is actually fucking believable. Yeah. But whatever. You know what I'm saying. But, but to me uh, it sounded like the pitch for um digging up the marrow. Because that was the original concept behind digging up the marrow was that yeah, somebody wrote into him and said, "Hey, Victor Collie's a real person." It, it, like he showed pictures of like where he was in the swamp and like you, blah blah, blah this that and the other, and that was the concept behind digging up the marrow. Like, what if monsters really do exist and stuff? So I, I don't know if like if he said that before digging. I know he didn't say that before. He said that after digging up the marrow. So I don't know. Um, but hmm. yeah, that's that's the Hatchet trilogy. I think we covered them as in depth as possible. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. It was, it was hilarious. <laughs> it was hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> ah, shit, man. Good times. Yeah, I'm glad that we did that, man. It was fun to revisit the films. One of my favorite trilogies, to be honest. Like, yeah, it's, it's a, very it's a so. solid trilogy. No, it really is. And I'm yeah. glad I got to cover them. What do you guys? 
Yeah, I always find I, I do find it weird that people like one but not two and three because they're really the same fucking movie. Yeah, I know. I find about that... it. If you think about it, you just take all the credits out of all three films and just play them together. It's just one giant story. Which apparently, one Which last fucking Adam Green tidbit here. Apparently, there's a scene, a death scene that was filmed and never used. And if they ever did like a giant box set release where it was like the whole film that you could watch it like all at once or something like that, they were going to insert that death scene between Hatchet 2 and 3. Nice. That's cool. Nice. That was super cool to watch a four and a half hour hatchet film. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it, they, cool. They've screened them like that once. One time. They screened all three of them in a row with, with cool. no intermissions. Nice. Yeah, so I think that's it, guys. That is going to do it for episode 99, a.k.a. Wayne Gretzky episode. I don't know. I'm fucking... It's long, man. It's been like five hours. I'm tired. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um yeah. That was fun, man. I, I had a lot of uh a lot of fun watching those films, man, and talking about them and shit. Love doing these trilogies, man. Trilogies are fun. They're yeah. really fun. It, it's not but often any- that I get to talk about that I get to talk about a movie trilogy rather, or like even film a film in general that I know that much about. So it was really interesting for me. I don't think I've ever said that many like behind the scenes stuff ever that's what i said it was like it was like sitting in the classroom for the last two hours while we reviewed these films you had a lot of tidbits man a lot of Mm -hmm. tidbits but that's good though man it makes it interesting i like that yeah hopefully the listeners enjoyed if you guys don't like that stuff just let me know i won't i won't do that again if you guys don't like it (laughs) i hope someone says it oh he's just trying to he just sounds like a smarty pants. <laughs> He's just trying to outshine everybody with all his little Ted bits. <laughs> Ted. <laughs> oh, fuck, I'm sorry. I, oh, my God. All, all right, right, guys. That is going to do it for episode 99. And we'll check you guys in the next episode, which is going to be a monster vision episode. So stay tuned for episode 100. You guys know what it's all about. Make sure to get your voicemails in. Uh, yeah, got lots of cool prizes to win. JP, take us the fuck out of here. Um, I didn't know we were covering Monster Vision, uh, Monster Vision retrospect, maybe. That would be fun. <laughs> episode 100, yeah, uh, whew, huge episode. Um, make sure you guys, uh, also review us on iTunes if you, if you haven't. Uh, we're on all kinds of social media now. We're on Facebook. We're going to keep the group closed. That was the topic that we had. Um, but we would appreciate if you have friends that are in the horror, invite them on in. The more, the merrier. Like, we're family. Uh, we'll welcome mm-hmm. them with open arms. And we're also on Instagram. We're on uh, Twitter, 22 Shots Podcast, Facebook slash group slash 22 Shots Podcast. Uh, horror Amino. Amino. Uh, that's a really cool app, guys. Check it out if you haven't. Um, we're on there as well. I post from time to time. And uh, websites, thank you, Jason Lloyd, for hosting the podcast, the iTunes. It uh, really means a lot. Love Jason Lloyd. Uh, true, true, awesome guy in, in Mr. the Lloyd. podcast world. Uh, if, if there's ever a Lifetime Achievement Award, that guy deserves it. Um, he's done a lot for a lot of podcasts out there. So, uh, Jason Lloyd, thank you for hosting the show. 22ShotsOfMoodsAndHorror.com. We're going to have plenty of new content in 2017 uh, as well. So, keep checking back Stay there. tuned. And uh, that's it, guys. Um, See you in 100.